The Philippines is a home to a number of rich, diverse, and natural ecosystems. Among the notable ecosystems in the Philippines are the Dipterocarp ecosystem of Mount Makiling, Pine Forest Ecosystem in Baguio City, Wetland Ecosystem of Olango Island in Cebu City, and Coral Reef Ecosystem in Oriental Mindoro. Our country owns a rich biodiversity which provides an array of ecosystem services that enable humans to survive. But with factors such as deforestation, pollution, overpopulation, and the future of our ecosystems may be at risk. So how can we protect our natural resources and ecosystems? This is the role of Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau. On June 10, 1987, under the Executive Order 192, the former Forest Research Institute was reorganized into the Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau, or ERDB. ERDB is the principal research arm of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources that develops relevant and scientific research and development programs that address the nation's cross-cutting concerns on different major ecosystems such as forest, upland farms, grassland and degraded areas, coastal zone and freshwater, and urban areas. With this, ERDB has come up with nine research and development programs to achieve the following goals. Sustaining forest ecosystems. Managing coastal and freshwater ecosystems dynamics. Promoting health of urban areas ecosystems. Addressing hazards in watersheds for water supply efficiency. Sustaining agroforestry and upland farming systems. Enhancing resilience of wetlands and coastal areas. Conserving and sustaining plantations and natural forests. Rehabilitating mined out and degraded areas through ERDB technologies. Reducing pollution in highly urbanized areas. In 2015, from its main headquarters in Los Baños, Laguna, ERDB has widened its reach all over the country to develop more innovative ecosystem technologies in its six areas of excellence in the fields of watershed and water resources, toxic and hazardous wastes, urban and biodiversity, coastal resources and ecotourism, agroforestry, forestry, and wetlands. ERDB's research and development efforts are now organized in CAR, NCR, Region 4A, Region 7, Region 11, and Region 13 through its Research, Development, and Extension Centers, or RDEX. RDEX formulate and implement applied and action-oriented ENR studies that enable the advancement of research, development, and extension work in ERDB specialized areas of excellence. Loyal to its mandate, the Bureau pursues to strike a balance between caring for the ecosystems and nurturing people's lives by developing propagation technology, plantation establishment, and harvesting techniques for bamboo, rattan, and mangrove. Specializing in seed technology and clonal propagation of high-quality dipterocarp seedlings and other indigenous forest trees. ERDB has invented the HiQ VAM-1, an advanced biofertilizer used in DENR's nationwide reforestation programs. Through ERDB's Ridge to Reef research, the Bureau has developed relevant technologies for the rehabilitation of abandoned fish ponds 
and development of environment-friendly techniques to revive polluted waters, mined out areas, and other degraded ecosystems. Today, the Bureau adds the study of DENR's carrying capacity programs and vulnerability assessments of watersheds, protected areas, and ecotourism areas all over the country. But the role of ERDB does not end with developing technologies and programs. To extend its services to its stakeholders, ERDB conducts various technology transfer and extension activities such as provisions of technical assistance, capacity enhancements, and field deployment activities. ERDB maintains state-of-the-art research facilities and demonstration areas aimed to provide the public grasp and appreciation of ERDB's generated technologies. Through its educational materials, ERDB encourages the public's participation with its five-step strategic communication process, analyzing, strategic design, development and testing, implementation and monitoring, evaluation and replanning. As a research institution, ERDB strives to reinforce their communication strategies, to promote their goals and raise public awareness, to do this, the Bureau regularly releases information about their scientific breakthroughs and projects through technical journals, semi-technical research and development newsletters, manuals, and bulletins. These publicity and promotional efforts are also instrumental in expanding research-driven studies and technologies to match the client's growing needs. The Bureau continues to promote its public reach, local and international, by maintaining its presence online. At ERDB, researchers from various fields of science continuously work together to develop cutting-edge technologies and revolutionary programs that will help advance the country's understanding of our ecosystems and encourage people to help preserve them. ERDB, bridging ecosystems and science to people. Can you imagine a world that's dark and gray? Lifeless, cold, and dry? Everything that you see around you is the byproduct of biodiversity. It breathes life to the world and splashes hues of greens and blues to our ecosystem. So, what makes biodiversity important? It keeps us all alive. It provides us water to drink, food to eat, oxygen to breathe, and clothes to wear. According to the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, the Philippines is one of 18 mega-biodiverse countries of the world, containing two-thirds of the Earth's biodiversity and between 70 and 80 percent of the world's plant and animal. However, with the ever-changing environment and increasing global temperature brought about by climate change, some species of forest trees fail to cope with such changes, thereby affecting their ability to survive. But it's never too late. We can still protect our forests and preserve our natural resources. So, how do we make a difference to save biodiversity? Through genetic diversity. Genetic diversity refers to the variations observed in the tiniest detail, the genetic makeup of species. This might come too hard to understand at first, but don't worry. Genetic diversity is just how we are distinguished from each other. Just look at your fingers. Notice how no two people have exactly the same fingerprints? Even identities have their own differences in spite of roughly the same appearances. Genetic diversity is important because it helps maintain a healthy population. It helps species to survive the negative impacts of climate change, making survival of the fittest ring true even more. With higher genetic variations, the more chances there are for forest tree species to survive and thrive in an ever-changing environment. You may ask, how does genetic diversity in forestry help humans? The answer is simple. 
Forests provide us with resources, making it possible for humans to survive. Genetic diversity helps in decreasing the vulnerability of forest tree species to pests and other natural threats that may cause a decrease in population or even extinction. Genetic diversity information can also serve an important role in tree breeding and in the improvement of our local forestry programs. The Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau of DENR has already initiated genetic diversity studies of priority forestry species in the Philippines. This might not come as a surprise, but documenting genetic diversity is easier said than done. There are processes needed to identify the genetic variations in a forestry species. First, plant geneticists determine an individual's DNA characteristics through DNA analysis. To get this done, ERDB does the following. <coughs> 1. Researchers collect leaf samples from different sources around the country. 2. The collected leaf samples will then undergo DNA analysis. 3. The researchers will then extract the DNA found in the leaf sample through the use of CTAB test and the help of molecular marker, RAPID. This process is called DNA isolation. 4. ERDB's Forest Molecular Biology Laboratory identifies genetic variations by using segments of the DNA sequence of individuals. These segments are called DNA-based molecular markers. By observing the different types or genetic polymorphisms of these markers, we can estimate the genetic diversity of the population. 5. Lastly, ERDB researchers observe the genetic variations among the individuals and analyze the data gathered. There are seven species that are included in the ongoing ERDB genetic diversity study. As of now, ERDB has assessed the genetic diversity of three species. The study showed the population holding the highest genetic diversity among the samples collected from different provinces in the Philippines. For Limuran, it is Bataan. For Nara, Ilocos. And for Kawayan Tanik, it is the Pangasinan population that holds the highest genetic diversity. With higher genetic variations, the more there is for species to survive and thrive in an ever-changing environment. The continuing study of ERDB on genetic diversity holds vast preservation of the forest ecosystems in the Philippines. In reforestation programs, using a population of tree species with higher genetic variations poses a greater chance of surviving than a population with limited genetic variability. As the country faces unceasing and unregulated deforestation and loss of genetic resources, we are in a race with time to document and study the rich genetic diversity of our forestry resources. In Biotech, promoting biotechnologies for a healthy environment. To show your support, like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash erdbgovph, and use the following hashtag, erdbyyouthtech.
Philippines is a home to a number of rich, diverse, and natural ecosystems. Among the notable ecosystems in the Philippines are the Dipterocarp ecosystem of Mount Makiling, Pine Forest Ecosystem in Baguio City, Wetland Ecosystem of Olango Island in Cebu City, and Coral Reef Ecosystem in Oriental Mindoro. Our country owns a rich biodiversity which provides an array of ecosystem services that enable humans to survive. But with factors such as deforestation, pollution, overpopulation, and climate change, our ecosystems may be at risk. So how can we protect our biodiversity, natural resources, and ecosystems? This is the role of Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau, or ERDB. On June 10, 1987, under the Executive Order 192, the former Forest Research Institute was reorganized into the Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau, or ERDB. ERDB is the principal research arm of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources that develops relevant and scientific research and development programs that address the nation's cross-cutting concerns on different major ecosystems, such as forest, upland farms, grassland and degraded areas, coastal zone and freshwater, and urban areas. With this, ERDB has come up with nine research and development programs to achieve the following goals. Sustaining forest ecosystems. Managing coastal and freshwater ecosystems dynamics. Promoting health of urban areas ecosystems. Addressing hazards in watersheds for water supply efficiency. Sustaining agroforestry and upland farming systems. Enhancing resilience of wetlands and coastal areas. Conserving and sustaining plantations and natural forests. Rehabilitating mined out and degraded areas through ERDB technologies. Reducing pollution in highly urbanized areas. In 2015, from its main headquarters in Los Baños, Laguna, ERDB has widened its reach all over the country to develop more innovative ecosystem technologies in its six areas of excellence in the fields of watershed and water resources, toxic and hazardous wastes, urban and biodiversity, coastal resources and ecotourism, agroforestry, forestry, and wetlands. ERDB's research and development efforts are now organized in CAR, NCR, Region 4A, Region Region 11, and Region 13 through its Research Development and Extension Centers, or RDEX. RDEX formulate and implement applied and action-oriented ENR studies that enable the advancement of research, development, and extension work in ERDB specialized areas of excellence. Loyal to its mandate, the Bureau pursues to strike a balance between caring for the ecosystems and nurturing people's lives by developing propagation technology, plantation establishment, and harvesting techniques for bamboo, rattan. Specializing in seed technology and clonal propagation of high-quality dipterocarp seedlings and other indigenous forest trees. ERDB has invented the HiQ VAM1, an advanced biofertilizer used in DENR's nationwide reforestation programs. Through ERDB's Ridge to Reef research, the Bureau has developed relevant technologies for the rehabilitation of abandoned fish ponds and development of environment-friendly techniques to revive polluted waters, mined out areas, 
and other degraded ecosystems. Today, the Bureau also has a study of DENR's carrying capacity programs and vulnerability assessments of watersheds, protected areas, and ecotourism areas all over the country. But the role of ERDB does not end with developing technologies and programs. To extend its services to its stakeholders, ERDB conducts various technology transfer and extension activities such as provisions of technical assistance, capacity enhancements, and field deployment activities. ERDB maintains state-of-the-art research facilities and demonstrates aimed to provide the public with a better grasp and appreciation of ERDB's generated technologies. Through its educational materials, ERDB encourages the public's participation with its five-step strategic communication process, analyzing, strategic design, development and testing, implementation and monitoring, evaluation and replanning, as a research institution, ERDB strives to reinforce their communication strategies to promote their goals and risks. To do this, the Bureau regularly releases information about their scientific breakthroughs and projects through technical journals, semi-technical research and development newsletters, manuals, and bulletins. These publicity and promotional efforts are also instrumental in expanding research-driven studies and technologies to match the client's growing needs. The Bureau continues to promote its public reach, local and international, by maintaining its presence online. At ERDB, researchers from various fields of science continuously work together to develop cutting-edge technologies, and revolutionary programs that will help advance the country's understanding of our ecosystems and encourage people to help preserve them. ERDB Bridging Ecosystems and Science to People Can you imagine a world that's dark and gray, lifeless, cold, and dry? Everything that you see around you is the byproduct of biodiversity. It breathes life to the world and splashes hues of greens and blues to our ecosystem. So, what makes biodiversity important? It keeps us all alive. It provides us water to drink, food to eat, oxygen to breathe, and clothes to wear. According to the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, the Philippines is one of 18 diverse countries of the world, containing two-thirds of the Earth's biodiversity and between 70 and 80 percent of the world's plant and animal species. However, with the ever-changing environment and increasing global temperature brought about by climate change, some species of forest trees fail to cope with such changes, thereby affecting their ability to survive. But it's never too late. We can still protect our forests and preserve our natural resources. So, how do we make a difference to save biodiversity? Through genetic diversity. Genetic diversity refers to the variations observed in the tiniest detail, the genetic makeup of species. This might come too hard to understand at first, but don't worry. Genetic diversity is just how we are distinguished from each other. Just look at your fingers. Notice how no two people have exactly the same fingerprint.
Heavenly Father, the fount of all goodness and grace, the cause of wisdom, the source of intelligence, we welcome you, O Lord, to this auspicious gathering of your beloved, who continuously give you thanks for every opportunity to learn something new and become fruitful to the works of your creation. We humbly come to you, not because we are worthy, but because we find ourselves in need of you, who is our strength and our hope, to continue despite the challenges we face in health, prosperity, and our solidarity with one another. We pray that today's gathering made possible by the grace of advancements in technology and social media, become successful in its endeavors so we can offer it back to you as our humble offering to honor you, glorify you, and love you through your connection with everyone. May we find bliss in today's session 
and become more productive children and co-creators of the earth. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining our national anthem and our prayers. So with that, um, we are formally opening our uh, webinar, our Subcultural Practices on E-Health Management. So in this webinar, we will be joined by our two great speakers. Of course, one is from the Institute of Renewable and Natural Resources, from uh, the College of Forestry and Natural Resources professor, Enrique El Torentino, and of course, uh, if you are a forester and if you're from UPLB or maybe uh, from other SUCs as well, kilalang kilala natin to, ang ating uh, college secretary then from CFNR, UPLB, from the Forest Biological Sciences, we will be joined later by Professor Mutia, uh, Maria, uh, Mutia Maria Fiumanalo. So with that, I just, uh, okay, I just want to, uh, Okay, with that, po, we will start with our program. So, to finally open our webinar, we will now call on the Assistant Director of the Existence Research and Development Bureau. May we now call on Ma'am Mayumi Pinto, Natividad, Ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Faith. Maganda umaga po sa ating lahat. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you. We have around 219 uh, participants right now here in the webinar. Uh, I'd like to greet uh, some people. See, I, I saw Director Diaz uh, joining us. Good morning. Uh, me, morning, sir. Where Good morning. I'm, I'm so happy na lagi kayong nakaalalay sa amin. And then oh, yes. course, I'd like to... I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just around. Yes. Si Miss Ayet, kanina pa rin naka-join. Siya po ang chief ng ating uh, uh, FERD. And then si Miss Malu, uh, handling our NGP. Uh, of course, I'd like to greet all the participants from uh, DENR uh, region and uh, Penros. Uh, at dito po sa ERDB, belated happy anniversary po sa atin kahapon. If you... Uh, remember, we are we celebrated our 34th uh, DNR anniversary. So, hindi pa naman po huli. Happy anniversary po sa ating lahat. Uh, so, gusto ko rin pong batiin ang mga taga-SUCs na nag-join sa atin ngayon. And of course, I'd like to greet our two speakers, si Dr. Ike uh, Tolentino, at yung pong isa na mamaya baka po sabihin nyo ay kamukha ako. <laughs> Marami pong estudyante ng CFNR na tuwing makikita ako noong ako yung taga FMBA, sasabihin nilang may kamukha po daw ako sa CFNR. So si Professor Mutia Maria Quintos Manalo. So tingnan nyo po, Quintos po kasi ang aking middle name. So 
kaya po kami ay magkamuka since birth ay kami ako na po siya. <laughs> Nadya, nakita ko yung ate ko eh. Yes. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Yeah, hindi, na, hindi rin po kami masyado nakikita ng ate ko. <laughs> Kasi pa dahil sa pandemic. So, uh, but it, I'm glad na we have this kind of platform na kahit tayo ay hindi magkita face to face, ay uh, nagagampan na natin itong ating mga gina. In fact, sabi nga kahapon nung anniversary ng BNR, parang minsan, while of course we don't want na itong pandemic, pero yung nangyayari ngayon, mas maraming nakakapag-participate sa ating mga sa ating mga webinars, sa ating mga meetings, sa mga anniversaries at from uh, Luzon hanggang Mindanao nakaka-join. So, we're glad na we have this kind of platform. I just pray and hope na yung pong ating internet connection will cooperate with us the whole day kasi minsan yan po ang malaking challenge sa ating lahat uh, while we really would like to participate mahina naman yung ating connection. Uh, right now, uh, okay ang connection ko dito sa ERDB, kaya siguro po ako ay makakamonitor the whole day kasi I don't have any meeting the whole day for the first time. Wala akong meeting ngayon. So, uh, last year, I remember, uh, nagkaroon bin, dun po tayo ng isang virtual trade seminar. It's it's about uh, integrated pest management of forestry seeds. Uh, so, Parang kayo din po ang mga naging participants natin. So this time, uh, ito naman ang ating focus naman ay on tree health. So alam naman po natin na uh, ang isang mother tree ay dapat ay healthy healthy. So dapat kaya uh, inorganize po namin itong seminar na to. And this is really very important. Especially na right now ay continuously po ay we are implementing the enhanced national reading program so i hope everybody will will focus on this training for some of us this will be a review uh, but uh, i'm sure marami pa rin tong marami pa rin po tayong mapupulot sa ating uh, dalawang resource persons and uh, i hope that you could uh, you will maximize your participation here uh, every time i i um, I speak sa mga ganito, I always encourage all participants to ask questions. Kasi po, libre po ang magtanong. Uh, don't worry, hindi po to graded. Uh, kahit po professor yung ating lecturer, hindi naman po to graded uh, this time. Mas maganda po ang nagtatanong kayo para uh, at the end of the seminar, walang malabo sa inyo. Uh, and uh, ang maganda nito, pwede nyo pong itanong yung mga nagiging experience nyo sa ground. So I encourage everyone to ask questions, uh, listen attentively, and participate. So yun lang po at uh, alam ko masyadong mahaba ang ating seminar for the whole day. So good luck po, po uh, to everyone and God bless us all. Stay safe po. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ma Mayumi, for your... Uh, message and of course I hope you are also encouraged to be uh, attentive with our webinar. So um, katulad nga po ng sinabi ni Mama Yumi if you have questions we highly encourage you to uh, chat it in our uh, chat box and if later you have questions you can also raise your hands and if you have questions then sa Facebook live right now so you can also comment that yung inyo pong mga questions right now we uh, we already have 380 participants in total, 226, uh, uh, actually 229 here in our uh, Zoom meeting and 154 naman sa ating Facebook Live. So we are expecting more to come. So if you have friends na they want to join in this webinar, please I encourage them to also join. So with that, um, siguro before we start our, uh, formally start our lectures, Siguro uh, hingan lang natin ng konting greetings si uh, Sir Ike and uh, si Ma'am uh, Ma Mutia. Ma'am, can you please uh, say a little greeting po to our participants? Hello everybody, good morning. I'm glad to meet you all. My lecture will still be in the afternoon, so I'll see you around. Thank you very much. Morning, you. Ma Hello. Thank you po, Mamutia. So we are also excited uh, to uh, hear from Mamutia later sa kanya pong magiging topic. And 
Also, we also have uh, Sir Ike right now. Sir, uh, can you please greet for our participants and our uh, colleagues here? Yes, hello, good morning. I'm not sure if my audio and video is coming clear because I'm having this unusual internet connection problem, but uh, I'm glad to uh, be with you all. Uh, how's my audio and video? It's clear, yeah, right? Very um, clear. Clear. Salamat po kasi my internet uh, 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 indicator says uh, it's bad. But if it's good, then that will be uh, an assurance that uh, I'll be coming to it. Thank you. With that, uh, thank you, Sir Ike and uh, Mamutia. And so I know you are already excited para po sa ating mga lecture. So with that, uh, ngayon po ay mag-start na tayo ng ating lectures. You can get your notebooks or you can have your... Uh, pens with you para mag-take notes and also uh, i-take nyo, take note nyo din po yung mga questions nyo uh, para later we can uh, accommodate that questions. With that, uh, we will now proceed with our first lecture. Ang ating pong lecture one will be presented by uh, Dr. Enrique L. Talentino. Uh, it is the Silvicultural Practice on Forest Health. With that, uh, please uh, share the screen. Thank you. Warm greetings from the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. It is my great pleasure and honor to be your resource person to talk about silvicultural practices on forest health management. Before proceeding, let me express my sincerest appreciation to the Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau through its director, Dr. Henry Adornado, for inviting me to be the speaker for this topic on the Enhanced National Greening Program Production of Quality Planting Materials Seminar. As any biological entity in this world is subject to health issues, what with this global pandemic causing much disruptions to the global health of humankind, forests being similarly a living unit has health issues. In similar manner, silviculture is concerned with the health of forests and not simply having the right number and species of trees planted. This lecture seminar will focus on silvicultural practices on forest health management. My presentation will provide the theoretical framework to understand better forest health before discussing the individual details of the pests and diseases. It will certainly focus heavily on silviculture and its guiding principles. Let me start by providing you a disclaimer. I am a silviculturist by profession and not an entomologist, neither a pathologist. Thus, my focus will be more on the silviculture side of forest health management. I may have limited examples of native pests and diseases, but surely Professor Mutyamanalo will be the one from which you will gain the specifics of these insects and diseases. This is the outline of my presentation. There will be some definitions followed by the conceptual framework of protecting forests, attributes of forest health, then next would be protection against biotic agencies, then protection against abiotic agencies, although this will just be specifically focusing on typhoons, and lastly, using silviculture to control damage. The major reference that I've used for this lecture presentation is that of the practice of silviculture applied forest ecology by Ashton and Kelty dated 2018. Let me start by defining to you silviculture. This is a term uh, or the definition of which would be very familiar for foresters uh, in the, our audience. But for the sake of those uh, who are not 
by foresters by profession. Here it is. Silviculture is the art and science of controlling the establishment, growth, composition, and here you have it, health and quality of forests and woodlands to meet the diverse needs and values of landowners and society such as wildlife habitat, timber, water resources, restoration and recreation, and a host of other ecosystems goods and services uh, on a sustainable uh, basis. Uh, the, the definition says the art and science. So it's science-based and its practice is based on the science by which silviculture is founded. Of course, we will not be able to really study all the scientific foundations and basis of silviculture, but uh, I'm just trying to emphasize to you that it's science-based and it spans from this period of establishment to when the uh, trees and the forest would grow and develop and to what would be the species composition or what would be the components of the forest including uh, the faunal components both micro and macro and just like what i've said earlier health is an integral concern or issue that silviculture is addressing and lastly silviculture is likewise concerned with the quality of the forest that is produced so that uh, when we consider all the ecosystems goods and services that are being produced we are always looking not only at the quantity but likewise at the quality of the trees and the forest ecosystem that is produced also i'd like to emphasize that Silviculture is not an afterthought or some sort of a remedy like a pain reliever to remove pain. For example, you might have a headache and uh, what do you do? You take biogesic. So, hindi yung may problema ka sa forest health, then uh, you take biogesic. Or, or, I'm sorry, you take uh, use silviculture or refer your problem to a silviculturist. Silvicultures should dictate the establishment and development of forest stands. This is very true when the threat to forest health is considered. Let's shift now to the definition of forest health. There are several descriptions and definitions of forest health. Let's examine a few of this. Forest health is a qualitative term that refers to the general condition of a forest. A healthy forest is one that is relatively free of insect infestations, diseases, and air pollution. I think that definition is quite clear. Now, forest health is an increasingly important concept in natural resource management. However, definition of forest health is difficult and difficult dependent on human perspective. Another description of forest health is this. From a utilitarian perspective, forest health has been defined by the production of forest conditions which directly satisfy human needs. From an ecosystem-centered perspective, forest health has been defined by resilience, recurrence, persistence and biophysical process lead to sustainable ecological conditions. Definitions and understanding of forest health are also dependent on spatial scale with increasing ambiguity associated with increasing land area and number of trees. Another description of forest health one in which forests are managed to sustain their complexity while providing for human needs. Healthy forests are resilient, that is, they are able to recover after stress. Like, say, for example, in our concern for this lecture seminar by pests and diseases and even other abiotic agencies. Also, forest health uh, would refer to that ability to bounce back after impacts that reduce their primary productivity, loss of nutrients, degraded structure, and or widespread influence and severity of insects and pathogens. In other words, when we consider forest health, there will be stressors and the ability of the forest to bounce back or its resilience is a very important element. And this is where forest protection comes in, thus this lecture seminar. 
Let's proceed now to the conceptual framework of protecting forests. The first step involves building the health of stands and the resistance to disturbance and impact from outside agencies. What are they? So these are disease, insects, invasive plants or any trees, pollutants, and changes in climate. Ecological evidence would suggest that this can be achieved by creating greater structural, class, and compositional diversity at a scale appropriate to the long-term regional drivers of natural disturbance regimes. Next step, any feasible measure to prevent impacts on the forest before they occur need to come next. For example, of prevention, controlling for and excluding exotic insects and diseases at a country's port. That would be quarantining, just like what we're having uh, even for our uh, returning uh, balikbayans or OFWs. Reducing and controlling emission and controlling access to forests via roads and trails when humans, vehicles, and equipment can act as conduits or means of transport for invasive plants, disease, and insects. If and when an actual impact occurs and has become established, combative treatments may need to be applied to suppress the effects of damage. Finally, dead or damaged trees can be salvaged when all else has failed. But in reality, for example, uh, NGP, the foresters are faced with forests and stands that have had history of impact and degradation from a host or a diversity of damaging agencies, either direct or indirect. In these cases, stands need to be, quote-unquote, restored, just like what you're doing, to some greater functional and more productive state than their current form. Thus, the challenges to forest health will crop out the restoration process as what you have been encountering in your NGP projects. Let's examine now the attributes of forest health, or these are the indicators of forest health. These are as follows. Vigor and vitality. Next is resilience and organization. Uh, ano, ano ba itong mga ito? First, vigor and vitality. This would refer to the rates of growth and crown or leaf area that can be used to gauge vigor that is referenced to the limitation of the site. For example, soil fertility or moisturability. Very simply put, Vigor and vitality will tell you how well does your tree grows. Resilience, on the other hand, can be measured in a stand's ability to maintain its structure and composition in the presence of a stressing agent, either biotic or abiotic. For example, a variety of regeneration modes, and uh, we have in our forest ecosystem truly a variety of this uh, manner or which uh, trees regenerate. Example would be sprouting, wind seeds, or advanced regeneration, or to a variety of protective strategies from herbivory, protection nila from herbivores. For example, spines, leaf toughness, and some chemicals like phenols and tannins. Redundancy is a form of resilience. For example, multiple species have the same set of adaptations and mode of regeneration. And that is why biodiversity is important because redundancy could be achieved through biodiverse ecosystems. If any one species in this group succumbs to a pathogen or insect, the remaining species perform the same and successional role within a stance development. Last attribute is organization. 
which include the number of trophic levels of the food web. That's, that's an ecological uh, term which I will be describing in a short while. And the number of interaction between these trophic levels. Ano ba tong trophic levels na to sa ecology? Trophic levels would refer to each of several hierarchical levels in an ecosystem comprising organisms that share the same function in the food chain and the same nutritional relationship to the primary sources of energy. So uh, even at this stage or point, you would realize that from the description from this attitude, Attributes of forest health, biodiversity is an important component. Let's shift now to the biotic agents themselves, specifically insects and diseases, and how do we protect the forest? Consideration of biotic enemies starts from recognition of the fact that trees of any kind of forest represent a source of food to a wide variety of organisms. Tandaan natin, yung mga puno na yan, yung mga halaman na yan, e pagkain yan ng mga insekto o kaya ng mga pathogens. Into the availability of food, organisms ranging from minute viruses to large herbivorous mammals have existed or evolved in the forest that are adapted to feed on these plants. So, yung mga, kahit mga virus na yan, o kaya mga maliliit na mga organismo na yan, hanggang doon sa mga malalaking hayop, inahandyan yan sa ating forest. At uh, ang kanilang kinakailangan ay pagkain. At yun ay nagmumula mula sa mga halaman, o kaya yung mga puno tinatanim natin sa NGP. These organisms are so dependent on the vegetation that changes in the forest will cause populations of dependent organisms. This would be defined as bottom-up driver. There are examples of the other way around where herbivores can change the vegetation by their own behaviors, usually in response to the kind of predator that they are exposed to. This would be defined as a top-down influence. It is important to understand which processes are driving change. Fortunately, only very, very few, accordingly, of the dependent organisms are harmful. In a sense, the organism that kills its host and thus its supply of food is a poorly adapted one. This is why introduced organisms, animals, plants, insects, and diseases often cause much ecological impact and economic loss than the native ones. Ibig sabihin, kasi yung mga native ones ay uh, umaasa lamang doon sa existing food at hindi nila talaga uubusin o kakainin lahat dahil ang ibig sabihin noon ay katapusan na nila. At uh, yung mga introduced Organisms or exotic uh, animals or plants or insects or diseases which will be feeding on the native plants will be the one which will be more aggressive. So well-adapted damaging organisms sometimes cause so little damage that they go almost unnoticed. And uh, in fact, this would be one of those ecological principles na alam natin that exist in a native or primary forest, or a pristine or undisturbed forest. However, some of this caused substantial economic damage without threatening the life of the tree. For example, the heart rots that attack the non-living wood inside the ruin the utilizable wood without significantly harming the vital processes of the tree. The need for modifying silvicultural systems to reduce losses to biotic enemies can normally be confined to those few organisms that can cause serious loss. The vast majority that merely feed on trees without important damage do not require control measures. So, ibig sabihin, kailangan tignan natin kung ano 
ang impacts in terms of economics. And of course, dito lagi tayo uh, pumupunta. The bottom line is economics. What is the economic damage of a particular insect or disease? Now, turning on to uh, the direct control, direct control of damaging organisms, that is uh, the insects, disease, or even invasive plants, involves attacking the insects or pathogens themselves, either with pesticides or various methods known as biological control. So, diretsyong pag-atake ito, diretsyong pag uh, pag-address uh, ng issue when it comes to pests and disease. Biological control involves the introduction or encouragement of biotic agencies that combat the damaging organisms. Suitable agents include fungi that are antagonistic to damaging ones, parasites of insects or predators of herbivores. Indirect control refers to measure that makes the circumstances less favorable to the damaging organism or more favorable to their hosts. This consists mostly of silvicultural treatments that can create and forest environments that resist either damaging agencies or the effects of damage by them. Silvicultural measures can be used to encourage the biotic enemies of insects or to el eliminate trees that are sources of pathogen infection. So in this regard, I must tell you that um, much of the direct control of these damaging organisms uh, will be discussed by uh, Professor Mucha Manalo and with the specific examples for the native uh, pests and diseases. Now continuing, it must be recognized that such are seldom completely successful and that a good outcome at one time and place does not guarantee similar results elsewhere. This is where you have this saying, no, no one size fits all. Hindi pwede yung uh, uh, pag ginawa mo sa isang lugar, ikokopyahin na lamang ng isang, uh, ng isang uh, forester at pare-pareho ng resulta na mangyayari sa atin. And this is where we need Scientist, this is where we need people who would really observe what's happening in the ground, in the field. So such programs, like so many things in silviculture, are best regarded as the continuous application of adaptive management. That's right. So be students and practitioners of adaptive management. And simply put, in the light of many uncertainties, one has to adjust management actions or in this case silvicultural treatments once their outcomes becomes better understood in other words it is like changing your game plan in the middle of the game when you observe that your initial game plan resulted in the poor scoring of your team so it's just like uh, being a coach and seeing at uh, uh, half time or uh, half time of the game uh, tambak kayo ng 20 eh, uh, kailangan paltan mo yung game plan na initially ginawa mo you have to be aggressive in trying to address the issue para hindi kayo matambakan and in this manner in like manner in, in forestry in silviculture in, in this case you got to practice adaptive management you continuously observe what's happening in the field what are the lessons that you have learned from this through uh, you, you get this through your monitoring and evaluation and that's why monitoring and evaluation of your NGP project is very important it's just it's not just like uh, counting your seedlings and, and the species present but it's more than that uh, what's really happening because from this you will learn the lessons uh, ano ba ang nagwo work sa ginawa ninyo at hindi niyo ginawa and from that you should be able to make the necessary adjustment. Yun po ang adaptive management. Successful silvicultural treatments that account for damaging organisms to the trees usually involve several kinds of measures and are tailored to each complex biological situation so that it is difficult to fit them into any simple category. Thus, it is important to watch for syndromes of successive interdependent causes of damage or mortality. 
uh, and in this case, uh, I, uh, I I would want to give a a uh, an example uh, that you might be able to identify. For example, Benguet pine could be weakened by drought, which creates favorable environment for forest fires. So, alam natin yon pag nagkaroon ng uh, malawakang uh, tagtuyo, and of course, this would happen particularly in the light of climate change, pwedeng uh, maglikha ito ng uh, kondisyones na kung saan ay mataas ang probabilidad ng magkaroon ng forest fires and that is very common in pine forest. And when this favorable environment for forest fire is created, this could by the attack either by pine wilt disease which weakens the tree and subsequently bark beetle like ips and this could be fatal. So, what you see here are several steps. So, if one step is omitted, the tree may die. Or rather, I'm sorry. If one step is omitted, the trees may not die. Maaring hindi mamatay. So, halimbawa, nawala ang forest fire. So, ibig sabihin, hindi nang hina ang ating mga benguet pa. It may be, or it may remain vigorous and resist the attack of uh, either pine wilt disease or even bark beetle. So, if someone sees only one step, there is a risk that inappropriate action will be taken or that a counterproductive argument will ensue with those who see only one step. So, it's very important, uh, my, my dear audience, my dear participants, that uh, the monitoring and evaluation is not just yung dikahon nating monitoring and evaluation. You should, uh, in fact, even uh, evolve your own monitoring and evaluation tool where you would observe other things, occurrences, or other events that might be worth helping you um, formulate appropriate treatments, either silvicultural treatments, to address important problems in your NGP site. Let's continue with another concept or concepts and that is susceptibility and vulnerability. If there is adequate knowledge of the situation, as you uh, would be uh, observing in the field, it may be possible by silvicultural measures to create forests that are resistant to damage. In dealing with this or enter relating to damaging agencies, it clarifies analysis to distinguish between susceptibility to attack and vulnerability to damage. For example, let's go back again to that uh, Benguet pine. In Benguet pine forest, mature trees are more susceptible to bark beetle attack than young and healthy trees. The young and healthy trees produces more sap or uh, resin than older trees and the resin is the first line of the by Benguet pine by plugging holes to restrict entry of bark beetles. This had been established already uh, by researchers. In Camp John Hay, visitors or staff who cause damage to the Benguet pine trees by nails, may mga nagpapako na mga uh, signs, chops or spike markings make these trees, these Benguet pine trees, susceptible to bark beetle damage. Benguet pine becomes vulnerable to bark beetle attack when temperature increases while increasing rainfall restricts flight activity of the insect and kills some bark beetles. In El Nino years, tree mortality increases beetle attacks due to high temperatures coupled by drought which could weaken trees or cause forest fires. So as you can see in this concept of susceptibility to attack and vulnerability to damage, one should be very observant of what would be the environmental condition that is occurring particularly now that we have climate change and of course we should understand our trees the silvical characteristic of our trees and the biological properties attributes of our insects so without this understanding 
you may not be able to understand clearly the susceptibility to attack of your trees or their vulnerability to damage when there would be these changes in environment. And at the same time, you cannot create an environment that would ward off this uh, attack by per certain uh, pests and diseases or, ward, uh, or would make the, these trees less vulnerable to damage. So, kailangan ay naintindihan nyo po yun, alam po ninyo ang mga bagay na yun. There are classic generalizations about the damaging agencies of the forest and these are as follows. Model of the stocking level to promote vigorous, fast-growing trees more resistant to insect and disease. Second, generalization is the adjustment of species composition with the assumption that mixed species are less susceptible to insects and disease than single species stand. Now, another uh, classic generalization that we know about these damaging agencies in the forest is adjustment of age class and size class distributions as multi-cohort stands are more resistant to insects and this even age stands. And lastly, avoiding off-site conditions for three species. Let's examine them one by one. Reducing stocking levels to encourage vigorous, fast-growing trees. It is supposed that vigorous, fast-growing trees with plenty of growing space are more resistant than less thrifty, slow-growing trees. Trees that are supplied with plenty of light and soil moisture are potentially less susceptible to secondary diseases and insects. This can be called the plant stress hypothesis. The best examples of reducing susceptibility by decreasing stocking and increased vigor by thinnings and other removals of old or damaged or infested trees are with bark beetles. Accordingly, Benguet pine trees are more susceptible to bark beetle attacks in closed spacing. Thus, thinning will increase between trees or reduce stocking density is recommended to reduce damage. In pine stands, judicious improvement cuttings focus on leaving the most vigorous trees can be done to preclude outbreaks of bark beetles. In Jimelina, root rot accordingly develops at age 10. Thus, rotation should be considered before this age or the outset of the root rot. Thinning also provides better conditions to residual trees so that their vigor increases and could make them more resilient to possible infestation. In bark beetles, crown thinning or the cutting of the larger trees is recommended. Proper disposal of avoid attracting other insects could be made for example, by chipping or burning, although burning is regulated now due to climate change policies. Low pine stocking density also reduce beetle fecundity and overall fitness and increase wind movement, air turbulence, and desiccation that, that disrupt beetle pheromone emissions and colonization. Yung pheromones are, these are the hormones uh, excreted by uh, in attract the opposite uh, uh, gender or sex of the uh, insect and that would mean uh, more reproduction. Sadly, in the Philippines, our research is lagging as far as this relationship of thinning and reduction of susceptibility to infestation as well as the promotion of vigor to ward off infestation. So uh, I think uh, ERDB could prove this kind of research. Uh, for example, treatments to increase vigor to reduce susceptibility to defoliators does not work based on a study that found that fertilize and 
watered a spruce stand. That's why I'm citing to you uh, an exotic example. So um, the fertilized and watered spruce stand promoted greater infestations of western spruce badworm. So uh, it, it contradicts the, uh, the generalization that uh, uh, better, uh, condition, better condition promotes uh, uh, better vigor. Stem rusts of conifers and the white pine weevil are more serious problems of vigorous trees than of the less thrifty one. So ito yung uh, isang uh, view na hindi sinusuportahan ng research. Now, for defoliators, it is thus more important to promote their natural enemies, not to eliminate them, but to maintain their populations at low numbers. Birds are thought to be important predators of western sperm, while rodents are thought to be important regulating controls of gypsy moth. Now, of course, this is an exotic example, but what we see here would be something that contradicts conventional wisdom. But of course, it is important that we uh, do science-based uh, practices or our technologies would be based on uh, outcomes of well-tested researches. So uh, uh, I cited to you uh, contradicting examples in, in uh, the uh, uh, temperate forest but uh, it's just telling us really a need for us to look into this uh, kind of uh, problem so that we have our own solutions locally next adjustments of species composition and role of mixtures in the tropics where tree diversity is high like the philippines individual trees of a species accordingly are less prone to insects and diseases when further away from their close relatives and siblings and surrounded by unrelated taxa that are not prone to the same insects and disease. The term for this effect is negative density dependence. This is what we see in most of our tropical forests where uh, we don't have uh, pure uh, species uh, stands unlike in the temperate regions. In the majority of cases for temperate and boreal forests, mixed stands probably suffer about the same amount of damage from insects and pathogens as pure stands. In many other cases, however, mixed stands suffer less damage than pure ones. If the food supply of some insect does not include all of the species mixed stand, then it is diluted in ways that may inhibit buildup of the insect population. This is probably the chief advantage of mixed stands in, in insect and pathogen management. The physical separation of susceptible plants also inhibits the spread of many insects, especially those that disperse slowly or with difficulty. Fungi that spread through the soil, such as those uh, causing moss root rots, are often less common and less damaging in mixed stands. The long dis or rather the long-term dispersal of insect pests of low mobility, can be impeded by inedible plants. However, no real physical separation exists between plants in a stratified mixture if there is an essentially pure stratum above ground and or rather below ground. So the idea even in a tropical stratified rainforest is that the, the nearest neighbor would uh, be a non-host to the uh, current of the insect or disease. And that is why uh, this particular generalization is uh, accepted uh, mostly by many uh, practitioners of silviculture. Continuing further, if a given mixture is more vigorous than pure stands, 
then it is more likely to be resistant to those insects that attack weakened trees. A mixture is probably more secure against insects than an uneven age pure stand because a given more likely to attack many age classes of a single species than to attack different species. So that's the situation in our tropical forest. Nevertheless, there are important instances in which pure stands are more resistant to certain damaging insects and pathogens than stands of the same species, not on a doctrinaire generalizations. However, a mixed stand of both resistant and non-resistant species is bound to be more secure against injury than a pure stand of non-resistant species. Of course, that's an understandable. But less so than a pure stand of a resistant species. So again, this is talking about uh, the basic um, generalization or principle of resistance. Sometimes the main value of mixed stands in this respect is the consolation that the, the risk of losing whole stands all at once is reduced. Third, adjustment of age class and size class distributions to the diminished susceptibility. The proposed treatment Susceptibility include creating younger size and age class distribution with the assumptions that smaller and younger trees are more vigorous. Of course, we know habang tumatanda ang puno ay humihina ang kanyang uh, resistensya or health uh, diminishes just like in humans. Regenerating stands can perhaps recalibrate species composition further lessening susceptibility. The greater structural and age class diversity is proposed to encourage more abundant numbers of paras parasitoids and predators of damaging insects in a similar manner to studies in agricultural systems. However, studies in forests are very limited and contradictory. And again, this emphasizes the need for us to uh, beef up our uh, research in the tropical uh, forest for pests and diseases. One study suggests reduced susceptibility with younger age class for spruce budworm. Again, this is for an example because we have limited examples that we could cite uh, in the tropics. And again, here's another uh, um, example from the tropic region. In an uneven age stands, there is ample opportunity for infection of young age classes from older trees by pathogens such as dwarf mistletoe that attack trees of all ages, thus enabling an inf infestation to remain established in a stand indefinitely. Avoiding off-site conditions for three species and this probably would be one of those uh, controversial uh, discussions by far the most important silvicultural approach to reducing losses to damaging agencies is simply the evasive action of avoiding conditions that are conducive to damage it is remarkable how damage from insects pathogens or non-biotic agencies can be traced to encouraging species or strains of those that are not adapted to the sites or are simply exotics. Um, this would probably be the one that I was telling you to be controversial. Uh, exotic could be adapted or non-adapted. And uh, this is something that needs to be clarified. Further, Many root diseases are the result of attempts to grow a given species on soils that are too wet or too dry. Less spectacular difficulties arise when a native exotic species is planted or is allowed to become established on a soil or site where it does not grow vigorously or does not grow in nature. 
This emphasizes the importance of species site compatibility, a foundational principle. We have to grow species in its optimum environment. And when it grows in its optimum environment, it becomes very healthy, more vigor, and higher vitality. Now, the trees may fall, or rather, the trees may develop well for some years and then fall victim to some insect or pathogen that may be acting simply as one of the factors that determines the natural range of the species. Some of the most common cases of this sort developed when some species or strain adapted to a moist site is grown on a dry one but succumbs to a root disease or bark beetle attack after a drought year. This sort of difficulty can be reduced by timely thinning, but is better avoided altogether by not allowing the ill-chosen species or strain to grow there in the first place. So why, why grow species which is not supposed to be growing in the wrong site? But there are this there is this interesting and probably um, a classic example of an exotic uh, that was introduced in another site, that of Pinus radiata or uh, Pinus uh, insignis, the Monterey pine or the insignis pine or radiata pine. And this species of pine is native to the coast of California and Mexico. However, Right now, it's thriving successfully as a major plantation species in Australia and New Zealand. In fact, uh, uh, a genetic uh, collection of rajata pine, a range-wide collection, genetic range-wide collection of rajata pine, was made by Australia sometime uh, in the 20th century. And I, I came to know that... Uh, from, from a scientist, uh, former scientist in CSIRO, that uh, uh, because of this range-wide uh, genetic collection made by Australia, they have a complete collection of the, uh, the, all the genetic materials in California and Mexico as well. And right now, in its native habitat of California and Mexico, where a jata pine is threatened, they are seeking or they are asking or requesting CSIRO for the uh, genetic materials that they have collected to enrich once again the native population of uh, in Australia. And of course, uh, this would just be a side comment, but uh, telling us how important uh, range-wide genetic uh, collection of uh, species would be, particularly in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that uh, species uh, would be able to survive under this changing environment. Of course, uh, in our country, there is also this huge debate about uh, mahogany, jimilina, and falcata being exotic tree species, but uh, we can't spend much time discussing uh, this aspect of uh, exotic uh, plantation forestry. But uh, we have to take note that uh, despite the fact that mahogany is infested by shoot borer, it is still being widely planted by, by some smallholder tree farmers. In like manner, falcata, uh, despite the fact that uh, it is uh, exotic and having problems with gall rust and canker, is also uh, planted widely by um, smallholder tree farmers in Mindanao. Uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Manalo would be uh, discussing this more in detail with you. Still on the issues of exotics and unnatural condition, many but not all serious problems with insects and pathogens result from growing trees in habitats to which they are not adapted or from introducing exotic species of insects pathogens. Introduce insects and pathogens are the most dangerous enemies of some species in almost every kind of forest. Sometimes the only good way to control them is by judicious introduction of the enemies of insects and pathogens that kept them in check in their native habitat. But again, it has to be emphasized that it has to be judicious introduction, otherwise you might be 
creating a bigger problem. Introduced tree species may flourish and then suffer serious attack if their enemies catch up with them. They may also encounter serious difficulties with insects and pathogens native to the new habitat. There are other aspects of insect and pathogen management. Direct control with pesticides, pesticides ang ginagamit, is far less important in forestry than in agriculture. It usually involves application or rather foliar applications of insecticides to combat defoliators or application to bark to control bark beetles. Sometimes the tendency is to regard insecticides as perfect solutions for insect even to heap scorn on indirect control measures. So ito yung usually default. Uh, mag-spray ka lamang ng insecticides or pesticides. However, merong isang uh, kabilang panig na view yan. Uh, yung uh, dulo naman yan. There's also the highly popular view that all pesticide application are at worst dangerous and are at best agents that merely prolong insect or pathogen attack. So nakakasira naman sa environment. Uh, delikado siya at uh, mas pinatatagal niya ang uh, pathogenic attack. The truth usually lies in the middle but is important for the special cases in which extreme views are actually justified. In forestry, insecticides or fungicides are commonly used on shade trees or in nurseries where the holes are very crowded and the crop is very valuable. It's very important to keep nursery seedlings from being infected with stem rust, certain root rots, and other persistent disorders because infected plants seldom recover after planting, the principle of early control. And this is something that uh, we have to be uh, very cautious about when out planting of Nursery seedling grading and one of the uh, grading uh, criterion should be all disease infected uh, seedling should never, never be outplanted. Otherwise, you'll just be transporting the uh, pests and disease into your new planting site and it creates more problem. Efforts to develop resistant strains of forest planting stock by genetic manipulations have played a more important role in dealing with fungus disease than with insects. Most of this effort has involved difficult problems with fungi. There are breeding, uh, tree, breed, uh, tree breeding for resistance studies that the uh, College of Forestry and Natural Resources is doing and I hope uh, there are similar efforts for tree uh, resistance that ERDB is likewise uh, doing in a parallel manner. So many different kinds of modifications are aimed at reducing specific kinds of damage that it is hard to detect any general or consistent way in which they conflict with other objectives. However, these measures usually complicate harvesting and other operations. The indirect silvicultural measures of control are often the slowest to take effect but they are the most enduring and automatic because uh, fundamentally you lay down the important silvicultural principles which could potentially prevent the uh, of damage or uh, like uh, infestation or infection. Where indirect measures work, they can usually be dependent upon to do so even when no one remembers to do something at the right time. Now we shift to the protection against abiotic agencies. There are abiotic stressors, meaning non-living, compared with the living, the biotic stress from pests and diseases which we have previously been discussing. And this, these abiotic stressors would include pollutants like uh, ozone, nitrogen deposition, uh, acid rain, and greenhouse gases. Of course, uh, contributed to the uh, biggest environmental uh, threat of our uh, day, which is climate change. Other abiotic agents uh, would include fire, droughts, storms or typhoons, uh, which of course uh, would be the only uh, abiotic stressors that uh, time permitting would be the one that we could be discussing in this seminar. Uh, let's discuss very briefly a uh, protection from typhoons. On the average, the Philippines being in the typhoon belt, and uh, that's something that we could not uh, deny or uh, wish against. Uh, we have an average of 20 typhoons, or in some cases 25 to 26 
Directly hit areas uh, vary, but Luzon and Visayas are usually within the typhoon pathway. But areas not directly hit by a typhoon could suffer also from strong winds, rains, and landslides. Of course, Mindanao, uh, which was spared from many typhoon, is now in the radar of strong typhoons, an example of which is Typhoon Pablo. With climate change, the occurrence of extreme events, for example, super typhoon uh, like uh, Yolanda, is a stark reality. Thus, Philippine forestry has to be ready for the incessant occurrence of typhoon annually. Mangyayari at mangyayari po ito taon taon. will not be sufficient to discuss the details of typhoon and Philippine forest, and I suggest that ENGP uh, dedicate another forum for this timely and very relevant topic. Now, let's look at uh, some important guiding principles in silviculture that uh, could address this concern with regards to typhoon. Uh, these guiding principles are as follows. Imitating nature through silviculture, conservation of site productivity, control of stand structure and processes, control of composition, control of stand density, of rotation length. Uh, a few of these silvicultural principles have been uh, earlier covered in this lecture. For example, uh, control of stand structure in, and processes, control of species composition, control of stand density, and even control of rotation length. Allow me to briefly describe those not yet covered yet or has not been uh, expl expounded uh, fully. The best and mag most magnificent forest in the world was not established by silviculturists or foresters like you. Yung pinakamagara, pinakamagandang kagubatan sa mundo pong ito ay hindi ginagugubat o mga forest practitioners na katulad po natin. Pero saan po sila galing? They have been there since time immemorial and therefore uh, we're, we're saying that uh, what nature has produced or in my case, I have to say that what God has produced and given to man is the best forest. And therefore, imitating nature through silviculture is an important principle that we can use to protect our forest against strong typhoons. Take the case of Sierra Madre Mountain Range, longest mountain range in the Philippines. And this once majestic mountain range, densely populated by a biodiverse ecosystem that faces the Pacific Ocean, is exactly the corridor by which almost every typhoon in the Philippines entered through. The resilience, we have discussed resiliency earlier, the resilience of these forest ecosystems is undeniably unshakable. Centuries of typhoons have not truly decimated it. Uh, ilang daang taon pero hindi siya talaga uh, na, nasira o nawasak. But it took the species named Homo sapiens. Yes, man, tayo po yon. And our machines, technology, fueled by greed and a corrupt nature for valuing forests, it took this to decimate it to an almost miserable state that we have it in right now. Anyway, in terms of regeneration, it is characterized uh, by resilience. Uh, ano po ito? One of which is continuous seeding, even though that there is the seed year of the dipterocarps. There is the proliferation of regenerations of diverse age classes and size classes. Halu-halu po yan. No? Bata, matanda, and different ages. Proliferation, or rather, and other asexual uh, reproduction like resprouting, even a rich soil seed banks where we have a lot of dormant seeds growing, and all of this, pag samasamahin natin to, all of this synergistically contribute to the continuous recovery after devastating typhoons. It could also be observed that much of the trees are of tough or durable wood or premium trees na kilala po natin and they could withstand or even sustain only minor damage even after a devastating uh, typhoon. Similarly, Sierra Madre mountain range could be the longest and probably the most durable shelter belt 
in the country. Pinaka mahaba na nga, pinaka matibay, at pinaka magandang disenyo ng shelter belt. You have heard that many times and it truly has happened that the wind intensity of a particular typhoon was significantly reduced after its hit. Or after it smashes, sabihin na natin smash talaga, pagbangga niya sa Sierra Madre ay humihina, bumabagal siya, nababawasan ang kanyang lakas or kanyang intensity. Sierra Madre's mountain range structural diversity is probably the best design of shelter belt that should be emulated in many NGP sites facing threats of strong typhoons. Even the species diversity should not be forgotten as contributing significantly to the resilience of that mighty forest. There are also other attributes that have not been studied more closely, but uh, these are but the few that I could quickly and briefly mention in this seminar. Also, let's look at species adaptability. This is uh, something that should not be violated uh, when it comes to silviculture. And this should always be followed. When the site is prone to strong typhoons, planning and designing forest narrative, reacting later to remedy a wrong silvicultural practice is being remiss with the fundamentals of proper silvicultural planning and design. Uh, katulad nga po ng choice of species. So, tignan natin, for example, the durable pili. It grows resolutely and strongly in the typhoon-battered region. Of Bicol. I visited a site in Sorsogon where falcata was wrongly planted and there are those trees with big stump and plenty of small stems. A clear indication that the tree grows, tumutubo siya, but whenever the typhoon strikes and it strikes yearly, annually, the main stem breaks and on and on it went for many years. So, ang lumalaki lamang is the stump but you don't produce a merchantable log. Because Sorsogon is practically hit by uh, several typhoons annually or uh, more or less uh, nadadaanan siya. Kaya bali ng bali ang mahinang uh, sanga o uh, puno ng falcata. And it is a known fact in reforestation or uh, in reforestation planning or doing planting plants that a careful examination of historical biophysical information which would include the climate and of course typhoon should be included there and when you do that you should factor that in in your planting plan or in your design uh, for example the species that should be planted uh, should uh, be able to withstand the kind of uh, typhoons that is passing in the area as well as the structure. So, uh, yung mga mono, mono uh, culture at uh, single age usually ay hindi uh, design sa mga lugar na madalas banggain ng uh, malalakas na bagyo. You may have to uh, prepare a shelter belt. Uh, you may have to structure it to be uh, stratified. And even, of course, where you, you would locate the shelter belt is an important aspect in planning. Of course, this is not to say that no forest will uh, be spared from typhoon damage, but it is the resiliency that is an important factor to plan uh, for and to factor in. So, doon pa lamang sa pagpaplano, dapat inisip na yon. Hindi pwedeng uh, tsaka lamang is the afterthought, katulad ng sinabi ko sa introduction kanina. Of course, I can tell, but... Uh, uh, hasten to add that with climate change, some sort of a joker would throw this uh, uh, paradigm, uh, this traditional paradigm that uh, we have into a quagmire of confusion. Uh, dahil dati, alimbawa sa Mindanao, hindi dumadaan ng bagyo, pero ngayon tumatama na. So, papaano na yung mga areas na tatamnan? And uh, this is something that we have to factor because uh, uh, we can never deny the existence of climate change but uh, of course i could not uh, go to the details on the impacts of climate change to forest growth uh, but it's an important aspect that should be considered uh, whenever we look at uh, plantings like engp but uh, i'd like to raise the flag of concern because of this strong possibility of typhoons uh, these extreme events and therefore it's important to do an assessment of the typhoon resiliency of the ngp plantings the questions to be raised how resilient are the, the trees to typhoons, uh, which 
probably might be passing through the NGP area. Can shelter belts still be established to secure the plantings? And is it worth uh, it? Uh, I mean, um, okay lang ba na gumastos ka pa para sa shelter belt para i-save yung uh, natamnan mo na? If not, that's the $64 million question that should be answered. Should NGP maintain those plantings? Now we go to the use of uh, silviculture to uh, control damage. Certain kinds of plant uh, cuttings, I mean, are sometimes done to attempts either to anticipate damage or to prevent it. Pre-salvage cutting is designed to anticipate damage by removing highly vulnerable trees. Yun yung pinakauna. Another one would be sanitation cuttings are more active measures designed to eliminate trees that have been attacked appear in imminent danger of attack by dangerous insects and fungi in order to prevent them from spreading to other trees. Salvage cuttings are done to save the wood in dead or damaged trees. The opportunity to engage in such races with a damaging agent depends mainly on whether stands are sufficiently accessible. Let's start with press salvage cutting. The rational conduct of press salvage cutting depends on identifying those trees that are likely to be lost and estimating the length of time that they may be expected to endure. If the main source of anticipated damage is wind or some other climatic agency, the mechanical structure of trees and their positions within the stand are the important criteria. Trees with asymmetrical crowns or previous injury are prone to additional damage from this source. When biotic agencies or physiological factors such as those related to site factors, the causes of anticipated losses, the vigor of trees is usually the criterion employed in pre-salvage cutting. Trees of relatively high vigor are less vulnerable if attacked because they are less or rather they are likely to endure the amount of loss of vital tissues that would kill trees of low vigor. Again, this is a principle that we have uh, previously examined. We need to maintain high vigor and vitality of our trees. The pre-salvage cutting of trees of low vigor is rendered all the more logical because they grow little in volume or value. Now, uh, I, I'd like to uh, turn your attention i'd like to turn your attention to um, an exotic or a foreign example of tree classification provided by keen uh, this keen this keen's classification is based on two major factors of uh, age and crown vigor um, there are four age classes and four vigor classes within each age class making a total of 16 that's what you see in your slide the four age classes are termed young the one on top followed by um, uh, immature the next one in the row and then the mature and then the last row would be the over mature there are grouped by relative maturity rather than by a definite age range. So, hindi yung edad ang pinag-uusapan, but it's just uh, some sort of a um, a range by which they would consider the age. So, let's uh, adapt something like this. Now, the four crown vigor classes are full vigor, uh, good to fair vigor, fair to poor vigor and very poor vigor and that these are the vigor classes uh, that you move from left going to right we do not have an equivalent classification yet although there are researches now particularly in mfr where some classification of tree resiliency is made however no published results are available at the moment 
Let's go now to sanitation cuttings. Sanitation cuttings are often combined with salvage or pre-salvage. In fact, any cutting may be considered sanitation cutting to whatever extent it eliminates trees that are present or prospective sources of infection for insects or fungi that might attack other trees. So the idea there is really sanitation removing the infected or infested trees. Sanitation cuttings are not worth conducting unless the removal of susceptible trees will actually interrupt the life cycle of organisms sufficiently to reduce their spread to other trees. So, dapat alam natin ang life cycle ng ating mga insekto so that our sanitation cutting uh, measures would be worth doing it and in fact, would pay for it. It should not be tacitly assumed that the vigor of trees is the sole criterion of susceptibility to attack, even though it may be a good indicator of their capacity to endure damage. Some economic pests of the forest, notably insects, multiply most rapidly on vigorous hosts, just as grazing animals prefer forage from ants. Siyempre, mas healthy, malusog yung halaman, mas gusto nilang kainin. Just like in our case, mas masarap kumain ng lechon, mas masarap kumain ng sariwang gulay. Fortunately, the vast majority of insects attracted to vigorous trees do not endanger their own existence by killing their host. These insects rarely become cause for concern. Sometimes sanitation cuttings must be associated with special measures to provide additional assurance that the damaging organisms will not spread to the residual stand. If the insect or pathogen exclusively depends on living tissues, it is sufficient to kill the infested trees and leave them in the woods. If the insects or fungi involved are capable of multiplying as saprophytes in dead material, so meaning to say they consume the dead material, it may be best to utilize the wood even at a loss provided that its transportation does not spread the infestation. Kasi nga, maiiwan, kung maiiwan pa siya doon sa forest, a eh, iikot lamang siya at mag i na ng other trees. This approach can be used to, to increase advantage against bark beetle if, quote-unquote, trap logs or trees. Uh, ang ibig sabihin nitong trap logs or trees, eh, dito sila temporarily uh, ma-attract or magbabahay. And then hold to a mill or log pond before the emergence of the entrapped brood. It may also help to burn slash or treat stumps with insecticides in ways that directly kill the beetles. Proper understanding of life cycle of the insects is essential to conduct this operation. So, dapat naintindihan natin yan, yung life cycle na yan. And I'm sure uh, Professor Mucha Manalo would uh, give you examples and uh, discuss them to you. Those insects, or rather those species of heart-rotting fungi that spread as spores from conchs. The pores are also called bracket fungi and their fruiting bodies are called conchs. Yung makita natin na nasa mga trunks na merong mga lumalabas na fruiting body, yun po ang conchs. Um, those pores from conchs on fallen trees are not easy to control if infected lugs must be left in the woods. However, the felling of infected trees does reduce the distance over which the spores travel. And the accelerated disintegration of the wood shortens the period of danger. There are some types of damage against which sanitation cuttings are ineffective for practical purposes. F inhibit the soil and damage the roots of trees are not likely to be halted even by sanitation cuttings that are carried to the extent of removing the stumps. So, mag-ingat tayo dito kasi... So, uh, it's, it's useless to do uh, sanitation cutting. Some organisms spread so rapidly or over such long distances that sanitation cutting may be a meaningless gesture as far as the effective protection of the stand is concerned. 
Sometimes the cutting of entire stands, so lalahatin, no? may be regarded as a desirable measure of sanitation even if the damaged stands by themselves are not worth the effort. Bakit? Stands that have been badly damaged by fire. Their agencies frequently support the development of large populations of bark beetles that can cause serious injury to the adjacent stands. Yun po ang dahilan. Maari pa siyang kumalat. The expense of an operation that cuts the whole stand may be sufficiently rewarded by reducing losses in adjacent stands. Lastly, Let's look at salvage cuttings. So yung kanina ay una pre-salvage tapos sanitation cuttings. Now this is salvage cuttings. When all else failed, uh, pre-salvage, sanitation, when all else failed, it may be desirable to salvage dying trees. Salvage cuttings are made for the primary purpose of removing those trees that are imminently threatened by mortality, damage, or loss from injurious agencies other than competition between trees or that are already dead but are still merchantable. Salvage treatments should not be regarded as a method of control uh, for the insect or pathogen. Uh, hindi siya katulad ng sanitation cuttings. Ano? But merely allows to redeem some, value, some of the value that has been lost. So, kaya nga salvage. Uh, may isasalba ka pang value niya. Obviously, salvage should not be a treat, or rather, should not be a treatment to consider multiple values and where merchantable timber is secondary. Uh, Siyempre, kasi hindi naman pala talaga mahalaga yung merchantable timber, but maybe uh, may iba ka pa palang uh, value doon sa forest. For example, um, a standing tree, or a, a down timber has unique wildlife habitat characteristics. It could be a bird perch, uh, yung tuntungan ng mga ibon, which would of course uh, be important for bird watchers kung may ecotourism ka. Or of course, uh, it could still in a way contribute to uh, rehabilitation. So, uh, kailangan titignan mo uh, kung meron bang ibang mas mahalagang value. Kasi kung hindi naman talaga primary yung timber, Eh, hayaan mo na lamang. A second example of where salvage should be avoided is where slopes and soils are susceptible to erosion and compaction. The recovery of timber values that might otherwise be lost in one important and expeditious silvicultural means of securing yields greater than those available from managed forests. So, ang, ang tinitignan natin dito is how much timber over. The objective is usually to utilize the injured trees to minimize financial loss. So, kahit paano may makuha ka pa. Salvage cuttings are not conducted unless the material taken out will at least pay for the expense of the operation. Except, except in cases where real justification exists for true sanitation cuttings. Eh, kung iiwan mo pa doon, nagkakalat nga naman yung, yung, yung bark beetle or other uh, uh, disease, eh, kailangan alisin mo na. Kahit uh, hindi niya kayang bayaran pag maibenta mo yung mga kahoy o yung uh, logs. Salvage operations are often not feasible unless they are combined with the removal of health trees in other silvicultural operations such as thinning, or regeneration cuttings. So, uh, pwede pala siyang isama kung may mga thinning operation ka para at least may pambayad din uh, doon sa cutting operations and even transporting of course which could be uh, uh, significant. The immediate financial loss depends largely on the extent and distribution of damage. If trees die sporadically, konti lamang, these scattered places in the stand, so kalat-kalat, they may become a total loss because of the impracticability of harvesting them. Kasi pagkalat-kalat siya at konti-konti lamang, eh, mas napakahirap, mas tataas ang cost mo sa salvage cutting. The loss may be small if the amount of damage is not real and is concentrated in time and space. When catastrophic losses have occurred over a wide area, the returns from salvage are often reduced by the necessity of selling the products on a glutted market. 
yung sabihin yung market ay flooded na ng ng mga produkto. Logging are generally higher in salvage cutting operations than in operations where the trees to be removed have been chosen by intention rather than by accident. And the, identifying the trees to be taken out in salvage cuttings is usually not a problem. Uh, Siyempre, uh, madaling ma makita mo ano pa ba yung pwede kong pakinabangan dito. However, sometimes the mortality caused by the attack of damaging agency does not take place immediately. So, pwedeng hindi mo makita with your naked eye. This is particularly true when surface fires have occurred because the main cause of mortality is the girdling that results from killing cambial tissues. As with other kinds of girdling, the top of the tree may remain alive until the stored materials in the roots are exhausted. It is usually a year or more before the majority of the mortality has occurred. But those trees that were killed immediately have often deteriorated seriously. Thus, it is advantageous to anticipate mortality before it has actually occurred. The predictions must be based on outward evidence of injury to the crown, roots, or stem. So, kailangan ay makapagawa ka ng assessment uh, even externally uh, instead of allowing a year dahil uh, by the time na pabayaan mo siya na year, nag-deteriorate na yung bumaba pa ang value, mas konti na lang ang masasalvage mo. Salvage cuttings should be completed as soon as possible after mortality or injury Dead trees generally start to deteriorate rapidly during the first growing season after death. So it is usually advisable to get the trees out of the woods or forest before insects and fungi have become active once again in the growing season, which probably would be the rainy season. Unfortunately, the amount of salvageable material is often so great that it cannot be removed within a few months or year even if all other operations are suspended. Under such conditions, it is highly desirable to know how long the dead or damaged trees are likely to remain sufficiently sound to be worth salvaging. So, kailangan alam mo, uh, dahil pag nagtagal ka pa, pwedeng mawala ang value mo. N rather, nitong mga kahoy na gusto mong i-salvage. I Entomological and pathological investigations have been available for a number of different species, particularly in the temperate region. But in the tropical forest uh, or in tropical regions like the Philippines, we have very limited study. But uh, this type of knowledge make it possible to conduct large salvage operations systematically and efficiently. Now, the, the amount of time uh, allowable varies depending on the circumstances. Kasi tatanong mo, maghihintay ba ako ng tatlong buwan lamang ba, uh, anim na buwan or what? No? But it would depend on uh, circumstances. The sapwood of virtually all species is highly perishable. Uh, madaling masira yung sapwood. No? But the, the most durable may remain sound for many years. We have a lot of those in the tropical uh, forest. Dead trees of small diameter become valueless long before large trees. Deterioration usually proceeds more rapidly on good sites than on poor. Differences in the rate of decay of various species are also significant. The basic objective should be to schedule large salvage operations in different places in such order that the value of timber saved will be at a maximum. This does not necessarily mean that the most valuable material should be salvaged first because wood may deteriorate much faster. So, marami kang titignan na, na mga factors. Uh, yung, yung site na yan, the rate of deterioration, uh, the value, and, and the location, of course, should be looked at. Harvesting of damaged timber is often more difficult and expensive than cutting in undamaged stand. Uh, sabi nga nila, parang uh, mas madali yung mag-umpisa ka sa yung, yung uh, dire-diretso lamang ang ginagawa mo kisa dito sa ganitong salvage operation na namimili-mili ka pa. This is especially true if large groups of trees have been broken off or uprooted by wind. By wind. Okay, in conducting salvage operations, the money lost because of expensive exceed the potential values wasted from the decay of unsalvaged timber. The, ex, uh, the extremes of both haste and procrastination should therefore be studiously avoided in salvage cutting. So, timing ang uh, pinag-uusapan na, na, na naman dito. No? Uh, kailangan malaman mo kung kailan ka dapat magmadali 
at kailang ka pwedeng uh, magpa-tumpik-tumpik muna. And uh, this would be very valuable. And that, ladies and gentlemen, ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Time for comments and questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ike. Thank you, Paul, uh, Director Diaz. Yes. That's very uh, enriching, you know, uh, update on silviculture. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you, Paul, Director Diaz. Very good reference for our uh, forest researchers at PRDV. Yes, Paul. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Sir Ike, with that lecture. I hope everyone enjoyed that as well as uh, nag-take notes din po kayo with the lectures that uh, Sir Ike has uh, provided. Very informative, very dynamic. And ayun, we hope that our office, uh, the DNR, and of course the other um, agencies that are here will use that uh, information and uh, ideas para po sa mga programs and projects natin. Uh, before we proceed to our uh, questions uh, and um, other information that you want to ask, Sir Ike, siguro, uh, we will just rem uh, post some reminders po. Ano. So we will not provide po an attendance sheet for our participants, but we will provide a link for a post-test so, uh, later in the afternoon after the lecture so that we will uh, assure we will be assured na na, na attend nyo po yung buong webinar so that we can give you as well your certificate. Uh, and also po, uh, before you ask your questions, please, uh, just like uh, kanina po, please rename your display name from, uh, uh, for the format na una po is yung office nyo or your agency and then underscore your full name so that we can acknowledge you and also we can uh, uh, state your name and uh, from where province or from where office you came from. So with that, uh, please do so. If you have questions, please chat it in our chat box. And if you are from the Facebook Live, please uh, comment your questions. We are very much um, happy uh, na masagot po yun with uh, Dr. Ike. But before that, um, uh, we will proceed po muna with the proper introduction sa atin pong speaker. We are sorry kanina uh, na hindi ko natin na uh, introduce very well si Sir Ike. But na, right now, we will introduce Sir uh, with this uh, PowerPoint. So, yeah. So, this is... Uh, please, next slide. Ayon. So, si Sir Dr. Uh, Enrique L. Talentino is a <laughs> professor 12 from the Institute of Renewable and Natural Resources from the College of Forestry and Natural Resources. So maybe some of us, just like me, naging professor po natin si Sir Ike and uh, we talagang ano, uh, I believe that na, marami tayong natutunan sa kanya from our um, college days. Next slide, please. So ang um, tinutulo po ni uh, Sir Ike is uh, courses in the baccalaureate and graduate levels. Among the courses uh, are the general forestry, elementary forest production, forest nursery. Of course, we know uh, sa mga uh, nag-major sa uh, IRNR, silviculture, um, silviculture too for plantation forestry, for forestry seeds, advanced silviculture, <laughs> physiology, um, physiology of seed aging, deterioration, and environment. Next slide, please. Ayan, so see, si, uh, Dr. Uh, Indiga El Valentino uh, has his uh, PhD in forestry in 1993 in the uh, Mississippi State University, major in uh, three seed physiology, minor in biochemistry. Next. And of course, uh, he is a recipient of David Mooring Memorial Award, outstanding graduate student ng Forestry Department, School of Forest Resources, Mississippi State University, noong 1992 to 1993. Next. 
uh, yan po, uh, isa rin is uh, from the Philippine National Coordina uh, Coordinator and concurrently siya po ay Secretary of the Asia Pacific Forest Genetic Resources Program. And um, yung one uh, of his popular paper written is the issues of species introduction in the Philippines noong 1982 and the four uh, and the prospects of hormones noong 1981. So, next up. Yeah, so si Sir Po is a, a professoral chair lecturer in subculture and forest influence, uh, influences. Guillermo Ponce, pro, professional chair lecturer award in June 1980 to July 1990, 1999, and June 1999 to 2000, also in 2002, 2003, and 2004. With that, um, next one. Ayan. So with that, we know that we are in a go uh, we are in good hands in terms of our questions and in terms of uh, the things that we have learned and uh, yung mga questions nyo po and your comments are very great. Welcome right now. So, Sir uh, Ike, Dr. Ike, are you ready po for the questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So with that, we will proceed with our first question, Sir. This is from, yeah, this is sir, from Sir Derek. Uh, this play name is Sir Derek. Sir Derek, uh, can you please state later yung uh, agency of, of your, or your office? Or, uh, this is the question, sir. Is there a specific per, uh, percentage of species composition or the density of species that a mixed stand should possess? Okay, so it's it's very silviculture question. <laughs> so yeah, um, uh, but that's that's a good question. Thank you, uh, Derek, for that very interesting question. Actually, when when we do restoration, uh, in as much as you are asking the mixing of species, uh, one of the things that uh, has been actually um, it, it's actually what's ought to be done, but it's not done in most cases uh, in our practice here, is using a so-called reference or analog forest. So what is a reference on, uh, or analog forest? No? Uh, by, by, by the term, if you say reference, yeah. so when, when something is a reference, you look for it. Uh, it's the pattern that you use. And, and, and in this case, you know, when we talk about restoration or even rehabilitation, anong ibig sabihin ng reference forest? Well, a reference forest would would have would actually be a, a a forest by which you can pattern your restoration. So in this case, if you, you're asking, ano ba yung talagang magandang mix, ano? Kasi uh, one of the uh, even in this lecture, or even when it comes to uh, discussing um, uh, when we talk about uh, pests and diseases, it's some mga generalization is when you mix species. Just like when you emulate a tropical rainforest, uh, ang idea non is uh, the idea is having a balance of prey and predator, uh, a balance of the pests and diseases. So, uh, merong merong nangangain ng mga ngain ng kahoy mo. Kaya nga ang gusto natin is a mixed forest. And of course, your question actually goes to that. Eh, ano ba yung ano ba yung mixture? No, kasi uh, pwede mo bang parang paghaluin? paghaluin na lamang ko ano nung species but just to give you first ano bago ko i-discuss in hindi naman detail ano pero bago ko bigyan linaw yung reference forest na yan uh, let me give you a simple analogy if if you would be if you would be uh, cooking no if you would be cooking say um, malapit na ang tanghalian eh sige kare-kare no halimbawa kare-kare uh, ano ba ang gulay na ilalagay mo sa kare-kare? Di siyempre, uh, hindi ako magaling magluto. Uh, nakita ko yung kapatid ko dyan. Tsaka yung magaling magluto eh. Uh, yung, yung, meron yata siyang puso ng saging. Meron din parang sitaw yata at kalabasa. Parang ganun. Ano? Pero hindi mo siya pwedeng haluan ng ampalaya. Uh, hindi mo siya pwedeng haluan ng saluyot. So, uh, what, I, what am I saying? No? So, when it comes to food, uh, of course, lasa yun eh. No? Merong tamang mixture. But when it comes to forest, ano naman yung pwedeng mixture? Uh, parang ang ibig ko din sabihin yung kanina, eh, pwede mo bang basta uh, pag sinabi mo, lang na, sinabi mo lang mixed forest, o sige, paghaluin ko ang white lawan at saka bagtika. Okay ba yun? O kaya, ihalo ko yung nara o ihalo ko yung uh, mulave. 
etc. or ipil, what, whatever uh, uh, species, ano lang ba ang pwede mong pagkaluin. Babalik tayo dun sa reference forest na sinasabi ko. What is a reference forest? This reference forest is the one that you will emulate. At saan mo siya kukunin? You get it usually from a primary undisturbed forest of the same ecological condition. So ibig sabihin, whatever, um, whatever geographic ecological zone you may have, you have to look at, well, uh, hopefully meron pa, no? meron pang natitira dyan, na Derek dyan sa lugar mo, na undisturbed or more or less slightly disturbed uh, reference forest. O paano sabihin mo, eh wala na, eh, wala na natira. Hopefully, hopefully sana ay meron pa ring mga ecological studies that have been previously made where there would be descriptions of what would be the species that would be present. Eh pag sabihin mo naman, eh talagang wala eh. Uh, wala yung ecological studies. Uh, another way would be uh, you may have to reconstruct uh, your reference forest. How do you reconstruct it? Well, um, uh, one, one way of doing a reconstruction would be going to uh, uh, Herbarium or the National Museum and checking on what species used to inhabit a particular geographic or ecological zone. And from there, makikita mo kung ano yung mga mixture ng species. Of course, uh, hindi mawawala dyan yung mga key informants. You do a KII. Uh, kung meron pang mga, mga matatanda dyan sa lugar na yan, na ibibigay sa'yo, kaya lang ibibigay sa'yo ay uh, uh, the local names. And of course, you can uh, check with uh, the taxonomists ano may mga local names na yun. And you can more or less uh, construct, quote-unquote, ano yung mga species na nandyan sa ecological uh, region or zone na meron ka. So uh, yun yung sagot na ano yung pwede mong pagsamasamahin kasi na species. It would have to depend on the ecological zone that you are in and that ecological zone would have to be uh, checked or referenced with this analog or reference forest. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With that um, very informative na answer, I hope, Sir Derek, uh, nasagot po yung inyo pong katanungan and actually more pa yung nabigay ng sagot uh, sa inyo. With that, we will, uh, if you have um, corresponding pa po na question, please do so. Pero we will move on to our second uh, question from Forrester Laja from DENR Shokon. So we have an established seed source of Almasiga in Baligin, Baligin Sambuanga del Norte. When ty uh, Typhoon Vinta hit Shokan in 2017 and most part of Sambuanga del Norte, we have observed that the uh, flowering of Almasiga hamper or decreases. I would like to ask if, uh, if the typhoon is a factor or may affect or effect, effect ito on the fruiting of Almasiga tree. Sir? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Forrester Ladja. Um, Definitely, when there is typhoon, there is stress. And a stress tree would definitely uh, exhibit um, physiological responses uh, in response to this disturbance. And one of which would be the decrease in uh, fruiting uh, of your almasiga. Uh, why is it so? Well, well for one, um, in, although hindi mo sinabi, no? But uh, I would assume that um, nagkaroon siguro ng defoliation problem. Uh, siguro dahil uh, masama siguro yung tama niyang uh, binta na yan ano, sa Shoko noong 2017. So there could be defoliation. At ang defoliation o yung pagkabawas ng crown, pagkabawas ng mga dahon sa puno, would have a corresponding decrease in terms of its capacity to phos photosynthate. And photosynthesis, uh, actually photosynthesis would be the one that would be producing uh, a lot of the food, uh, particularly carbohydrates of, of your tree. Pag nabawasan kasi ang carbohydrate production uh, ng kahit anong puno, ang kanyang capacity na mag-allocate ng carbon and other resources for fruiting ay correspondingly bababa. So uh, in fact, uh, ang ginagawa ng iba well, of course, this would be probably a horticultural practice. Would be uh, after that, siyempre, nagkaroon ng stress is uh, 
uh, you have to do some supplement. Uh, pwede sana kung sinuplement mo siya ng additional fertilizer para increase lamang, i-boost yung kanyang, yung kanyang growth para makapag-produce siya again uh, much ng, ng carbohydrates. It's just like it's just like having a balik na naman ako to an analogy. Uh, pag nagkasakit ang isang tao, uh, parang yung bagyo tumama, nagkasakit ang tao, ang kaso and of course sana naman wag COVID, ano? Sa mga panahon na to, anong dapat mong uh, gawin, no? Uh, siyempre pakainin mo na pakainin ng masustansyang pagkain. Uh, kasi yung yung health niya ay hindi perfect, hindi mataas yung health niya. So uh, with a low health yung capacity niya na na uh, sa tao no to reproduce ay mababa. So ganun din ang puno dahil nabawasan siya ng crown most likely, nabawasan ang carbohydrates niya, capacity niya to produce uh, flowers and fruits mababawasan ay, din. Uh, so so that's um, that that's uh, one of the uh, possible impacts na nangyari doon sa sa puno ninyo. Thank you sir. Uh, with that, so I hope Sir uh, for Sir Laja na sagot po yung inyo pong katanungan. So thank you po Sir. Uh, we will move uh, to another question from Sir Garrix uh, Christian Alab. Uh, this is from FD Live. So he is from Senro Glan, Sarangani. Uh, ang question po is, in a mixed stand plantation, is there specific species which harmonize its growth and resistance of pests and diseases, sir. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's more or less very similar to the, the first question. Ano ba yung mixture, no? Um, uh, and I think uh, that's one of the classic generalizations that I have uh, discussed in the lecture. That uh, having a mixture of species would uh, have more or less the balance of the prey and predator. And I, I go back again, no? I go back again to that reference forest. Uh, in the particular, sinabi ba niya kung anong region siya? Yung nag-question, sinabi, hindi nasabi kung isang region. No? But, but anyway, um, whatever region you may be, going to that ecological zone uh, that you have, uh, you have to check on the specifics, uh, again, of the reference forest, uh, a, a primary forest and then a disturbed forest and and that that would be no kung ano yung yung species composition yun yung attribute na magkakaroon siya ng uh, capacity to really uh, be resilient uh, hindi ibig sabihin uh, na rin yung resistance ano be resilient with uh, pest and disease attacks kasi nga um, alam na alam natin uh, lalo sa mga foresters ano uh, with our observations, long-time observations, kita natin in a tropical forest, yes, there are insects, yes, there are diseases, and yet, no, uh, it doesn't blow up to the level of epidemic. Saan natin nakikita ang may uh, epidemic level ng pest and disease? And I'm sure uh, Professor Manalo would be discussing this uh, later this afternoon, although I could cite to you some examples also. Uh, saan natin nakikita? Pag nagkaroon tayo usually na monoculture, particularly yung mga introduced species. But uh, when it comes to the uh, um, that primary tropical forest that we have, doon natin talaga makikita ano yung mixture. Kaya nga, lagi, yung, yun yung sinagot ko kanina, you have to go back to that reference forest. Kasi uh, wala talaga tayong model, ano ba talaga yung pwede mong paghalu-haluin na species right now. Uh, when it comes to plantation, wala tayo niyan. But Ang gusto ko lang sabihin, if you will be doing a mixture of plantation, mixture of species, check in your ecological region, doon sa primary forest ninyo dati, ano yung mga magkakahalong species, magkakasama, what are these associated species, and that would be the best guide uh, really to, um, to the mixture of the species that you would be uh, uh, putting in, maybe even in your NGP, no? kung gusto mong sabihin mo, oh, sige, we would want to emulate uh, the the old forest that we have here, eh, sa, tatanungin mo, eh, anong paghahalu-haluin naming species? Again, look at ecological studies, old ecological studies, or again, go back, go to maybe the Museum of Natural History and check, or even herbarium, no? Uh, may herbarium ang uh, CFNR, ang UPLB, um, may herbarium ba ang ERDB? Yes pa sir. 
Yeah. Yes, Ma'am, kung may, may mga kayong collections na gano'n, nakalagay kung ano yung nakolect doon sa mga lugar na yon, malalaman mo kung ano yung original na present na species doon. And the associated species, kasi usually nakadescribe yun doon sa mga herbarium mga collection. So, alam natin, hindi tayo yung sinasabi ko kanina example na kare-kare na nilagyan ng ampalaya at saka nilagyan ng uh, hinbabao. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ike, uh, with your uh, answer. Actually, ang, uh, from Region 12 daw po yung gland, yun, for uh, confirmation na. So, okay. so, we will move on? Or... Yeah, so kung ganun, Region 12, just just look for sa Region 12, ano ang, uh, may, kung meron kayong ecological studies, and I hope, uh, I, I'm not familiar, maybe an, anong university na pinakamalapit dyan sa inyo, most likely, baka may mga ginawang studies, yung mga, mga uh, studyante dyan, um, documenting uh, yung yung ecological studies ng area na kung saan ay naka-describe naka ang uh, mixture ng species. So that would be a good reference to start with. Thank you po, sir. So with that, uh, we'll move on to maybe two more questions. So ang question po natin is from Penro Masmate, from Sir Noel Tigernase. There are some borders daw po uh, of borders sa kanila pong mulabe sa kanilang seed production area in uh, POB Corpus Masbate. So what are the recommended methods to control it po? Okay, thank you uh, from uh, Penro Masbate. I would probably uh, defer the answer to that to Professor Mucha kasi borer sa mulabe yan. Uh, just like uh, my disclaimer, I am not an entomologist, neither a pathologist. So pag specific insects na, si Ma'am Mucha po ang sasagot sa inyo. Uh, I-take note nyo na lang yung para masagot ni Ma'am Mucha mamayang hapon, please. Yun po. So tama si Sir. Uh, yun nga po. Uh, we will take note of the question. And later on, Ma'am Mucha will actually talk about yung mga pests and diseases po sa atin po mga forest plantations. So we will also take note of that and itatanong po natin yan kay Ma'am Mucha later in the afternoon. So ito po, may question, sir, from Harry Bon, from Sir Ken uh, Fenya Flor. So ang question niya po ay, uh, what are the roles, sorry, what are the roles of the partner community in keeping the forest health, particularly in the uh, in the reforestation sites? Okay, thank you, Ken, uh, from Harry Bon for that question. Uh, definitely, um, if particularly uh, with, with the advent of this forest and landscape restoration, uh, communities, uh, especially even uh, laluna indigenous communities would play a very vital role uh, in, in uh, maintaining the health. Uh, for one, uh, indigenous, if you talk about indigenous communities, you know, indigenous communities would be very, very familiar with the uh, composition of the forest and how actually to maintain the, the, the health of the forest. Uh, since time immemorial, yung mga indigenous peoples na yan ay nakatira na doon. And they have indigenous knowledge, which hopefully, no, hopefully, ay dyan sa lugar na, um, na nag-operate kayo, Ken, ay uh, na-document na, na. Because uh, this indigenous knowledge on uh, maintaining, um, well, pwede natin sabihin indigenous knowledge on forest management, which would, of course, uh, without saying it, ay nahandyan na yung kanilang silviculture, nahandyan na yung kanilang uh, forest management in general, ay uh, nakatala naka, naka, naka na yan sa kanilang uh, kasaysayan. So uh, definitely indigenous knowledge would be very important. Ngayon, uh, if, if they are migrant communities, uh, yun, ang medyo, ano, no, yun ang medyo malaking katanungan. If they are old migrant communities and have become a part of uh, uh, the forest and, and uh, they have managed the forest well. Uh, hindi ito yung examples ng mga, mga migrant communities na uh, ang ginawa ay uh, dahil sila ay lowland farmers, eh, ang dinala nila ay yung farming nila sa Aplan. Ang pinafarm nila ay mais at saka palay. Eh, Siyempre, uh, you, you would immediately note that it's a very destructive uh, and unsustainable upland agriculture. So definitely hindi yun. Uh, but, but if we're talking about a community who has knowledge, uh, preferably yung indigenous knowledge nga na sinabi ko, malaki, we, we can mine a lot, we can mine a lot, a wealth of information from these people on how best to uh, maintain the health of this uh, 
uh, forest no uh, pero ang mahalaga doon is the documentation and i'm sure uh, Haribon would be one of those very active, proactive uh, NGOs uh, doing uh, restoration work. At uh, I'm sure you could have uh, done uh, maybe this uh, documentation of indigenous knowledge of uh, certain indigenous people. At don kayo makakamay ng a wealth of information on on maintaining the good health. Kaya ayan ay mapapakinabangan natin ng uh, sa, ma sa maraming panahon. But uh, of course, we know that they are very limited. Uh, you would uh, uh, look at the literature at hindi ganun karami din ang makikita natin. Thank you, Ken, for that question. Thank you, Sir Ike and Sir Ken for the question. I hope na nasagot po yung inyo pong question or yung in inquiry. So with that po, um, I think uh, we don't uh, have... Uh, yeah. Yes, Sir. Uh, Please. Uh, mayroon akong uh, short question kay Dr. Ike. Pwede pa ba humabol, Dr. Ike? <laughs> Yes po, Director Diaz. Basta kayo po. <laughs> you know, I have been listening very intently in the past two hours of your very refreshing uh, discourse on silviculture. <laughs> I, remember, I remember my silviculture class uh, way back uh, more than half century ago. <laughs> and it's very refreshing really. Uh, you're very informative, you know, complete lecture on how to grow forests, how to protect, how to maintain in all about forests. Now, my question, uh, Doc, is, so my question, Doc, I, is the National Greening Program, as you know, in its executive order and uh, uh, advocates the planting of indigenous species. Nowhere you will find that they will advocate the exotic or past growing species. Of course, when you talk, when we talk with the private stakeholders, they are complaining that why they are not allowed to plant past growing or exotic species, which has a short rotation. Could you comment on this? Okay, um, thank you, Paul, Director Diaz, uh, for that very, uh, very, very relevant question, Paul, uh, with regards to NGP. Uh, hindi ko po alam kung ang teacher niyo po ng uh, silviculture ay si Professor Hakalne. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hakalne in the late Dr. Domingo. <laughs> oh, no. uh, yes, uh, Dr. Domingo. Um, um, of course, the former director ng um, uh, BFD and of course, dati po sa PICO, ano, naging teacher yeah, oh. si uh, Professor okay. Hakalne and uh, my, my boss. Ganon din po. Uh, for a short time, si uh, Dr. Domingo ay umalis na rin po sa university. No? But uh, going back to that um, question of yours with regards to uh, fast-growing species and uh, um, this, this, uh, the uh, promotion of uh, indigenous species, uh, there's usually this, this contention. And uh, I, I hope, uh, and of course, uh, I see that, that we have a lot of audience and I hope many of our audience have been uh, participating. Meron po ang ECRAF na um, a series of webinar, Forest and Landscape Restoration. And in fact, uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, I would say, a very uh, a globally accepted uh, approach now to uh, restoration and rehabilitation of degraded forest. Uh, we're in the, the uh, main focus is not only restoration of uh, ecological integrity, not only restoration of ecological functions and uh, processes, which of course is very primary when it comes to uh, restoration and rehabilitation work, but another uh, or a tandem, a tandem objective of forest and landscape restoration is actually the promotion of human well-being or actually uh, emphasizing also on socioeconomic goals or targets because it has been realized uh, particularly the uh, I would say the traditional paradigm the the uh, conventional reforestation or planting works that uh, le le let's plant a fast growing species let's plant uh, um, you, well usually uh, exotics pa nga ang ginagamit but Anakita, no? It has been it has been observed that it has not worked in in many of the des degraded landscapes in the Philippines, and I think uh, this is one of the situations 
were forest and landscape restoration, which I know um, DNR through the Forest Management Bureau is espousing um, yung FLR kung tawagin. Ano? At dito nga po sa FLR na to where I've said that uh, there is this uh, balancing of uh, the goals of ecological restoration of ecological integrity and, and socioeconomic well-being of, of the people. Uh, doon sa balancing dito, dito natin makikita on how best to use land, the limited land in a landscape. At dito po natin magagawa yung masasabi nating uh, trying to mix, trying to mix in the limited uh, land area that we have in landscape, we try to mix pwedeng magkaroon tayo ng uh, fast growing woodlands in certain sections. And also in certain sections of the landscape, also um, portions devoted to crops or to activities which would uh, address the socioeconomic needs of the people. Because I'm sure, um, Director Diaz, uh, sa, sa mahaba niyo rin pong experience uh, as a Philippine forester, eh, hindi po natin pwedeng itanggi na yung socioeconomic goals lagi ay bumabangga doon sa mga environmental or uh, ecological goals. Kaya uh, FLR uh, as a global approach ay pinagsama po nila, pinagahalo. Subalit, uh, it's, it's easier. No? Uh, the, the theory is easier said, described, but its actual implementation is very difficult on the ground because the balancing of this socioeconomic goals with environmental or ecological goals is the tricky part. And in fact, uh, uh, but there will be tools, you know, there will be analytical tools kung paano natin i-blend. Uh, how do we blend the environmental with the ecological role so that uh, we can grow both side by side in a landscape, uh, fast growing species, which would of course uh, address some other needs uh, and of course, even the wood uh, requirement of our country, which is which is espoused in the revised uh, Forestry Master Development Plan of the Philippines, uh, 2016, dated 2016. At saka ito pong socio-economic goals ng ating mga tao. May mga, may mga um, decision model tools na pwede pong gamitin kung paano natin i-allocate yung limited land area. But uh, definitely hindi po natin pwedeng uh, mag, hindi po tayo pwedeng magpikit mata lamang na sasabihin natin eh kailangan itong mga fast growing species lamang kailangan puno itanim because whether we like it or not uh, something like 25 million Filipinos uh, or even probably more are in the uplands and uh, they, they don't just accept ito pong uh, pagtatanim lamang ng puro kahoy at fast growing species maghahanap at maghahanap sila ng uh, uh, mga activities, livelihood activities in particular, so not necessarily trees that would uh, that would be using the limited land in our landscape. So, uh, sa akin po uh, as a silviculturist, I uh, I'm very open sa ganito pong approach where uh, in the limited area, kailangan we talk with the communities on how we can blend uh, various land uses and uh, while at the same time maintaining ecological integrity and addressing their socioeconomic issues. Salamat po. Napakahalaga po niyang tanong niyo niyan. Na, at uh, sana po ma-address din po ito ng NGP dahil uh, alam natin na napakahirap uh, na uh, hindi natin titignan ang pangangailangan ng ating mga komunidad sa ating uplands. Thank you po, sir. Oh, salamat, salamat do ko ay. Well said. No? Isa na lang, ha, kung po pwede. Uh, Faith. Sige po. Sige po. Oh, this is in the issue of uh, is, uh, species invasiveness, you know. Uh, there are few species uh, which are well grown, uh, mm. uh, as we know. Karamihan, katulad yan sa ating sariling kampos, yung mahogany, you know, it's very luxuriantly growing. Nasabi nga ng iba, eh, uh, yung mga invasive species dapat ay itigil na. So, ano po ang stand ninyo or, or even the College of Forestry on that issue? Okay, uh, I, I won't speak for the college because um, as an academic institution, uh, we have uh, so-called academic freedom. We exercise academic freedom. And uh, of course, just like uh, um, other professors, uh, they may have their personal views on this. Uh, but but uh, if we would go back to uh, the history of the introduction of Swetenia macrophylla or mahogany 
Yeah. Uh, meron pong isang professor daw nung around 19, I think it was 1910 or 1911 na kung saan ay uh, namasyal po siya sa India, Botanical Garden in India at dinala po niya. Uh, nanguha lamang po siya ng around 1,000 seeds ng uh, mahogany at uh, according to the uh, history uh, sa forestry leaves po yon ay uh, may nag-germinate na 400 at ito pong 400 seedlings na to ito siya pong uh, kumalat no? sa Pilipinas sa uh, Ming Lanilia and, and even that uh, uh, I, I forgot that reforestation in, in Ilocos uh, na kung saan ay nagtanim din ng uh, ng mahogany. So kumalat po yung 400 na yan. And then of course, uh, uh, it's more than a century na ang mahogany po ay nasa Mount Makiling. And uh, I'm sure, kitang-kita po natin ano, in the media, tama po kayong sinasabi, it's, uh, I would I, I describe it as a bedeviled, a bedeviled species. Ano? Um, parang uh, maladimonyo po ang tingin nila, basta mahogany, eh, invasive yan, huwag kayong magtanim yan. Ano? But, uh, Ganito lamang po, no? if you talk to uh, three farmers, uh, we have talked to three farmers, uh, sasabihin nila, bakit nila sasabihin invasive to? E eh, pinakikinabangan ko itong, itong mahogany na ito, nakakabenta ako. No? So talk to a three farmer and uh, his view of uh, the invasiveness of uh, mahogany may not be the ecological uh, perspective that some other people might be... Uh, Uh, expressing no sa kanya ang ang mahogany and, and just like uh, I would even say uh, Jimelina po at saka Falcata na alam natin ay very popular sa Mindanao uh, th- these are exotic species um, and yet no even Jimelina sa region 2 naman no and yet they are favorite of our tree farmers so kung ang sasabihin ay itong mga exotic na to ay uh, very invasive um may may problema po pag ang kinausap natin ay uh, smallholder tree farmer na nakikinabang po dito. But going back sa Mount Makiling, um, I would cite uh, studies uh, accordingly. Uh, ito po ay ginawa ng estudyante sa Forest Biological Sciences. May mga nakita akong mga colleagues ko from Forest Biological Sciences na ang resulta ng kanyang thesis ay uh, invasive daw po ang uh, Swetenia macrophylla. However, However, uh, sabi ko nga I'll be speaking uh, as a per, as a uh, as an individual person uh, yung aking pong perspective hindi naman po ang tinatanong niyo Director Diaz. Uh, I have my graduate students uh, for several semesters already, no? Uh, paulit-ulit kong ginagawang lab exercise ito doon po sa Mahogany Plantation, yung PFLA tree po ng uh, Mount Makiling Forest Reserve. At lumalabas po sa study ng aking mga graduate students ay hindi po invasive ang, ang Swetenia macrophylla. In fact, uh, just to be very ridiculous, if uh, Swetenia macrophylla is truly that invasive at uh, alam naman po natin, eh, wala talagang very active na silviculture na ginagawa sa Mount Makiling for its 100 years of existence in uh, Mount Makiling Forest Reserve. Sana po ang Mount Makiling ay buong mahogany na po sana siyang forest. Pero until now, ay hindi po ganun na nangyayari. Another, uh, another observation I'd like to uh, uh, share is in Impalutao. Uh, kung yung mga familiar po sa inyo sa Impalutao, ano? yeah. uh, there are uh, Bukidnon. Bukidnon po. No? Um, for several times po, naka-visit po kami dyan. I don't have, uh, I could not uh, pull out my my uh, pictures now of Impalutao but uh, uh, meron po doong ano no meron po doong mahogany plantation uh, alam ko pong napuntahan niyo na rin po yung director Diaz but underneath yeah. Yeah. Oh. mahogany plantation are the pterocarp the pterocarp uh, wildlings no hindi po tinanim ano wildlings po na tumutubo so uh, mm-hmm. If if uh, it's that invasive, uh, I think uh, it should be put in question, you know. So uh, ganun po, may perspective po yung tree farmer about the invasiveness. Pero sa akin po, uh, base doon sa nakikita ko po, it's it's not that uh, not that aggressive really. At uh, in fact, uh, it's um, uh, IUCN has uh, classified it as uh, already endangered. Sa kanyang uh, sa kanyang uh, native habitat uh, which is somewhere in Central America. 
So yun po ang uh, pasensya na po kahit mahaba akong sumagot. Ganun daw po sumagot ng mga professor eh. Pasensya na po. <laughs> oh, salamat, salamat Doc. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you din po, uh, Director Diaz. Yeah. God bless and stay safe. Sige po, kayo din po. Thank you Sir Diaz and thank, uh, thank you Dr. Ike uh, for that uh, question po. Siguro we, uh, we will only uh, have two questions na lang Sir. So di, medyo sure. ano po, napapahaba po na yan. Okay po. Okay, sir. So, sir, ito pong question na to is from Carl Villegas um, from FAO. We are assuming na he's from the Food and Agriculture Organization. So, sir, what are the advantages daw po of monoculture plantation over a mixed forest in the context of physiological responses of forest trees? Yan, to exemplify daw po, based on available studies, are there any alle allelopathic effects? resulting from the combination of various forest trees compared to monoculture. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, Carl used to be my student uh, and is one of those uh, uh, very good students who have excelled already at, as a FA on the Monoculture versus mix, yes. mixed uh, uh, plantations. No? Uh, katulad na sinabi ko kanina, we don't really have a model on really what, what wala tayong masyadong model, actual model on the ground na yung ginagawang uh, mixture ng species. Except if the restoration would be uh, uh, looking at uh, a reference forest. Ano? Uh, ang tanong niya kanina is about, uh, he was asking about, uh, did I hear something on allelopathy and also uh, some uh, physiological uh, uh, advantages. Well, of course, um, if you talk about uh, monoculture plantation, um, again, uh, balik na naman doon sa sagot ko kanina, uh, if we look at forest and landscape restoration, we, we can have uh, a mixture of this. Uh, uh, um, monoculture uh, woodland, fuel wood plantations maybe, or, or a monoculture woodland um, timber plantation. Uh, as long as it's, uh, as long as one, it's uh, adaptable, uh, to the area and of course uh, there's market for the product eventually or there would be used by the community of that particular product but but looking at allelopathy of course uh, even even um, organic uh, is is uh, being uh, being um, mentioned as having uh, meron daw allelopathic effect uh, where, where they looking at uh, possibly gawa daw kasi nga na nagbabagsak din siya ng dahon niya every year no it's it's uh, decidu uh, deciduous a uh, species shedding its its leaves every uh, summer as a um, in response to um, water water uh, stress no um, but uh, of course uh, hindi pa siya physiologically established kung may allelo allelo uh, allelo chems ang uh, mahogany no um, so that i, I think uh, I, I could not answer very specifically kung may allelo chems yung yung uh, mahogany but uh, that has been that has been uh, one of those claims when when it comes to uh, monoculture na pwedeng may allelopathy but of course uh, we really have to do uh, very detailed study and uh, uh, it's it's just sad na hindi ito masyado na pagtutuunan particularly in the Philippines this is probably one of those research topics that would be very interesting to uh, look at uh, when it comes to uh, this this uh, restoration, reforestation works that we are doing. Ano yung, ano yung mga species na merong allelochems? Um, what's that other, may, may uh, question on physiology. May tinanong siya on physiology. I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Uh, hindi ko naisulat eh. Sorry. Yes, sir. So ang tanong niya po is kung may advantage to po yung monoculture plantation over a mixed uh, forest uh, plantation, in the context of physiological responses of forest trees? Uh, mixed and uh, uh, monoculture physiologically. Well, uh, of course, uh, we, we know very, very well, uh, well, ecophysiologically speaking, that a uh, tropical forest, a mixed forest, would uh, be very uh, stable ecophysiologically speaking. Uh, because for one, um, it's it's very uh, um, energy efficient, uh, meaning to say that uh, the um, the energy, the sun, uh, is is trapped at many levels. 
so that uh, in terms of their physiological adaptation, meron kang sun species and shade species growing side by side. Uh, you, you have the dominant trees, you have uh, other trees in the uh, lower stratum. And uh, of course, the, this combination uh, in a uh, mixed tropical forest uh, would, would have all the in perfect ingredients of a very efficient system. Samantalang yung, yung monoculture, of course, being uh, a uh, single, single crown, no? uh, lalo't clones yan, eh, di pantay-pantay yung -pantay crown niya. So may mga nasasayang na sunlight na hindi napapakinabangan. So uh, in terms of photosynthesis, nasasayang yon. Uh, kung sa totoo lang, kung merong, uh, if it's a biodiverse uh, ecosystem na merong mga uh, trees in the lower stratum that could uh, capture this, this light, eh, pakikinabangan pa sana. So um, ecophysiologically, very efficient ang, ang mixed uh, forest, lalo na yung copied from the primary forest. Pero yung monoculture, maraming nasasayang siyang uh, uh, energy and uh, yun nga yung kanina sa Alelo Chems uh, mukhang it's a field that needs to be studied. So thank you Carl for the question. Thank you sir and thank you uh, Sir Carl from FAO. So siguro last question na po ito uh, for our morning session so that we can have a little break before po tayo mag uh, proceed to our uh, second lecture. So sir last question is from Mark Mendoza from Orica, Singapore. So, sir, can you please cite daw po some native uh, uh, Philippine trees that are resistant to disease? Well, Mulave immediately and, and uh, Nara. But of course, uh, Nara, for example, has a uh, leaf spot. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, able to, uh, it's able to thrive uh, well. No? Uh, in, in Singapore, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. I don't know if Mark is a Filipino, but most likely with the name, uh, he could be a Filipino. Uh, uh, they have a lot of pterocarpus grown in Singapore, and uh, it's one of those uh, resistant. Um, but but again, you know, uh, when when you move when you move one species to another site, uh, yun yung, uh, that, that's the one that I was telling you in in the lecture. No, it, it's, it doesn't mean, for example, na it's native. Say, for example. Uh, a native species would be uh, Santos Temon Verdugonianum uh, or, or Mangkono. No? E, ilipat mo siya sa Mount Makiling, pwede naman siyang tumubo pero dapat ay sa lateritic soil siya. Pwede siyang katakihin ng uh, an another uh, pest or, or disease dahil uh, hindi naman siya talaga native sa Mount Makiling. So uh, actually, um, nagkakaroon, lamang, no? nagkakaroon lamang ng puwang sa pag-atake ang pest and disease if... Uh, the uh, introduced uh, species, or it could be foreign, no? uh, in fact, pwede natin sabihin foreign yung, yung mangkono pag dinala mo dito sa Mount Makiling kasi hindi naman siya talaga native sa Mount Makiling. At uh, merong insecto, and I'm sorry, I could not give you a specific example of an insect na pwedeng umatake sa mangkono, but I'm just giving you an, an extreme uh, example na uh, a native species nilipat lamang. No? So hindi, hindi ibig sabihin basta nat pag nilabel mo kasing native, eh, native na siya all the way through the Philippines. Uh, except of course, maybe uh, ang Nara natin. Nara is ubiquitous uh, uh, from, from uh, Batanes down to Tawi-Tawi. Uh, uh, meron tayong Nara. Uh, another ubiquitous species that uh, we see would be uh, this um, um, uh, Malapapaya. No? Uh, Polisius nodosa. Uh, I've seen it in many parts of the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, uh, but, but not in all types of forests. Ano? Uh, pero hindi ibig sabihin, nalimbawa, uh, for example, uh, there's that uh, um, Popeya cagayanensis, Narek. No? Narek is uh, endemic only to uh, Cagayan, no? um, uh, specific towns in Cagayan. Uh, um, I forgot the uh, place, but I think uh, somewhere near Claveria, no? Um, th those area, pero pag dinala mo siya, halimbawa, dinala mo siya sa, sa Butuan, dinala mo siya sa Surigao, sa Bislig, it would be, quote-unquote, uh, it's no longer uh, native to that uh, area and, and it could become vulnerable to a possible attack. So, hindi ibig sabihin na parang dahil pinag-uusapan lang natin Philippines, doon na siya native. 
uh, you have to determine ano ba talaga yung nativeness niya ano yung ano yung ecological range naman niya because that's where the the nativeness of that species would, would be uh, defined no but uh, we have a uh, wide range species with wide ecological amplitudes like nara and even mulave that could grow in many parts of the country although hindi sa lahat ng part ng hindi sa lahat ng types of forest uh, mulave would be growing because mulave would be very uh, adapted to uh, a limestone uh, type of forest no so hindi basta-basta tutubo siya sa sa mga very wet uh, tropical moist forest uh, although in in some uh, regions na there there are this dry very dry areas even in region 2 madami po siya no but not necessarily in all uh, areas no so uh, we have to define the nativeness in terms of its actual ecological uh, uh, range lama but um, nara and mulave would would be a very excellent examples or even ipil uh, dito meron sa mount makiling and in and many parts of the country even tindalo uh, or even the oh these are examples of our native tree species which grow if grown in their in their native habitats would exhibit very uh, resistant and resilient properties thank you thank you sir and thank you uh, to uh, the question from sir mark so with that uh, we would like to end our uh, question and answer portion so if you have questions for na nandito pa rin sa chat box namin don't worry we will um pass to uh, ipapas din po namin siya, siya kay Sir Ike. So later on, uh, pwede po namin kayo i-email with other questions so that we will have a little break before our... Yes, sir? May dalawang question na ako nakita dito. Sasagutin ko lang mabilis. Kung ah, gusto. sige po, sir. Okay. Uh, from Derek pa rin, ano? Uh, when do we decide whether if we burn, buried, or remove from the side the infected trees? What parameter should be the guide? for such decision. Well, actually, uh, yung burning, uh, ang mabilis kong sagot dyan is check if uh, uh, considering the uh, um, climate change uh, policy on, on uh, burning uh, would uh, be uh, implemented in your region kasi hindi ka pwede magsunog. Buried or remove, um, you have to know what would be the uh, life cycle, biological cycle of your insect. Pwede ka magtanong kay Ma'am Muchan ito mamaya. Dahil uh, uh, kasi pag binary mo lamang siya, uh, baka mag-proliferate pa rin siya. Pero uh, kaya nga kailangan maitanong ma ma mo specific na kung meron kang specific na uh, pest or disease, eh, doon mo lang ma malalaman mo yan kay Ma'am Mucha. Yung last, may nakita pa akong isang question, what do we apply? Mabilis lang to On the prune part of the trees to avoid entry of possible pests and diseases. Okay, uh, so ang assumption dyan, pwede kang mag-prune, kailangan mo mag-prune. Uh, mabilis na sagot, pwede mong lagyan ng coal tar or even uh, pintura. Uh, yun ang, yan ang pinakamabilis na mailalagay mo naman. Yeah, that's it. Yun lang ang nakita ko pang question dito sa chat box. So, so thank you. Nasagot na natin lahat. Ah, pa, sir. Thank you po sir with your time para po uh, ma-answer po yung ating mga question. So, Yun po, that ends our uh, lecture one for this uh, webinar. So thank you all, sir, for your time, for your informative uh, lecture, and also your time to answer the question. So we really hope na yung ating pong mga participants have gained a lot from this uh, lecture. And of course, we still have more to go sa ating pong uh, later session. Yun naman po is... Um, Ida deliver naman po ni Prop uh, Butia Manalo. So with that, um, a few reminders po before we have our short break. Um, ito pong Zoom, uh, you can stay with our Zoom meeting uh, here or you can leave pero you can join with the same meeting ID and password. Also, if you can join here, you can join with our Facebook Live na sa ERDG at uh, Facebook page po ito. And uh, for those who are asking if my attendance po tayo, we will do not have our attendance um, sheet uh, na naka-post uh, po dito. But later on, sa afternoon po, we will post a link, a post-test link. So that we can be assured na natapos nyo po yung webinar. So that uh, we will be able also to give you your certificate. Uh, with that po, uh, we will also post it po sa ating mo Facebook page. So that yung mga nasa Facebook naman po will have a access para po dun sa ating post-test. 
with that, thank you, Sir Ike, and thank you for our participants. Later on, um, if uh, Sir Ike will have time, mag-join pa rin po siya later in the afternoon para po sa ating closing. So with that, uh, thank you very much for joining this afternoon. See you again uh, later. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, nakalimutan po natin. Siguro pa, we will have this time pala to take uh, photos. Yan. Sorry, nakalimutan natin. Um, can you please open your cameras po? Ayan. So, we will just recognize some of our participants. No, So, we have our participants from the teaching staff of UPLB. Nakita ko din po kanina, meron from FDC, Parts Development. Um, Yan po. Tapos meron din po tayong center. Yeah, sorry. We also have from our Penrose and DNR Regional Offices from Kamtur, Masbate, Mindoro, City Hall, Sambuanga, Sibugay. Also, we have our SUC from Visaya State University, Central Mindanao University, um, and any other SUC. So thank you very much for joining and uh, we still have more to come later po in the afternoon. With that, please open po your cameras and ready to... Mumiti po ng matagal-tagal kasi medyo may karamihan po tayo ngayon. Okay. Open na po yung mga cameras. Page 1 po tayo. And ready and smile. 10, 9, 8. Smile lang. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, <laughs> and last page. Sorry, isa na lang. Isang last, last page na lang. Okay, so yun po. That ends our uh, first lecture for this webinar. Later on po, we will see each other again for our afternoon session. With that, thank you and uh, mag-lunch na po muna tayo. Virtual lunch. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Director Diaz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, sir. Hi. Hi. Hello. Bye. Bye. is a home to a number of rich, diverse, and natural ecosystems. Among the notable ecosystems in the Philippines are the Dipterocarp ecosystem of Mount Makiling, Pine Forest ecosystem in
Pwede kang mag-apply ng SSS kung gusto mo updated yung account natin. Ha? Pwede kang mag-apply ng SSS kung gusto mo updated yung account natin. Okay? So, ngayon, updated yung account natin. Kahit date tayo. No? Oo. Oo. Okay. Eh, ba't kasi sabi mo kanina? Kaya. Kaula rin ng... No. Gcash. Wala? Uy, meron! Ay, kasi naman, yung yun yun po, yung ano, sayang yun eh. Yung, yung akin nakapangalan sa akin. Ang pinipangalan ko? Nakapangalan na yun, ang si Mano. Mali yung magiging sa yung card. Hindi, sabihin pa, di ba sa kanya, pinagala sa kanya. Oo. Wala mo lang kasi. Eh, kasi nga, iba kayo.
The Philippines is a home to a number of rich, diverse, and natural ecosystems. Among the notable ecosystems in the Philippines are the Dipterocarp ecosystem of Mount Makiling, Pine Forest Ecosystem in Baguio City, Wetland Ecosystem of Olango Island in Cebu City, and Coral Reef Ecosystem in Oriental Mindoro. Our country owns a rich biodiversity which provides an array of ecosystem services that enable humans to survive. But with factors such as deforestation, pollution, overpopulation, and climate change, the future of our ecosystems may be at risk. So how can we protect our biodiversity, natural resources, and ecosystems? This is the role of Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau, or ERDB. On June 10, 1987, under the Executive Order 192, the former Forest Research Institute was reorganized into the Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau, or ERDB. ERDB is the principal research arm of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources that develops relevant and scientific research and development programs that address the nation's cross-cutting concerns on different major ecosystems, such as forest, upland farms, grassland and degraded areas, coastal zone and freshwater, and urban areas. With this, ERDB has come up with nine research and development programs to achieve the following goals. Sustaining forest ecosystems. Managing coastal and freshwater ecosystems dynamics. Promoting health of urban areas ecosystems. Addressing hazards in watersheds for water supply efficiency. Sustaining agroforestry and upland farming systems. Enhancing resilience of wetlands and coastal areas. Conserving and sustaining plantations and natural forests. Rehabilitating mined out and degraded areas through ERDB technologies. Reducing pollution in highly urbanized areas. In 2015, from its main headquarters in Los Baños, Laguna, ERDB has widened its reach all over the country to develop more innovative ecosystem technologies in its six areas of excellence in the fields of watershed and water resources, toxic and hazardous wastes, urban and biodiversity, coastal resources and ecotourism, agroforestry, forestry, and wetlands. ERDB's research and development efforts are now organized in CAR, NCR, Region 4A, Region 7, Region 11, and Region 13 through its Research, Development, and Extension Centers, or RDEX. RDEX formulate and implement applied and action-oriented ENR studies that enable the advancement of research, development, and extension work in ERDB specialized areas of excellence. Loyal to its mandate, the Bureau pursues to strike a balance between caring for the ecosystems and nurturing people's lives by developing propagation technology, plantation establishment, and harvesting techniques for bamboo, rattan, and mangrove. Specializing in seed technology and clonal propagation of high-quality dipterocarp seedlings and other indigenous forest trees. ERDB has invented the HiQ VAM1, an advanced biofertilizer used in DENR's nationwide reforestation programs. Through ERDB's Ridge to Reef research, the Bureau has developed relevant technologies for the rehabilitation of abandoned fish ponds and development of environment-friendly techniques to revive polluted waters, mined out areas, 
and other degraded ecosystems. Today, the Bureau also actively spearheads the study of DENR's carrying capacity programs and vulnerability assessments of watersheds, protected areas, and ecotourism areas all over the country. But the role of ERDB does not end with developing technologies and programs. To extend its services to its stakeholders, ERDB conducts various technology transfer and extension activities such as provisions of technical assistance, capacity enhancements, and field deployment activities. ERDB maintains state-of-the-art research facilities and demonstration areas aimed to provide the public with a better grasp and appreciation of ERDB's generated technologies. Through its educational materials, ERDB encourages the public's participation with its five-step strategic communication process, analyzing, strategic design, development and testing, implementation and monitoring, evaluation and replanning. As a research institution, ERDB strives to reinforce their communication strategies, to promote their goals and raise public awareness. To do this, the Bureau regularly releases information about their scientific breakthroughs and projects through technical journals, semi-technical research and development newsletters, manuals, and bulletins. These publicity and promotional efforts are also instrumental in expanding research-driven studies and technologies to match the client's growing needs. The Bureau continues to promote its public reach, local and international, by maintaining its presence online. At ERDB, researchers from various fields of science continuously work together to develop cutting-edge technologies and revolutionary programs that will help advance the country's understanding of our ecosystems and encourage people to help preserve them. ERDB Bridging Ecosystems and Science to People Can you imagine a world that's dark and gray? Lifeless, cold, and dry? Everything that you see around you is the byproduct of biodiversity. It breathes life to the world and splashes hues of greens and blues to our ecosystem. So, what makes biodiversity important? It keeps us all alive. It provides us water to drink, food to eat, oxygen to breathe, and clothes to wear. According to the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, the Philippines is one of 18 mega-biodiverse countries of the world, containing two-thirds of the Earth's biodiversity and between 70 and 80 percent of the world's plant and animal species. However, with the ever-changing environment and increasing global temperature brought about by climate change, some species of forest trees fail to cope with such changes, thereby affecting their ability to survive. But it's never too late. We can still protect our forests and preserve our natural resources. So, how do we make a difference to save biodiversity? Through genetic diversity. Genetic diversity refers to the variations observed in the tiniest detail, the genetic makeup of species. This might come too hard to understand at first, but don't worry. Genetic diversity is just how we are distinguished from each other. Just look at your fingers. Notice how no two people have exactly the same fingerprints? Even identical twins still have their own differences in spite of roughly the same appearances. Genetic diversity is important because it helps maintain a healthy population. It helps species to survive the negative impacts of climate change, making survival of the fittest ring true even more. With higher genetic variations, the more chances there are for forest tree species to survive and thrive in an ever-changing environment. You may ask, how does genetic diversity in forestry help humans? The answer is simple. Forests provide us with resources, making it possible for humans to survive. 
Genetic diversity helps in decreasing the vulnerability of forest tree species to pests and other natural threats that may cause a decrease in population or even extinction. What's more, genetic diversity information can also serve an important role in tree breeding and in the improvement of our local forestry programs. The Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau of DENR has already initiated genetic diversity studies of priority forest tree species in the Philippines. This might not come as a surprise, but documenting genetic diversity is easier said than done. There are processes needed to identify the genetic variations in a forest tree species. First, plant geneticists determine an individual's DNA characteristics through DNA analysis. To get this done, ERDB does the following. 1. Researchers collect leaf samples from different sources around the country. 2. The collected leaf samples will then undergo DNA analysis. 3. The researchers will then extract the DNA found in the leaf sample through the use of CTAB test and the help of molecular marker, RAPID. This process is called DNA isolation. 4. ERDB's Forest Molecular Biology Laboratory identifies genetic variations by using segments of the DNA sequence of individuals. These segments are called DNA-based molecular markers. By observing the different types or genetic polymorphisms of these markers, we can estimate the genetic diversity of the population. 5. Lastly, ERDB researchers observe the genetic variations among the individuals and analyze the data gathered. There are seven species that are included in the ongoing ERDB genetic diversity study. As of now, ERDB has assessed the genetic diversity of three species. The study showed the population holding the highest genetic diversity among the samples collected from different provinces in the Philippines. For Limuran, it is Bataan. For Nara, Ilocos. And for Kawayan,
Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome again sa ating second part ng ating webinar. So, yung ating pong webinar is titled Silvicultural Practices and Green Health Management. So, kanina pong morning, we had a very uh, informative lecture delivered by Dr. Indike El Tolentino. And uh, of course, you had your questions po as uh, to Dr. Galentino and we hope na nasagot po yung mga questions. No? So, also, um, we would also like to recognize our participants sa atin pong Facebook Live. So, very much welcome po uh, to everyone. So, yun. For this afternoon, we will still have very much uh, madami po tayong content that uh, we have prepared for you. So, uh, later po, uh, we will have Ma'am uh, Mutia Manalo to discuss yung kanya pong lecture. And also, we will have the time later para po sa mga... Uh, questions you and your concerns about his or about her topic but right now po this is also a big um, opportunity for us to launch our new uh, video ayan so we have a informational video that this is the first time po na ilalabas po namin yan. so this video po is about the forest based center so if you are not aware uh, ERDB has six forest based centers so ito pong mga forest seed centers na to caters yung mga seeds po from our SPAs and our ITP areas. So yung mga seeds nyo po uh, from your SPAs and ITP areas ay ipinapasa nyo po sa amin so that we can test them. We can have them um, test in uh, yung kan kanila pong uh, germination rate, yung kanila pong purity analysis. We also have our uh, moisture content test and other tests that are relevant for us to know about the seed. Actually po, um, it is not only available sa atin pong mga pensos or our uh, DNR regional, uh, sorry, DNR field offices. But if you have, kung you're from the LGU or you're from the SQC or you're just a, uh, kung kayo po ay isang private uh, institution or you're a student, we are very much happy to help you uh, para ma-analyze po natin yung, for example, you have uh, seed samples sa inyo po. So yun, uh, for this time, we will launch the, uh, this is the very first time that we will launch the video. So please uh, enjoy the video and if you will have questions about our forest seed centers, we will be happy again to uh, answer all your questions and concerns after this video. Thank you. Every forest that we see today plays a big role in our world. They are the world's lungs and give us everything we need to live. However, the increasing demand for more land, deforestation, and even the effects brought about by climate change have greatly decreased our forests. The good news is that we have ways to conserve and protect them. The Ecosystems Research and Development Bureau of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources has continuously developed and supported initiatives like the Forest Tree Seed Centers that ensure the quality of seeds primarily for the reforestation of our forests. With six seed centers around the Philippines, each one is designed to test, document, and store seeds to support the reforestation activities of DENR. The seed centers have the same facilities, utilize high quality materials, and apply standardized practices to ensure proper documentation, record keeping, tests, and distribution to all parts of the country. It might not sound as a surprise, but the job of the seed centers is not easy and usually involves different stages. The first one is seed collection. Field managers determine the purpose of their collection, identify the plant species for collection, and the quantity needed. The seed collectors identify the right time to collect the seeds. They also assess the plant's phenology or plant development, including the weather and area that influence their growth. The collection of seeds and fruits are based on the species of the tree, its size, and the site condition. One, they time their visit just when the fruits are about to fall. Two, they climb to the top of the trees, use poles or climbing equipment to collect from the crown. And three, they gather the fruits from trees and carefully pack them for transportation. Botanical specimens are also gathered to certify the source and identify the seeds. Seed collectors follow a strict documentation process and give each seed a tracking number. Samples are carefully cleaned and placed in breathable cotton bags to be transported back to the seed center. 
Step 2. Seed Processing Once the samples arrive at the seed center, they undergo six stages. The seeds and fruits are pre-cleaned to remove debris and examine their quality. Some fruits are depulped by soaking them in water until they are soft enough to be mashed without injuring the seed. They are cleaned again to remove all impurities. The seeds are naturally dried in the field when the weather is hot or inside the center's drying room for one to two days. The dried seeds are cleaned again with the process called winnowing. Lastly, seeds are brought to the laboratory to be registered with their own unique code called the seed lot number. Step 3. Seed Testing Seed technologists do this to check and provide information on the seed's health. Seed testers do a purity analysis by checking the purity of the working sample to identify the purity of the seeds. After that, they do a seed count to determine the actual number per kilogram based on the sample. Once the number of pure seeds is identified and counted, they test the sample's moisture content. Seed testers check the seed's health by placing them in petri dishes or trays and incubate them for more than five days to see if there is fungal and bacterial growth. They also check the seed's viability through germination testing for at least 30 days. They look for sprouted seeds that have firm white embryos and take note of the number that did not germinate and have abnormal growth. The last step is seed storage. It's a way to preserve seeds longer so they can be effectively used at the ideal planting time. Seed technologists carefully store the seeds in a cool, well-ventilated, dry, and dark place to avoid decay, pests, and diseases. Every forest tree seed center has a cold storage with a temperature of negative 20 degrees Celsius for seed storage. Protocol developments on seed germination are also done in the forest tree seed centers to know the best way to germinate the seeds. With the continued efforts of forest tree seed centers, we are significantly closer to preserving and reforesting our forest ecosystems here in the Philippines. ERDB, Innovating for Sustainable Ecosystems. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed our video. So we have questions for regarding our forest seeded centers. Or do you want uh, your samples, for example, meron po kayong seeds uh, sa inyo and you wanted it to be tested. So you can contact us and you can also contact our other uh, forest research centers. Katulad nga po lang sinabi. So on sa video, we have one in Baguio. We have also one in uh, here in Los Baños, one in Pagbilao, one in uh, Cebu, Minglanilla, Cebu, one in Davao, and one in Surigao uh, in this league. So I hope you enjoyed that video. So right now, we will proceed to our uh, second part of our lecture. I hope you are excited as much as we are because katulad kanina, uh, madami po tayong uh, nakuhang informative na uh, lessons and lectures to, from Sir uh, Ike Tolentino. And this time, we will have naman po uh, this time for our lecture too. So, Ngayon po, before our lecture uh, takes over our Zoom, uh, may we now present lang uh, para ma-introduce po natin yung ating speaker. Okay. So, ang ating pong uh, lecture for this afternoon, maybe uh, I, I know uh, marami po sa atin ay nakakilala sa kanya because most of us, ay naging uh, teacher po natin siya once na, yun, naging uh, college student po tayo. So, unang-una po, siya po ay uh, uh, Associate Professor 7 ng Department of Forest and Biological Sciences in uh, College of Forestry and Natural Resources sa UPLB here in uh, Los Baños. And next, please. Ayan, so... Here are the SAM undergraduate and graduate courses uh, that um, uh, our speaker, yan, yun po yung mga tinututo niya. We have forest uh, botany, forest pathology, forest products pathology, forest infect, uh, insect pest. We also have forest mycology, forest uh, research techniques in forest biology, elementary forest protection, phytopathological me uh, methods, control of forest diseases, and advanced forest mycology. Next slide, please. Ayan. So, uh, ang ating full speaker attended the uh, Seoul National University from 2002 
to 2005 for her uh, PhD degree in plant pathology. Also, as we all know, sa mga graduates and also students ng uh, CFNR, we all know that uh, our speaker is the college secretary ng ating po uh, kolehiyo from November 5, 2007 up until this year, no March 31. Next slide, please. And yeah, so she has contributed a lot po sa atin pong mga um, reading materials. Nag-co-authored po siya ng 49 pages syllabus on forestry diseases with Sir Ernesto Militante. And uh, one of her awards ay yung uh, plaque of appreciation given by the Museum of Natural History here in UPLB on the 30th of September 2020 having uh, served as the uh, Basilium Curator for mac uh, of Macro Punjay from 2015 to 2020. Next slide. Yeah, so she also received uh, an award as one of the UP Professional Chair Award in Forestry in Forest Pathology for Outstanding Teaching and Public Service in Eupilus Banyos from January 2019 to December 2021. Yeah. So, alam ko kilang kilala nyo na po siya. For our lecture two, we have our um, our very own Professor Matia Maria Q. Manalo. So, with that, uh, we will now proceed with our uh, lecture two. Ang ating pong lecture two will be about tea health management. So, reminders po ilet if you have questions uh, regarding po sa ating pong lecture. Uh, please take note of that. Uh, also, you can chat it in our chat box here in Zoom. Or if you are in Facebook Live, please comment it uh, down below the comment section. So we will uh, take care of that later and we will have our question and answer portion after the lecture. With that, we will start with our lecture and I hope that we will all enjoy uh, this lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to the ERDP webinar on tree health management. Good afternoon. Before I start with the lecture. Let me thank uh, ERDP through its director, Dr. Henry Adornado, and the staff of the ENGP PQPM for inviting me to this webinar and for coordinating the webinar. Okay, for today, I am tasked to discuss with you about tree health management. Uh, before I start with my lecture, uh, let me tell you that I will be focusing my lecture on three disease, three diseases. And I will not be tackling on uh, pests because this is not part of my specialization. Okay. So uh, let me start with uh, my lecture. Okay, so this is about tree health management. Okay, why is this uh, uh, topic very important? Okay, now as I have mentioned earlier, I will be focusing on occurrence of uh, three diseases each uh, diagnosis and control measures. Okay. So for the outline of my presentation, there will be a short introduction, a review of basic concepts in three diseases, uh, three disease indicators, and uh, the importance of diagnosing three diseases. And I will be discussing some of the important three diseases that have occurred in the Philippines. And lastly, we will be discussing about preventive and curative control of three diseases. Okay, why is the study of forest three diseases important? It's important because there are losses that occur when three diseases occur. First, there is reduction in the growth increment of trees. In one way or another, the growth of the trees will be adversely affected when there is disease. 
there will also be destruction of part and whole merchantable timber. Also, reduction in the quantity, quality, and value of forest products that we derive from trees and forest plants. And if you're dealing with reforestation, it will become costly due to additional expenses in controlling the diseases. Okay, while many of you uh, have been my students, let me briefly review basic concepts in three diseases. So what is disease? Okay, disease in plants, this is sustained physiological disorder due to constant irritation by persistent causal agents, resulting in abnormalities and physiological disturbances on the trees. And if we compare this with injury, injury refers to the damage done on the trees caused by physical or chemical agents and including um, animals and people, okay? Because sometimes we tend to injure some parts of the tree. In injury, the causal agent is non-persistent and the irritation is not continuous. However, let me um, tell you that injury may predispose the occurrence of disease in trees, especially if the injury is big okay so depending on the the amount of injury that a tree may have okay? because this will surely affect the natural immunity of the tree okay so let us um, discuss the interacting components of biotic diseases there are actually three components of uh, biotic disease biotic disease is caused by pathogens, the living causal agents of disease. So here in the disease triangle, we have the host plant, also known as the susep, okay? the pathogen, which is the biotic causal agents, and the environment, whether it's natural or artificial. As you know, there are uh, arrows there, okay? And this means that there is always interaction among these three components in order to achieve the um, production of biotic disease. Okay. Now, comparing with, with abiotic disease, okay, abiotic disease is due to unfavorable environment and usually due to fisiopaths, which are the abiotic agents of diseases. Okay, now the, and the understanding of the interrelationships among the host trees, the causal agents, and the environment is very important for the proper diagnosis and control of tree diseases. That's why we have to study the host or the susceptible the causal agents and the factors related to the environment, which in turn will affect both the SUSEP and the causal agents. In the case of the uh, SUSEP or the host trees, okay, the ability of the host trees to react against the pathogens will depend on its susceptibility. The more susceptible, the host trees are, then the greater is the chance that it will get disease. However, if the host trees are resistant, then there will be a minimal damage on the tree. Okay. Now, in this case, okay, um, susceptibility is affected by both the genetic makeup of the trees and also the environment where the host trees are planted. For the pathogens, which are the living causal agents of disease, the ability of the pathogens to cause disease is known as virulence. So the more virulent the pathogen is, then the higher is its capacity to inflict 
diseases on its host trees. Okay. Again, virulence is affected by the genetic makeup of the causal agent, the pathogen, and also the environment. So there are really genes for being uh, susceptible in case of susceptible or resistant or even immune for the host trees. And there are also genes for being virulent or avirulent for the pathogen. Okay, in the natural forest, okay, as mentioned uh, this morning by Dr. Tolentino Jr., where there is high plant diversity, only the weak and the suppressed trees become disease. As this is nature's way of eliminating the inferior trees, leaving behind good quality trees. So we do not worry much about trees on trees that are planted in the natural forest. Ika nga, survival of the fittest. However, with the advent of the um, plantation forest, so because this is more economical, where monoculture is practiced, there is a greater threat of disease occurrence. And in some cases, epipytotics or disease outbreaks have emerged. Just like now we have this pandemic, this is epidemic. Okay, actually epipytotic is epidemic in plants. Okay, what are the causal agents of three diseases? Okay. As I have mentioned, the pathogens, these are the biotic causal agents, and hence, because they are living, they can be transferred from one host plant to another. Example of uh, pathogens are fungi, which are the most common among the pathogens in terms of uh, infecting uh, trees. We also have bacteria, nematodes, and parasitic seed plants like mistletoes. For another, the other um, group of causal agents, these are the pisopats. These are the abiotic agents. Hence, they are not transferable, but they may cause uh, um, large amount and greater amount of damage if it is due to excess in moisture, deficiency in mineral nutrients that may happen in a large area. Okay. However, this is non-transferable. We will be focusing more on biotic diseases in this lecture. Okay, when disease occurs, there are indicators that will tell us whether the disease is present or not in the trees. So these are actually um, symptoms and signs. Okay, so what are these symptoms? Symptoms of the disease are actually visible manifestations of disease in the tree. Okay, and this is as a result of the infection by the causal agents. Now the symptoms may be actually be morphological. This means that these are um, seen and we can use our senses in order to um, be able to recognize the presence of symptoms. But if you would like to know and see the histological symptoms, these are the, the manifestations of disease when you look at the cells and tissues, meaning that you have to look the cells and tissues of infected plant parts under the microscope. Both morphological and histological symptoms are actually symptoms by themselves. Morphological symptoms, because these are uh, likely to be recognized uh, easier. So necrotic symptoms are due to destruction or killing of cells and tissues. Okay. Atropic symptoms are due to the decrease in cell division and will lead to growth inhibition and suppression. Suppression in terms of um, 
production of certain substances or pigments or su suppression in the uh, growth of other plant parts. Hypertropic symptoms are exactly the opposite of atropic symptoms. Hypertropic symptoms are due to increase in cell division. And there, in this case, there will be growth stimulation and overproduction of substances, um, substances normally produced by plants like pigments and hormones. Whereas you compare another three disease indicator, these are signs, these are actually the vegetative and reproductive structures that are evidences of pathogen on the disease tree. So when disease is caused by pathogens, okay, then the pathogen may produce structures that will become evidences that the pathogen is present on the tree. Example, for fungi, these are the fungal mycelia. Okay, these are the, the thread-like um, cottony structures vegetative structures of fungi, also rhizomorphs. Rhizomorphs are root-like mycelia, which are characteristics of most decay fungi. Okay, these are used to obtain nourishment from the host trees. Spores and fruiting bodies are reproductive structures of fungi. We usually see fruiting bodies, especially for decay uh, fungi. Now, the fruiting bodies will contain spores. Okay, spores and fruiting bodies may be asexual or sexual. The common sporocarps, the common uh, fruiting bodies that we see around infecting uh, uh, trees, decayed trees, are sexual fruiting bodies of fungi. Okay, here are some um, examples of necrotic symptoms. We are uh, very much familiar with the occurrence of lip spots there on the, uh, the top left uh, photo. Those are um, lip spots in Nara, okay, Nara leaflets. Okay, lip spots are discolored uh, lesions on the, on the leaves. Okay, usually the color is brown and uh, a group of spots will comprise anthracnose. So when, when spots grow, okay, since uh, in this case, we are sure that the spot is due to, to biotic agents, due to pathogen, due to fungus, okay, because you will see the black fruiting bodies on the, on the leaves. Okay? So the black fruiting bodies contain the spores okay, of the causal fungus. Okay, so in the leaflets of Nara, both leaf spots and anthracnose are present. Later on, when anthracnose becomes, uh, um, when, when, anthra when anthracnose um, goes on, so as time goes by, then the whole leaflet may become um, necrotic and we call now that as blight, as evidenced by the, the pine needle blight at the lower um, picture. So this means that in the case of blight, the whole leaflets or the whole leaf or the whole needle becomes necrotic. Okay. And on the upper right hand picture, I'm showing you a special type of spot uh, that has uh, affected Nara leaves. Okay, and this is the um, actually black ray disease. And this is, take note of the big spot on the leaves of, uh, leaflets of Nara and characterized by the appearance of uh, ray-like fruiting bodies of the causal uh, fungi. And that's why the, the name for the, for the disease is black ray disease, which is caused by Aldona Estella nigra. In the case of lip spot and anthracnose and blight, these are caused by a fungi like Pestalocia, uh, Coletotricum, and Lasio diploja. Also for the pine, Cercospora is a fungal genus that may cause 
blight of pines. In the lower picture, right picture, okay, uh, that is scorch on the uh, leaves. Okay, scorch is um, symptom due to abiotic agents, due to pishopat. So uh, both blight and scorch are due to death of foliates, but in the case of blight, blight is caused by pathogens, whereas scorch is due to pishopat like high light intensity or high temperature. You will know that this is scorch if the leaves, okay, uh, they tend to become brittle. Okay, when you when you um, get hold of um, a leaf with uh, scorch, then it will be uh, very brittle, such that the the leaves will will be uh, very fine afterwards. Okay, now examples of atropic symptoms we have here: rosetting. As we know, atropic symptoms are due to uh, reduction in cell division. And in this case, in rosetting, that is due to the reduction in the um, length of the internodes. Okay. So in the case of uh, rosetting of bamboo, okay, the crowding of foliage of bamboo to, due to the shortening of the internodes. Okay. On, on the right, we have a picture of papaya with chlorosis. Chlorosis is an um, example of atropic symptom uh, since chlorosis is due to partial suppression of chlorophyll. Now, if it is suppression, there is a chance that the leaves will become uh, green again if the suppression is no longer present. For instance, chlorosis is usually due to uh, lack of uh, mineral nutrients, especially lack of nitrogen in the soil. So if you apply fertilizer, example biofertilizers, which will provide the plant with uh, enough nutrients needed, then chlorosis may be uh, gone. Okay, so chlorosis is just partial suppression. Okay, in the case of hypertropic symptoms, so these are produced due to um, the uh, increase, rather, increase in cell multiplication or cell division, such that there are some overgrowths on the plant parts, okay, like uh, swellings on the leaves, um, as evidenced by the galls, okay, on the leaves, okay, and also stem galls. So the picture on the on the right, upper right. It's actually gulls of uh, falcata, falcata seedlings outplanted in the field and uh, infected by gall rust disease caused by Euromycladium teperianum. So take note that the gulls are, are swelled parts. So this means that there is overgrowth on that part of the stem. So there will be more cells there. Okay, now callus, on the other hand, is um, new tissue growing over the wound or injury or decayed part of the tree. And uh, this is actually a defense mechanism of the tree against uh, the occurrence of decay. So when decay occurs, so decay, by the way, uh, which is on the, okay, the inner portion, is a decayed stem. Okay? Decay is necrotic because when decay occurs, there is disintegration of the wood. Now, when decay is present in a tree, the tree reacts by way of producing more cells, trying to, to heal, trying to heal the decayed part. Okay, so in this way, there will be more cells that the tree will produce more cells in an attempt to cover the decayed part. Hence, callus is a hypertrophic symptom. Now, callus actually, okay, uh, depending on the rate by which callus is formed, um, if there is a small amount of decay only and callus formation is... Um, 
is um, faster than the rate of decay, then it's possible that the callus formed on the affected uh, plant part will become, will heal, will heal actually the decay on the plant. Okay, some of the signs okay, that you may encounter, especially for those who are in the field, are the production of uh, mycelia. Uh, these are the uh, vegetative structures of fungi. Uh, actually, mycelia are, are formed by group of hyphae, hyphae being filamentous strands of fungi, but the hyphae are not visible by the naked eye. We can only see hyphae, individual hypha under the microscope, but when they are together, they will form mycelia and these are now visible, visible vegetative structures. And then later on, okay, the mycelia may form fruiting bodies. So depending on the, the type of fungus that's, that has infected the tree. So in this lower uh, picture, you see um, several fruiting bodies of uh, Ganoderma. Okay, Ganoderma is um, a common uh, decay fungus. Although Ganoderma is, medically speaking, Ganoderma is used as medicine because Ganoderma is rich in tri antioxidants. So if you take hold of Ganoderma in Korea, Japan, and China, the Ganoderma fruiting bodies are being sold in the market and, be, and they boil, they boil the fruiting bodies and they drink because they say that the extract from Ganoderma is good for the body. In fact, we know that there is a brand of, uh, of um, coffee that has in it Ganoderma extra. Okay, so that's a way we can control decay, collection of fruiting bodies. And in this case, we may use the, it for its medicinal value. Okay, now, when we know about the three disease indicators, okay, we have to diagnose three diseases. Okay, now correct disease diagnosis will require us to gather information. Okay, unless you are an expert already in terms of uh, identifying the disease, Okay. If you are not yet expert, then you have to make um, research on the history of the disease occurrence. Okay, so if you see um, disease in the field, okay, then you have to take photographs. You have to get all the necessary information from the one in charge of the plantation. For instance, the date that the disease first occurred, Okay, the exact location of the disease occurrence. Of course, you have to know the, the host plant. Okay, so you have to know. And if possible, the, um, the origin, the origin of the planting stock, where they're from seeds, where the seeds uh, from, from uh, stands that have been um, stands like in the case of the the GNR, you have some uh, production strand, stands where you collect uh, good seeds, okay? So you have to know the, the history of uh, the, the sources of planting stock because this will help you a lot in evaluating uh, the disease, okay? Then you have to see also the prevailing uh, growing conditions in the area. So you have to, to see the site, okay? So what is the possible cause of disease occurrence? And of course, knowledge on the symptoms and signs and causal agents of the disease will be very important. Okay. Uh, if you are uh, in the field, assigned in the field, then you will be, um, you will have enough knowledge on this. Um, when you are in charge of uh, plantations, you have to uh, see to it that you visit 
the plantation um, so that you will see the conditions of the trees there. Okay, it's just like uh, we are we are caring. So we care for for trees. We should care for those trees because any abnormality, okay, has something to do with maybe the occurrence of disease. Because when disease occurs, disease is always abnormal. So you have to know first where the, um, there is abnormality on the plant. Okay. And then it is also physiological in nature. So uh, this means that when this is occurs, there will be changes in the normal functioning of the plant or the tree. When the disease occurs on the leaves, for sure the photosynthesis, photosynthetic rate, and the amount of transpiration will be adversely affected. And when there is disease, as I have mentioned um, in the introduction, uh, it's caused by persistent causal agents with continuous irritation. And so when, uh, especially for biotic diseases, the irritation is continuous. Okay. And so this, this disease is processive in nature. It takes a while. So that means that you have time, you have time to really look into the, the causes of diseases. Now, proper control of uh, three diseases will depend on accurate diagnosis. Okay, because just like human diseases, we go to the doctor. If you, if you feel something that is not uh, normal to you, okay, you feel something abnormal, and then you will think, maybe I am sick. Okay? Then you go to the doctor. Then the doctor will diagnose you. The same is true. Okay? Because before we apply control measures, we should be sure that we have accurate, accurately diagnosed diseases. Okay. It's important for diagnosis to be um, accurate because we do not want to apply control measures that is not suited for the trees. Okay, so we will be, I will be uh, showing you some of the uh, common tree diseases that we have in the Philippines. These are very common in our forest, whether uh, in the natural forest or in plantation. So decay is one, very normal for actually here. Um, don't worry if uh, decay occurs in the branches. So there will be no problem. It's easier to control this. However, okay, if the decay occurs in the roots, since we know that the roots of uh, trees are used by the trees to um, get water and nutrients from the soil, if the roots are infected, depending on the, on the extent of damage, this may actually kill right away the tree. So um, necrosis on the roots may also lead to the occurrence of basal rot. As shown here, the basal rot, this is on Panglumboyen, okay? Um, uh, member of Myrtaceae. This is caused by Ganoderma lucidum. Take note of the presence of uh, several fruiting bodies. Although because it's in the um, base and I'm, I'm sure that the root system is not all the, the roots are, are affected. That's why it's still uh, living. Uh, it may take years before the tree gets killed, but we can do something about this. Okay, so we also have uh, so basal rot, a center rot. Okay, for center rot, um, the inner portion of the stem is affected. This is the, the heart rot. Okay. And so these are non-living portions and may not directly affect the, the physiological processes okay, in the subwood. However, later on, because we know that the biotic diseases 
continues on and may may lead to to other may may, may cause other damages then it is important that we apply control measures right away now um in the case of um mangium fire tree have been affected by a kind of uh, brown root rot i'm i'm discussing this because mangium root rot um, became epiphytotic or meaning um, there was disease outbreak of uh, mangium um, trees in the Philippines. Also, mangium root rot disease occurred in Southeast Asia, especially in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, this mangium root rot was caused by Felinus noxious. Okay, Felinus noxious is a uh, fungus belonging to Basidio mycota, which uh, produces brown uh, fruiting bodies. Felinus noxious is also uh, is synony synonymous to Fomes noxious. Okay, take note of the, the fruiting bodies on the, on the main stem right here. Now in, in, the, in the crown, because the xylem will be affected, there will be wilting, uh, wilting of the leaves, wilting of the shoots, followed by yellowing of the leaves and defoliation. So during the advanced states of uh, root rot, then there could be a thinning of the crown. Okay. Now, uh, in this case, the felinus noxious causes type of, uh, of uh, white rot decay or white uh, white rot meaning that uh, <laughs> although the color of the body of the linus is brown but the affected color becomes um, lighter in color and you can see the presence of some zone lines on the visual indication of uh, the occurrence of white rot. Now Philinus noxious in the Philippines occurred sometime in 1989 okay, to about 1992 in epidemic proportion, epipytotic. But um, luckily, this has been controlled. Why is it that felinus uh, occurred in epipytotic proportion? Okay. okay, I have discussed this with you, the, the symptoms, wilting and yellowing, defoliation and killing of the trees. Okay, now this is uh, the disease cycle of Felinus noxious, the brown root rot on susceptible trees. Now there are many susceptible trees. Uh, for one, mangium, acacia mangium, which is uh, widely distributed in the Philippines. Also, fire tree, Delonyx regia has been susceptible also to felinus noxious. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Forester Jolima Rodriguez for um, giving me these uh, pictures, the previous picture and this one. Okay, this is um, the root rot disease cycle. Take note of the, the uh, present uh, at the center. Okay, there was one... Um, one tree that has been infected by brown root rot, okay, due to felinus noxious. Then the adjacent trees later on will become decayed also due to the um, connection between roots of adjacent trees. So if you are not keen observant, and if you just let the, the trees in the plantation to rot, or get decay, then this will probably cause more infection on healthy trees. So the healthy ones nearby the the center, the the, the, the killed tree at the center, okay, you can see the brown, the brown um, roots, meaning that the brown roots are already infected by feline noxious. And uh, okay, once once you you transplant this 
Okay, even if you if you get something, if you get say seeds from from uh, deceased trees, okay, if you do not know, because sometimes uh, the crown may not show visible symptoms, then you will get um, um, seeds that are not of good quality. Now, originally, the brown root rot, uh, especially in the Philippines, occurred in, uh, in Agusan, the Sur, and also in, in Mindoro Oriental. Uh, in the case of uh, root rot amangium, the plantations were established on, on lagged over areas. And um, maybe there was no information that the, the lugs there were infected by decay fungi. So the stumps, the problem with us is that the stumps are left in the forest. We do not have the means to remove the stumps. So once the stumps, after lugging, once the stumps are removed, so uh, for example, like dipterocarp in the dipterocarp forest, uh, before we were allowed to cut uh, dipterocarp uh, trees. Okay, so the stumps remain, and okay, later on, the stumps will get decayed. Okay, so fruiting bodies, the basidiocarps, or the fruiting bodies of the basidiomyces may grow and will release the basidiospores. So the basidiospores are released, and once there are um, young, seedlings planted near the stump, then later on, the roots of these um, trees will get entangled with the root, even the killed roots of the stump. And the disease will be transferred to the healthy seedlings or saplings. Then later on, as the trees grow, then this will be the, um, the picture that we will get. Now, uh, here, uh, I'm sure that if you encounter this, then you have to do a ways by which you will be able to control the occurrence of this. I will discuss, I will discuss later how we can do something about this problem on um, felinus noxious um, root rot disease. Okay, another uh, disease, a very important disease that occurred in the Philippines in epipytotic proportion was the canker or pink disease of Falcata, Paraceriantis falcataria, and also uh, have also infected some eucalyptus species in Surigao del Sur in Mindanao. Uh, this was way back in 1977 for those who are uh, from Mindanao. When Peacock was still around, there were plenty of uh, falcata trees around uh, Peacock area. Even farmers um, had their tree farming planted to Paraceriantes falcataria because falcata was very in demand at the time, uh, being a very good source of uh, pulp. Okay. And also nowadays, even now, um, the the stem of falcata is being used as pole. Okay, at the time, okay, when canker occurred, okay, uh, this uh, canker or pink disease, it's called pink disease because the color of the fruiting body is pinkish. Okay, so the, the trees have these uh, symptoms. There were cracks on the bark of the stem and branches due to production of lesions on the falcata. By the way, falcata was an introduced species, same with mangium. Okay, so the use of, uh, of the native or endemic species is better than exotic ones. So here in Kanker, the main stem, later on branches are infected. And because the xylem of the stem is infected, then there will be a wilting of the leaves on the upper crown because of the lack of water and photosynthesis will be adversely affected. Then there will also be yellowing of the leaves. Okay. Then 
there could be formation of multiple branches or epicormic branches below the infection point. So the epicormic branches are growing below in an attempt to, to have a, a new um, healthy shoots. So the tree reacts to infection by the causal fungus by producing new branches. Okay, see, these are uh, pictures of uh, falcata affected by cortisone salmonicolor. Uh, these are cortisone of uh, Forrester Cecilia Marquez. Okay, uh, the different uh, stages in the development of cortisone salmonicolor. Cortisone is also a member of the Basidiomycota uh, fungus, uh, which forms uh, resupinate fruiting body uh, here, the pink incrustation here, pinkish, a uh, whitish to pinkish fruiting body that is resupinate on the on the main uh, trunk. Uh, resupinate means that the fruiting body is the whole fruiting body is attached closely, oppressed or attached to its host. Uh, unlike in the case of Ganoderma, where only a portion of its fruiting body is attached to the host, for Cortisium salmonicolor, the whole fruiting body is attached. Okay. Now, um, canker of uh, Palcata, okay, in canker of Palcata, that usually the first stage is the cobweb, cobweb stage, sorry for the wrong spelling of cobweb. So here, um, the hyphae of uh, cortisium salmonicolor, okay, envelops the, the whole uh, branches or the whole stem, okay. Then this will be followed by the pustule states where there will be small brown pustules on the bark here, usually starting with the cracks on the bark brought about by infection by cortisium salmonicolor. Later on, fruiting bodies, uh, pink fruiting bodies of cortisium, cortisium will be formed. And later on, there will also be formation of, uh, of some asexual spores because the pink uh, incrustation states, okay, this is sexual, but in the negator states, this is asexual. So there could be some conidia also here. Now, as I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, okay, um, there will be wilting, yellowing of the leaves, defoliation of the leaves will follow. And later on, if there will be multiple infection brought about by different uh, um, different parts of the tree infected with cartesium salmonicolor, then death of the tree will follow. So it has come to a point where canker became in epipytotic proportion. But luckily nowadays, uh, some of my former students from Mindanao said that although this is still occurring in Mindanao, it's no longer in uh, epipytotic uh, proportion. Okay, another disease of Falcata. So Falcata is a uh, favorite of, uh, of uh, disease causing agents, although even if it's a favorite um, tree species planted, it has been uh, the object of, uh, of uh, epipytotic uh, diseases, okay. Palcata, by the way, has been introduced in the Philippines and as history shows, Palcata has only but very narrow genetic makeup, meaning that there were very few provenances where the, the um, seeds of Palcata came from. So this means that being introduced species, exotic species, and coming from uh, very narrow, uh, very few provenances, there is narrow genetic makeup of uh, Falcata. Hence, this is very prone to uh, disease occurrence. Unfortunately, because of its um, very fast growth and uh, uh, economically speaking, the planting of Falcata is uh, very, 
well uh, appreciated by especially by farmers because of its uh, very uh, fast growth and in few years they can already get get the uh, monetary returns by planting pangkata so it's still uh, there is continuation in the planting of pangkata another disease occurred this time okay this was about in the 1990s also a galras disease uh, characterized by fasciation and uh, swellings of infected shoots. Uh, by the way, galras gal uh, has occurred not only on big trees, but also in seedlings. In fact, um, this disease was discovered in a certain uh, nursery in Impalutao, Bukidnon, okay, where they saw the seedlings having this Gull, uh, gulls, and they did not know that the there was a big uh, palcata tree, okay, above the, where the branches, the crown, uh, is above the nursery, and the the spores, okay, of the spores of the rust fungus were carried by wind, and so even the seedlings got infected. So fasciation uh, is characterized by uh, deformation of the shoots uh, brought about by broadening of the cylindrical uh, part of the shoot. So there will be swellings. As fasciation is similar to uh, if you see tamarind fruit. Okay, so yung young shoots of falcata looks like will look like uh, tamarind fruit uh, being brown and uh, there will be swelling. I will show you uh, in the next slide how fasciation looks like. Then there will be galls on the stem and branches that will turn brown due to the rusty colored uh, spores of the pathogen. So the, the spores are so numerous and as I said, uh, this is being carried by wind. Um, during infection, okay, there's the process called inoculation where the inoculum or the part of the pathogen that can cause this is like spores, okay, mycelia, okay, is transferred from the, the um, oh, nurse. I, sorry, from yeah. the disease, uh, tree or any of the uh, maybe contaminated soil or the inoculum is carried from its source to the part of a healthy plant where disease will finally develop. This could be carried away by wind, by, by wind, by splash of rain, or also by biotic uh, agents like uh, insects. So insects may, may become vector of uh, transferring or transmission of inocula. Even people, we can become also agents of uh, inoculum transmission if we carry if we carry uh, diseased plants from one place to another. So we should refrain from doing that. Okay. So here we have uh, falcata that has this galras disease and. Uh, Another symptom of galras is formation of multiple branches because this is the way for the falcata to, to survive. So it has to produce more branches. But later on, these uh, multiple branches will be infected if not controlled, if not controlled right away. Then there will be stunted growth because the, the photosynthetic rate will be uh, decreased. And then mortality of the trees due to repeated infection. In fact, there will be a case where um, the trees will no longer have leaves because of the of uh, the the leaves uh, with abscission or defoliation. And then what will only remain on the tree will be the numerous uh, galls on the stems. Okay, so these are pictures courtesy of uh, Forrester Marquez. Galras uh, in Falcata caused by the uh, rust fungus Euromycladium teperianum. So the picture here uh, shows 
the fascination. So take note of the the young shoots of uh, falcata being turned to tamarind like structures. So yun yung fascination. And then you you can see the gulls here on the branches, the young twigs, and also in the main branch. Now these gulls, when they are uh, when the when the Euromycladium is is very active, the gulls will be uh, surrounded will be surrounded with the numerous spores, the golden colored spores of Euromycladium teperianum, which can be um, carried away by wind and by rain. So it's so easy to disperse the inocula for Euromycladium teperianum. Okay. Now, uh, how do we control occurrence of diseases? As I have mentioned in the first part of my lecture, actually disease, the occurrence of disease, this is uh, um, usually inevitable. All will, all uh, diseases are prone, uh, all trees rather are prone to diseases. But of course, depending on, depending on the, on the tree, there are the resistant ones, okay? There are the, these um, trees that are immune, they will, they will not get disease. So only the susceptible ones will become disease. It's just like uh, a human diseases. So that's why when you, when you know something about uh, disease development in class, you can apply it uh, in your own self. Okay, how do you, how do you control occurrence of sickness in yourself? Okay, now there are two types of uh, control measures that we apply on disease uh, trees. Okay. So these are the preventive control, uh, as the name implies, it's applied when the disease is not yet occurring, and the curative control, which is done in order to inactivate, destroy, or kill the pathogen that has caused diseases of trees. Now, this is done in order to minimize losses. Of course, we would like to have this preventive control. Kung possible nga lang na we can really do uh, this preventive control measures, there will be no problem of diseases. But of course, it's not always possible. So what are the uh, preventive control measures? I have summarized them because most of our, of our uh, the, the diseases of our trees will, will have common preventive control measures. For instance, when you are planning to, to have um, to establish plantations, then you should be able to select good planting uh, site. Okay. Now the planting site should have good soil okay, with good uh, drainage. This is important because a moisture okay, is needed by the pathogen. So if the, if the site is, is uh, not well drained, then the pathogen may um, infect the trees planted there, especially in the case of uh, root rot, in the case of rot fungi. Now you should use resistant and disease-free planting stock. So I know in ERDB you have the uh, seed center. Okay, so you should only be getting uh, superior uh, seeds, seeds that are free from diseases. As the saying goes, kung ano ang Puno siyang bunga. So kung anong pinagsimula natin, when we start from seeds, be sure that the seeds that we are using is from superior mother trees, free from diseases. Then we should follow the recommended spacing for the tree species. Uh, the silviculturists will know this. Then maintain sanitation in the area. Most of the, the inocula for our pathogens they are just hoarding there on the liters that are, that are in the forest floor. Also, if there are decayed branches, 
Uh, they, the inocula of the decay fungi will be there. So you have to get rid of them before they start another uh, infection. Keep trees are as healthy as possible. So if our trees are healthy, they will not be subjected to uh, disease infection. Para rin sa tao, kapag healthy tayo, we, have, we are very strong, we have a strong immune system, so hindi tayo magkakaroon ng sakit. Avoid wounding of roots, stem, and branches, especially for decay. Decay fungi, members of the Basidia mycota, are usually wound parasites. They enter through wounds. So any, any wound that we inflict on the, on the root system and branches may pave the way for the occurrence of uh, decay. Um, also, animals may cause this wounding. So ito yung mga injuries na sinasabi ko na uh, may predispose the occurrence of disease like decay. We have to apply fertilizers. I do not, I do not uh, endorse the use of chemical fertilizers. I'm more on the use of uh, biofertilizers that like the ones that were produced in biotech by initially started by Dr. Reynaldo de la Cruz of FBS FNR. And uh, also now it's, uh, Dr. Nelly Agangan of Biotech and Dr. Um, Joy Sarate, okay, who are uh, continuing the works of Dr. Ray de la Cruz in the production of MycoGrow, MycoBam1, and MycoBam2. These are mycorrhizal fungi. MycoGrow being ectomycorrhiza, and MycoBam1 and MycoBam2 are endomycorrhiza. And also in ERDB, Dr. Evangeline Castillo, who was an, the advisee of Dr. Ray de la Cruz, was also able to um, patent the HiQ-BAM1, okay, that is now being used in um, the NGP um, projects of DNR. Uh, these are biofertilizers also, um, endomycorrhiza. Uh, this is used to increase resistance of uh, the, the um, trees, the seedlings and trees against disease-causing pathogens. So the inoculants that we use, okay, even for seeds, just by coating the seeds, okay, this will last long. So when we use seeds coated with the, with the mycorrhizal inoculants, even if you transplant the seedlings in the field, Nandun pa rin ang ating mga mycorrhiza. In fact, endomycorrhiza, they say, um, majority of the plants will have this association. Now, for curative, kung hindi natin kayang ma-prevent, then if there is already the disease, then we should apply right away curative control measures. So if you see infected branches, you have to prune right away. So dapat talaga tayo ay laging, laging mapagmatsyag, mapagmasid. So para kang may alaga, may alaga kang uh, mga, mga kung halimbawa, animals, laging mong tinitingnan. Ganun din sa halaman. If you see something, prune right away and dispose properly. In fact, we can use that as... Um, biodegradable materials for composting. Just make sure that the composting bin or the composting area will be far from the uh, trees. Practice pathological rotation, what is this? Uh, this is uh, harvesting of the, the tree or cutting the tree, of course, with proper permit from DNR, cutting the tree that is already starting to have disease in order for us to be able to use the remaining healthy part of the tree. Kaysa naman sa mapabayaan na mag, uh, um, mamatay na lang. Ha? We, can, we can make use of the remaining healthy uh, part of the tree. Then if you see fruiting bodies, you have to remove them, at least even if we know that the removal of fruiting bodies will not actually uh, remove all the inocula, at least you have decreased the inocula of the decay fungi. So remove fruiting bodies, 
especially during rainy season where the fungal fruiting bodies are so prevalent. Kasi nga, they, the fungi you need lots of moisture. So when you remove fruiting bodies, be sure that you dispose them properly. Do not just leave them there. Kasi nga, pwede silang maging, ano na naman, maging uh, uh, source ng inoculum. Then, ayun, ito ang sinasabi ko, like in Rutra Tamangyo, once you see some infected trees, you have to trench or dig a canal around the infected trees in order to minimize the spread of root rot through root grafts. So yun nga yung nag-entangle nag, e yung mga roots ng, ng uh, infected, uh, infected trees with those of the healthy ones. So kung na-trends around, then you actually lessen the chance of, of uh, transfer of the um, fungus causing decay. Then, ito, I think ito, when I was invited to have this seminar, they say, Ma'am, please, uh, please highlight also the conduct of tree surgery. Now, tree surgery is um, uh, curative control that is done to, to remove infection on the tree. Of course, with proper evaluation. You have to evaluate the tree to be, um, to, to, have undergo this tree surgery. You do not conduct tree surgery on all trees. You only conduct this on high value trees because it's expensive, okay? And it's not, it's not the wise that we conduct this every now and then. So PPLE in Aten, we have to evaluate. Uh, you evaluate the extent of damage, whether the, uh, the part that is decayed is, is still okay for tree surgery. Otherwise, baka naman magkanda ka ng tree surgery and then later on mamatay din. No? So, ano ba yung ginagawa natin during tree surgery? Okay. So, it's just like uh, us going to the dentist with uh, our, our tooth, with our uh, tooth with decay. So, yung decayed tooth, ganun din. The, the dentist will will evaluate how pwede pa ba yung uh, save. So in tree surgery, we save the life of the tree. So ano yung mga steps dyan? Okay, so here I'm giving you some of, uh, uh, just two examples of how uh, tree surgery is conducted. Um, this is tree surgery of Balitbitan, Sinometra Ramiflora, done at uh, the CFNR Arbor Square by participants of tree care maintenance training course uh, done before the COVID uh, in October 2019. Actually, there were two training courses um, conducted by trees by participants from um, private company in industrial park in Bulacan. Okay, so the participants went there. We did some lectures on the on health tree health maintenance also. So the first step when we conduct tree surgery, so after evaluation, okay, this is uh, due for tree surgery. You simply clean the cavity, remove all the decayed part. So think the new extent of damage, pwede pa bang save? Okay, get get rid of all the decayed part. Then dapat i-shape nyo yung cavity so that no bumps will be uh, present inside. So dapat smooth. Okay. Then, uh, actually, nakuna ko na ng picture. Ito ay naalis na yung ano. Okay, so ito ay balit bitan, uh, which is used a very good uh, ornamental plant because of the, the um, uh, very nice um, young shoots, the very nice uh, color of the young shoots. So, Ito ay kulay black because uh, crusot was uh, used as uh, disinfectant. So you have to, after cleaning, after removing the decayed part and after shaping the cavity, then you sterilize the part that has been uh, cleaned of uh, uh, decayed uh, material. So dapat lalagyan nyo ng disinfectant. Okay. Then if there is a big cavity. You can put some uh, wires, chicken wires or, or nails. So here may those, uh, no, may chicken wire there. So pinapasok sa loob so that the, the filler okay, will be stronger. So para kumapit yung filler. Okay. 
And then, here, uh, ginamitan ito ng uh, concrete. Okay. So, ang concrete ay mixture of, uh, of sand, gravel, and cement. And then, inilagay na yung filler. Okay. Then, ito yung, yung uh, final final uh, output, balitbitan with concrete filling. So, ito yung ating normal na ano na paraan for three surgery i know in in erdb you have a three surgery team okay that can do this and then nowadays so i i happen to be involved in a certain project headed by dr lerma maldia our the chair of our fbs department in cfnr uh, we have a project um funded by the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs of UP System. And we were given some funds okay, to save Malabayabas Forest. Okay, so you, if you have been to the Quezon Protected Landscape in Atimonan, Quezon, okay, we have there so many Malabayabas uh, trees. When I was a student so many years ago, we had the chance to have a field trip to the Atimonan, uh, in Atimonan Quezon, the Quezon National Park, where I had the chance to see this for the first time. So, uh, tingnan natin, napakaganda nga naman ng, uh, ng uh, bark ng uh, Malabayabas. Although, my white, my white bark, unfortunately, I was not able to go to that uh, place where there is white uh, bark of Malabayabas. Ito yung, yung reddish bark. So we started this. Okay, so ito, uh, we, we had this tree surgery in order to save Malabayabas. Why did we uh, do it in the Quezon Protected Landscape? Kasi this is a tourism area. And the, the Malabayabas trees were, on, were found on the, on the trail at marami ng may mga decades so in order to protect people who go who go there every now and then <clears throat> with a thought of uh, conducting tree surgery there okay. so in evaluate ito and with the uh, with the help of our uh, arborist of uh, forester himself forester June Mikosa who now who was my former student and who now have a team uh, that goes around the country. So ito, okay, so removal of the decayed part. So tingnan nyo, parang uh, small part lang, but later on to the use of the chainsaw, chainsaw ang ginamit, see, a very big uh, cavity was uh, after we, after the, the decayed part was removed. So ito ang nakita namin, so big cavity. Okay. Pero nakikita nyo naman, there is callus formation there. So sabi ko nga kanina, ang callus formation is a natural natural way of the tree to treat itself. So meron naman, pero sa loob meron pa rin. Naiiwang pa rin decay. Okay. And then, ayan, instead of, use, instead of using uh, the normal uh, filler, iba yung ginamit nila. So pero, ang ginamit na... na pang sterilize ng cavity was our uh, ano yung common Clorox 10% Clorox na in spray around there ayan and so ang final ano nito ayan after na ester ito yung sa Clorox and then ito yung final na na sterilize na ng Clorox and then here uh, for Sir June Mikosa uh, uses arbor foam it is a kind of poly urethane foam. Uh, nakita lang namin na there were two gallons ang nakalagay na pangalan A and B. So the process is that there is a mixing of, uh, of uh, substance A and B. And then pag I, when you mix it, so haluin lang, okay, with the use of this small, uh, small stick, then ibuhos mo doon sa loob ng cavity ano siya, nag-expand. Nag so foam. At ma, ano siya, ma, malambot lang. In fact, you can use, you can use a scalpel to, to shape it. So ito yung ginawa after that. Actually, ito, inano namin, yung tulong-tulong kami to, 
to cover how kasi umaano yan yung nag expand palabas. So we have to make sure na um, yung foam na nag-create after the the mixture of the two um, substances making up the the arbor foam, okay? Pag iniligay doon sa cavity, make sure na intact siya sa loob. And then yung final output nito, okay? This was started in February of uh, of 2020 bago uh, one month before lockdown okay so ito yung nag-start kami ito before after ito uh, so pininturahan pa so that na uh, yung parang yung kulay ng uh, ng bark of uh, malabayabas okay ito yon after so this is the uh, UPLB team headed by Dr. Maldia the one in orange also forester Amelita Uh, Luna of Ocrel, Sipenar, then myself there, and with uh, we had some grad, we had uh, graduate students and the uh, staff of the Quezon uh, Protected Landscape and uh, the arborist team headed by Ayun, Ayun si Jun Mikosa. Okay, so Jun Jun Mikosa now heads this, and okay, so we have this documentation of Malabayabas three surgery at the Quezon Protected Landscape. And uh, starting with uh, the three surgery in February, 2020. So my constant uh, observation of this by one stop of the QPL. So ito na yung after one year. So you notice may nagsisimula ng magkalus dito. Later on, maano to, uh, masasarhan na. Okay, so according to Forester Jun Mikosa, he is now trying to to have um yung yung polyurethane na mas ma improve so that it will really be uh resistant against uh, attack of the decay fungi. Uh, according to Forester Mikosa, he tried using this foam because he noticed that if he uses the concrete and the, After some time, the concrete will crack and you need to replace it. It's so hard to remove. But in the case of this uh, arbor foam that he is now using, kung kailangan magpalit niyan, it's easier to remove. So I'm, uh, I'm so thankful with the, to Dr. Maldia for involving me in this uh, project, which will be, which is now, has now ended actually. So uh, with this, Okay, you can actually uh, apply this if, uh, of course, given uh, enough funding. I do not know how much. <laughs> if you need uh, the, if you need uh, to contact uh, Forester Jun Mikosa, just I will give the contact uh, address to ERDB staff. Okay, so thank you very much for listening, and uh, keep safe, everybody. Okay po. Uh, thank you very much, Ma'am uh, Batia, for your lecture. We uh, have a blast. We had a blast po with that lecture. So I hope uh, nagkaroon po tayo ng uh, mas malawak pa na pangunawa and also some fresh ideas doon po sa ating uh, tree health management. So before we start with our uh, uh, question and answer, uh, or our, our open forum. We will give po muna yung instructions natin uh, in accordance with our post-test para po makakuha po tayo ng uh, makaklaim po kayo ng inyo pong uh, mga certificate. So, please uh, share the screen. Don't worry po for those na nasa FB Live. So, we will also provide you with this uh, information. So ito po, uh, if you have your uh, QR code scanner, you can just scan this uh, using your phone and it will automatically uh, direct you doon po sa atin pong, um, direct you doon sa atin pong Google form. Ngayon po, uh, we will also post it in our chat box 
uh, yung link so that you can uh, directly uh, get to the site or to the link. So, ang ating po instruction dito with our post test, uh, as we you all know po, nagkaroon po kayo ng pre-test. So, nasubukan po doon kung gano'n na po kalawak yung uh, uh, yung inyo pong information with this lecture. But after this lecture, magkakaroon po kayo ng post test which will uh, eventually malalaman naman po natin kung ano po yung natutunan nyo through the lectures. So, with that po, this will be your ticket then para magkaroon po kayo ng certificate. So, kung hindi po kayo makakapagbigay uh, sa amin ng post test and evaluation form, hindi po namin kayo mabibigyan ng certificate. So, we hope that you will please uh, complete this post test and evaluation form para po uh, ma-inform din kami kung ano po yung natutunan nyo. And uh, at the same time, you can also give us recommendation and also your other concerns that uh, will enable us to do uh, much better in the next webinars that we will be hosting. So with that, uh, I think it is already posted in our um, in our chat box and in our FB live. Kung di pa po, uh, please just wait uh, uh, a little para po ma-post na po namin yun. Eh. So with that, we will now proceed with our uh, question and answer. So Ma'am Mutia. Yes. Okay, yun. Ready na si Ma'am. So we will proceed na po, Ma'am, with our question and answer. So, ang uh, una pong question, ma'am, uh, ito po is from Pedro Sikihor from Forrester Kent, Durang Parang. Um, in, ma'am, um, in the event of necrotic, how do we cure or treat this kind of disease? Thank you po. Actually, parang I answered that already sa chat box. Okay po. Uh, actually, yung necrotic na, when I discuss about the three types of uh, symptoms, okay. actually sometimes ang um, symptom is considered disease like in the case of lip spot, anthracnose. But there are some diseases like canker or root rot na may multiple uh, types of uh, symptoms. So mga, yung necrotic nga is due to destruction or killing of cells. So yung kung kung tinitreat nyo mismo yung uh, disease. So, halimbawa, in the case of, um, kung halimbawa, mga spot lang. No? That's why I, I really did not uh, did not discuss no, much about uh, lip spot anthracnose because, uh, for instance, NARA is very susceptible to lip spot and anthracnose. But since NARA has a natural tendency to, to defoliate at certain time of the year, kahit maraming lip spot, the new leaves, uh, that will be formed will be healthy. So, uh, and, and if uh, the Nara trees are already mature, big trees, hindi na siya na-apekto. Ibig sabihin, hindi nakakamatay. So, there are, there are diseases that are not life-threatening. So, as I have mentioned uh, during my lecture, kapag yung mga roots, yung root system affected or something kahit yung mga canker, kasi kahit hindi root system ang affected, the ability of the tree to to conduct water and minerals, which are really being used by the, the trees to photosynthesize, then it will be life-threatening if there will be multiple infection. So um, I, as I have mentioned, I do not espouse the use of chemicals, although chemicals may be used as uh, like fungicides may be used to, to treat the uh, disease-causing agents. But uh, I think there could be more Ma simpler, simpler way to to control. Like yung mga physical methods na yung uh, pruning. Ano ba ba? Nakikita niyo, sabi ko nga sa inyo, uh, dapat uh, we we really maintain um, health of uh, uh, trees. Kung mga kahit seedlings lang, kahit yung nasa nursery, every now and then you have to observe. So is there something wrong? The problem with us, if we are pathologists, is that. Uh, Mas laki ang mga, mga human doctors. They can ask their patients. But tayo, we cannot ask the plants, what happened to you? Hindi na. So we have to rely on information that we can, we can gather by simply looking at them or maybe asking questions to the one in charge. Ano nangyari dito? Ganon. So mas, mas, uh, mas mahirap ang trabaho ng mga pathologists kasi we are dealing with, uh, with patients that cannot talk to us, cannot 
tell us what's happening. So we have to rely on information that we can observe. At uh, mga simpleng paraan lang muna, mga simple and yet uh, simple na hindi magastos at uh, uh, hindi makakasira ng ating environment. So yung mga physical and cultural methods lang. For instance, kung halimbawa nagre-raise kayo ng seedlings in the nursery, nakita nyo naman na meron ng may spot, why don't you just simply remove the, the infected uh, parts? At saka you maintain distance. Uh, between the seedlings kasi pag nag-overlap na yung mga leaves if the if the disease is on the leaves make sure that the leaves do not overlap so napaka marami namang mga simple way to treat diseases thank you thank you po ma'am ayon so thank you ma'am for that uh, answer and uh, thank you for the question sir Ken next po nating question is from uh, ma'am Marsha follow from our um, uh, our deck po sa Cebu. Ma'am, for a, a casual observer, how will we know if the callus is due to a pathogen or healing from the wound? Thank you. Po. Actually, kanina, while I was uh, listening, nag nagsasasagot na rin ako niya. No, no. Actually, ang callus ay hindi galing sa pathogen. So, callus is a defense mechanism of the plant. So, halimbawa, something went wrong to the plant, nag, nagka-infection. So, ang natural tendency for the plant is to produce more cells. So, yun yung parang, yun yung defense niya talaga. So, may natural defense uh, mechanism ang mga halaman. It's, it's just like us. Tayo, uh, halimbawa, nahiwa kayo, uh, especially doon sa masipag magluto, o oh, nahihiwa tayo. Ang gagawin ng ating body, yung kumaliit lang yung uh, yung uh, nahiwa sa atin na uh, sa daliri, konti lang. What our body is doing will be to produce more cells to cover the wound. In due time, naghihil yon. Ganun din sa halaman. So in the case of uh, trees, so alamawa nagdecay. If it's just very small decayed part, okay, the tree normally will produce more cells kasi alam niya there is May ano yan eh, may, may parang meron silang communication. Communication within the cells of the trees. So, may part na na-infect, na na-injure. And so, merong mag, ano na, mas maraming cells puproduce ko so that I can heal, I can cover the wound or the injury. In due time, if the injury or the decayed part is just small, then there will be proper healing through the a callus formation. Kasi pag nag, nag uh, ano na yun, na-cover na, na yung, yung whole whole part na may decay or may, may injury or wound, then considered na yung healed. Okay. Pero pag malaki yung, uh, no, if the if the area covered is uh, is big, then katulad nung nakita nyo doon sa Malabayabas, even if there was callus formation, it's not enough to cover and to to heal. So then that's the time we should do something else. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Yon, I hope na na answer po yung question po uh, ni ma'am Marcia. Our next question po is from Penro Oriental Mindoro. So ma'am, most of our NGP plantation sites are located in the far plung areas. Is it possible for ERDB or uh, is it possible to develop a ready to use kits for treatment of three diseases? Well, ito ay ano, uh, I think baka meron nang ginagawa ang ERDB. You know, uh, much that I would like to do that, but because I'm saddled when I was uh, teaching and you know, uh, I've been uh, Kali secretary for more than 13 years. I talagang I did not have enough time to do research. Ngayon na nga lang akong mas na-involved na sa research towards the end of my of my uh, ano um, stint as a faculty of CFNR. But I think the um, researchers would have more time to do that. I will be willing to help. Pero marami din kayong, in fact, in ERDB, um, yung may mga pathologies, endomologies dyan. Then, uh, maybe a kit can be produced in order to to find simple solutions to uh, problems that will affect uh, uh, seedlings and trees in the field. So, marami din naman. In fact, I think I was able to 
yeah, there was a time when I was uh, invited to be a resource person in a training on sa, ano to, um, about microorganisms. So with the conduct of these training courses, then you will have a chance to be equipped with the necessary knowledge in order for you to be able to have this uh, kit with you. Uh, but if you need my assistance, then I would be very willing to help. Kulang lang sa time talaga. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that answer. Um, next po natin is from um, siguri, D, uh, DNR Tag, uh, Tagum. How to treat uh, gall rust because some of NGP areas in our uh, area of responsibility are already infected by gall rust. Yeah, yeah, actually, yan nga, actually I was asking one time kung bakit it's still being planted. Uh, sa mga, I do not know if it's still being planted in NGP areas. So especially kapag yung mga seedlings, as I have shown you, there was, uh, I have shown you one, one seedling with uh, with um, gulls, di ba? Pag ganun agad, then you have to to uh, cut cut at once that uh, part that has these gulls and dispose properly. Kasi pag naandun yun, okay, so you can see the gulls there. Later on, it will be covered by the spores of Euromycladium teperianum. And so... Ano yun eh? Source ng inoculum. Remember, during disease development, nag-start yan sa inoculation phase. Na from the source, or which is any infected the plant, will be transferred to healthy plants. So in due time, all the plants, all the seedlings there in the area will become infected. So uh, yung, ano nga, sana nga, uh, hindi lang yung, kung kahit curative, sana maging proactive tayo sa, ano, uh, sa pag-control ng diseases. So simple pruning ng, ng mga uh, uh, infected air, uh, plants, eh, makakatulong yun. Diba? So kung talagang sobra na yung uh, sakit, Okay. So yun nga, eh, inano ko sa inyo kanina, pathological rotation. Saka yung pagpili ng site. In the first place, when you when you establish plantations or yung sa mga reforestation projects, I think you should be you should be uh, selecting the species to be planted. Mas maganda kung native sa area. Uh, this is to prevent the occurrence of this epiphytotic. Usually mga epiphytotic is uh, yung mga introduced species, uh, exotic species ang mas gusto nila. So if you plant just the endemic species or the native species, may mga diseases din, but endemic diseases. Uh, kung uh, sa tao, yun lang sipon, ubo, ganun lang. Diba? Although ngayon, uh, medyo iba yung sa COVID. But uh, I think uh, uh, in your case, so you should carefully plan the species to be planted. So dapat yung, yung naan doon naturally occurring in the area because they tend to be more resistant against disease-causing agents. If we continue to introduce exotic species in certain localities, then there will be uh, more chances of uh, disease to occur. Pero kung meron na doon, then you try means na... Uh, i-control na. Simply yun nga, mag, uh, depende kasi sa kung, anong, kung ano na yung extent of damage. Thank you po ma'am uh, for answering the question. So mag-move na po tayo from uh, another question from Michael De La Cruz po of uh, Penro Sibugay. Ang kanila pong seed production area po ay mangrove. Ano po ang mga common pests and diseases in mangrove uh, in mangroves, uh, specifically for pagat pat species. Yeah, uh, kanina nag, ano, na ako dyan, nag chat. Uh, I'm not so familiar with the uh, mangrove species. In fact, I have just visited uh, two areas of mangrove in Pagbilao and in Padre Burgos, Quezon. Uh, wala naman serious uh, problem with regards to diseases. In fact, yung common uh, spots lang, anthracnose, but I, I, I just saw some barnacles yun, nakaka, nakakamatay din yun. But you can simply collect the barnacles, remove barnacles from the, from the mangrove uh, plants doon sa kumpagatpatan. 
um, wala akong masyadong mai-co-contribute uh, to diseases and uh, pests and diseases in mangrove. Sorry for that because I hindi nga ako nakaka nakaka uh, pag field uh, last three years lang ako naka uh, um, nakasimula uling mag field. So yun lang, hindi naman serious yung naging problema doon sa nakita kong mangrove areas walang serious um, disease of mangrove species. Thank you po ma'am. And uh, siguro we will also try our uh, the staff of for the NGP will try po to ask po for our uh, sa amin po mga kasamahan dito if they have uh, this kind of information po or any other um, uh, materials po regarding the question. Okay po. Uh, move po tayo to an, uh, next question po from LGU Ligasti from Sir Roderick Abache. Um, what are the indicators of a good soil to avoid three diseases and what uh, are the possible interventions on injured or predisposed trees from having disease? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, those a preventive control will be to carefully select the site with good soil. By good soil, I mean that there should be good drainage. We know pag clay, ang clay, ang soil, uh, then magiging water lag yung condition. And of course, you have to take note of the topography in the area. Flat ba siya or uh, hilly? So yung mga ganong, ano, kapag flat na yun, magiging water lag. Uh, siya, especially if the soil is clay, uh, the best soil will be the sandy loam, new loam. Now, but I think uh, um, biofertilizers can help too. So if you know yung mga mycorrhiza, the um, yung mga biological nitrogen fixers, they can help in uh, ensuring that the soil will be uh, of good quality. In fact, uh, you can. I saw. I had a chance to visit the the high Q bam area of Dr. Casillo doon sa may APEC Bayon uh, near Biotech. And they started using sand, sandy soil from rivers after the yung after na nagan sila noong uh, ng mga plants na inilagay nila parang trap for mycorrhiza. Gumanda na yung soil. So, sabi yung sandy naging uh, loam na. So, I think we can make use of this, uh, this uh, bio by uh, biofertilizer so pwede niyo lagyan ng ano of course depende sa area kung how big your area is but i know sa mga ngp projects you have been uh, using this uh, high q bam maganda po yun kasi naka, kahit sa seedlings pa lang i ilagay okay so kahit yung soil ay hindi uh, even if the soil is not that good but if uh, there is mycorrhizal treatment, then later on, the soil will have better quality. Okay po ma'am. Thank you po uh, for that. Ma'am, meron pong um, another question from sir. Do we apply certain chemicals daw po on the prune part of the tree to avoid entry of pests and diseases? Or do we just leave the prune part Okay. Open? During pruning, Okay, so in pruning, we cut the tree. Of course, if you just leave the pruned part, then it will be open for infection by uh, disease-causing organisms or even by insects. So what to do will be to, to put some wound dressing. So pwede nga yung ano lang, simple, simple Clorox will do. But of course, not the pure Clorox because you will be killing the cells there. So mga 10% Clorox lang. Hindi, hindi natin kailangan maglagay ng mga chemical, uh, chemical treatment on there. So pwede yung mga simple uh, Clorox na, na safe naman. In fact, we are using that at home. So mga 10% will do. So you just simply coat para lang magkaroon siya ng protection against uh, because we know that uh, we know that uh, disease causing agents pathogens are everywhere so in the air so kapag ka we leave the prune part open and especially so you have to time correct timing for pruning do not prune during these days that it is rainy season you prune during summer Kapag ka kasi summer, mas mabilis ang healing ng mga prune parts. Okay. 
Thank you, ma'am, for that. I hope nasagot po uh, ni ma'am yung inyo pong mga questions. Ma'am, mag-move po tayo to the next question. Siguro, uh, yan, from Ma'am Celerina Flores ng DNR Region 9. Is it true that the only way of eradicating this gall disease in Falcata Plantation is to burn the area? Burn the area. Well, depending on the, the extent of damage. But I will not uh, I will not um, uh, recommend burning of the area. In fact, bawal po yan, di ba? We have uh, the Clean Air Act, and uh, we should not deal. We should not be engaged in burning the area. So, baka naman ba nung pedi pang isave, you know, like yung pathological rotation that I was talking about. Para hindi naman talaga yung buong area at uh, bawal po ang magsiga <laughs> so do not burn uh, but you can um, you can prune okay kung talaga no but of course with proper permit ha, if you need to if you need to cut the infected uh, trees thank you ma'am for that uh, move ulit po tayo to another question no medyo madami-dami po yung mga tanong okay, natin so please ano po ano so next po, ma'am, is from uh, DNR Pendro uh, from JC Gilaw. How to determine if a certain tree has infected with center rot? Ah, uh, well, okay. So careful observation. Saka yung, uh, you know, the, actually there is, uh, there is a way, kaya lang wala tayo dito in Philippines, there is a, an instrument called shigometer uh, na parang I, you, you bore into the into the trunk at doon na, na may measure extent of damage. Unfortunately, we do not have that. I do not know if there uh, is shigometer in other research institutes. Pero yun, without without cutting, nakikita. Or you can simply you can simply ano, yung, you knock knock on the trunk, hollow sound will tell us that there is a um, cavity inside. Although it's not true for all, there are there are trees with the hollow sound. So that's what we know. Diba? Um, first, I know when when we when we want to diagnose, you have to know the normal, the normal condition of a normal plant, the healthy plant. So we we, we should know first the characteristics of a healthy plant and compare it with the one that that you are observing. So baka naman na uh, uh, halo lang talaga siya dahil sa yun ang natural but kung hindi naman siya halo and then you observe na actually even if there is a center rot it will surely uh, it will surely show symptoms other than yung decay inside so meron kasi yung laging may mga ka, kasama hindi yan uh, uh, hindi lang yung sa sentro ng ng, uh, ng puno so may mga Kasi center, then later on pwedeng pumunta yan sa may sap wood. So, you can, which you can see already. So, uh, at saka hindi yan basta, remember, decay, um, decay punjay, it takes so many years. Hindi siya yung, hindi yun siya yung tipo na, na mag, ano, na mag, uh, karoon agad ng, ng death ang halaman. Uh, in fact, um, because they are they are heterotrophs, so fungi are heterotrophs. So may you lalo yung mga decay fungi, they would need the wood for survival because they, that's the reason why they infect uh, wood. Yung mga wood decay fungi, kailang kailangan lang nila ng wood in order to enter. But once they enter, they use their enzymes to to degrade the the cells. And they get nourishment from there. So kaya hindi yan, uh, hindi nila yan inuubos agad. Kung baga, dahan-dahan. Okay. So here, uh, uh, you should be able to see some other symptoms that may be present. So kailangan talaga careful observation. Uh, kung halimbawa, mas ano na yan, pwedeng sa crown kasi makikita. Uh, for instance, kapag root rot kasi mabilis. So you will find that wilting agad. Wilting will occur. Uh, pero kung nasa central portion, then it's harder to know. Kasi uh, ano, hardwood, is, uh, hardwood is made up of dead cells. So hindi siya basta-basta magkakaroon ng symptoms on, on the crown. Yes. Thank you, ma'am, for that. 
Um, I hope na sagot po yung tanong niyo po ni Ma'am Utya. Next po is from DNA Region 1 NGP. Good afternoon po. Pwede po bang gamitin ng fungicide yung nag-uumpisa pa lamang ng disease? Ano na pwedeng? Uh, kung pwede daw ma'am, uh, gamitan na agad ng fungicide yung nag-uumpisa pa lamang na disease. No, actually, ako nga, I, I do not know. And, uh, you have been my students at talagang um, I have been uh, teaching my students not to use uh, chemicals for treatment of diseases. Kasi kung ba, uh, if we can do something that is not making use of chemical treatment, then we should be using that. Uh, we know that the use of chemicals is, uh, um, is not healthy for us, for the ones uh, using it, also for the, for the plant, for the tree. And because ang environment natin ay very polluted na. So please try using other alternative uh, control measures rather than using uh, fungicides right away. Yung mga bio, uh, by the way, there may mga biocontrol agents. I, I was not able to discuss that. There are some microorganisms like fungi like aspergillus, penicillium, trichoderma with uh, the capacity to to kill pathogens. So you may use uh, biological control agents. Thank you, ma'am, for that. Um, next question po natin is from DNR Senro Ayungon um, from Linjun uh, Jun Will Saguban. Is mycorrhiza fertilizer have generation? sa paggamit. So, actually po, uh, kasama po natin, ma'am, ngayon yung uh, focal person po ng amin pong uh, Haikyu BAM 1. So, bago po, siguro ibigay ko kay ma'am Motia po to uh, answer the question. Uh, siguro po, ibigay po natin yung ano, kay, kay, sige po, opo. Uh, si ma'am Pamela Bonsol po yun. Yes, good afternoon. Um, sino yung may question? Sino ayaw ko? Okay. Um, Sir Lin Jun Will, apo, yung tanong niyo po kasi ay kung ang mycorrhiza fertilizer have duration sa paggamit. So, uh, ang tanong ba po dito ay yung uh, applied, na applied na ba po or before or after? So, ang mycorrhiza po kasi ay meron po tayong 3 years na ano po, uh, ex expiration. Pero ibig naman pong sabihin yung tatlong taon yung nilalagay po natin sa label po natin dun po sa, kung makikita po natin sa mga sako na i-distribute po natin sa region, ay meron po nakalagay na uh, yung time ng harvesting na no, yung final packaging niya ay naglalagay po tayo ng after three years yung po yung um, expiration. Pero ang ibig naman pong sabihin nito na 3 years na expired na po siya. Halimbawa, expired na po siya ng January 2021. So, hindi naman po ibig sabihin ay hindi na po siya effective. Ang ibig lang po sabihin nito na expired na po siya ay bumaba lang po yung viability nung, nung spores na nandoon po sa ating inoculants, yung mycorrhizal fungi po, yung spores na tinatawag natin. So, pwede pa rin po siyang gamitin. Ang ano nga lang po nito, medyo low yung viability. Kung, kung dati po ay uh, 2.5 grams lang po yung application niya na bago po yung saturation, pwede naman po natin i-double yun. At saka hindi naman po ibig sabihin nun, na bumaba yung viability, hindi naman po 50% ng viability ang mawawala doon. Siguro mga 2 to 5, 2 to 5% lang naman po. So, okay pa rin po siyang gamitin. Kaya lang, naglalagay lang po tayo nung uh, um, expiration, parang para pong yung sinasabi dito, para pong yung freshness, kumbaga po sa mga tinapay, yung freshness lang po niya ay hanggang ganitong araw. So, yun lang po yung ibig sabihin niya. Ngayon po, Pag once na na-apply na po natin to, itong itong mycorrhiza, ay ando na po siya. So dadami na po siya doon, hindi na po tayo kailangan mag, uh, no need to reapply po. Kasi once na po yung application ng mycorrhiza, hanggang buhay po yung ating nilagyan na halaman, 
ay mabubuhay na po siya kasi di ba po ang ano nga po ang mycorrhiza ay symbiotic between um, roots and fungi so dadami po siya doon doon po siya mamamahay sa ugat so hangga't buhay po ang ating halaman buhay rin po yung mycorrhiza yun po at thank you very much po sana po ay nasagot ko po yung natanungan niyo sir Sir Jun Lin Jun of DNR Centro Ayuwan and good afternoon po Thank you po, Ma'am Pamela Bonsol. Uh, I hope nasagot po yung inyo pong question, uh, Sir. Ma'am Mutia, meron po ba kayong karagdagan po doon? Ah, wala na. Actually, yun, actually pag nag-apply ka kasi niyang mga mycorrhiza, niya, mga spores siya, mga living. Uh, and since they thrive inside, lalo yung mga endomycorrhiza, uh, the BAM, then uh, for as long as yun nga, katulad ng sinabi kanina na For as long as the plant is living, then the 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 mycorrhizal fungi will continue to grow. Okay, so they they will continue to live. So, ano yan? Kaya matipid gamitin. Okay, po. Thank you, ma'am. And if you have any more question, po, in regards with application po ng mycorrhiza, specifically ng high cubam one, which is a product of ERDB. Please, uh, also, you can also ask us or uh, mag-letter po kayo sa amin so that we can assist you. So, ma'am, next question na po tayo. From um, Sir Mark Jun Rojo. Ma uh, hi, ma'am Mutia. What, Hello. <laughs> uh, what, what could have caused the reduction of reduction or paghina ng severity or intensity of pink disease in Palkata? Now, actually... Um, ano yan eh, nagkakaroon na rin ng, there is natural uh, way na ang mga halaman din nakakakuha ng resistance against diseases. So, uh, if you can observe, even in, in areas where there is epiphytotic, nagkaroon ng epidemic in plants, there will be some uh, trees that will remain uh, uninfected. So, meron tinatawag dyan na uh, meron natitira pa isa-isa na namkakaroon ng resistance against the disease-causing agents. So make sure that you make use of those kasi yun yung may, um, may genes for disease resistance. So kaya nagkakaroon ng pagkakataon na uh, mabawasan na yung infection, yung infection rate. And also... Uh, I know that there were studies already conducted. Anong elevation? Uh, although I'm not so familiar, but I I know there was a time na, like Emil Anino um, uh, studied about ano yung proper altitude for planting. So, kasi may mga altitudinal ano din eh, preference ang mga pathogens. So you just continue to research on this. So ano yung best na na altitude to plant. Unmute. No, unmute pala ako. Sorry. So, as uh, I mentioned, even in areas with uh, with uh, epiphytotics, okay, there will remain some trees that will be resistant against uh, uh, canker, against cortisium salmonicolor, and make Be sure to make use of these trees. Because that's the reason why we're having a gradual decrease in infection. Because some of the resistant trees that will remain, they will continue to grow. And then, because of the fruits, and so on. So, 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 so,
meron kasi kami mom sa Fuertec na they keep on studying yung mga falcata and meron na silang mga improved seeds ng falcata okay. which is more resistant sa mga gal hmm. sa mga gal rust okay. and yung sinasabi nyo ma'am na elevation wise na mapa na po yan meron na din kaming study sa silang study on sa IPM di ba ma'am naging resource Uh-oh. namin kayo sa integrated Uh-oh. test management yeah. so nagkaroon sila na i-map na nila yan sa GIS map na the higher the elevation meron talagang elevation na doon lang siya pero habang Uh-oh. kumataas ma'am yun umaano yung That's ano lang palkata yung gal tumataas Uh-oh. yung yung ano na ano yun yung infection yung gano'n yes. yung rate mm-hmm. yun meron talaga ma'am meron na noon na Oh, yun pala. So I think uh, we should make use of uh, those uh, results of Thank researches you. kasi yes, that will be very good. You don't need to kasi alam mong at that particular elevation very high ang intensity ng uh, na, ng uh, galras or pagkata. Yes, Why do you need to plant in those places? So yes, you should refrain from planting uh, palkata in those areas. Do concentrate ka na lang doon sa mga elevation na na hindi hindi eh, active ang Euromycladium teperiano. Thank oh, you, yes, Monette. Oo, oh, oh. meron na po. I- iyon lang. I- hindi ko alam kung lumabas na kasi kakatapos lang ma'am ng study na yung completed last year. Oh, oh. So, I think, yun, yeah. Na, na, uh, that's, yeah. That's the, the big challenge on the part of researchers. Kasi dapat, if, we, if you have uh, results like that, mm. dapat talaga ma- i- ma- i- ma-inform na. sa lahat. Extension is Uh, is the best uh, way na talagang ma-extend natin yung uh, yes. um, research results that will benefit the um, the men in the field. So para hindi na sila magkaroon uli ng ano ng ng bad uh, experience of having these different diseases. Yes, so, ma'am, ginagawa na rin po 'yun ng ano, ng FERDEC, yung kanilang IEC, meron I'm... silang techno transfer. Okay. So yung every uh, sa region, yung sa mga uh, metros, yeah. 'yun. So, I think meron ano nga po, eh. Uh, yeah, it's better na that we are having this. That's it, diba? Yung mga webinar. Ayan, para oh, marami. Saka, meron sila, ma'am, na talagang entomologist and pathologist oh, yeah. dun sa FERDEC na pinag-aaralan nila mga mga pest and disease lalo na dun sa mga uh, yan falcata and mga rubber and yung yes, mga fast growing species especially mga exotic species po ma'am oh thank you kasi, kasi nga ako as a faculty uh, nako alam niyo naman so many jobs to do uh, multitasking lagi so i wish i was a researcher lang kasi I will have more time. So, yun nga, yung mga naging estudyante namin, then uh, you can do your task, especially if you're connected with a research agency. Thank you, Monet. Yes, ma'am. At saka, ma'am, nagsishare na din sila ng mga seeds. Halimbawa, Ayan. palata. Meron na po talagang improved seeds na maraming uh, nag-acquire, bumibili, nagre-request na compare dun sa mga falkata na di ba maraming nabibili dun sa mga roadside lang. Uh-huh. Yung aming galing po sa center namin dun ay more resi- resistant na yeah. talaga siya. So tama yun. We should, you should not buy from uh, doon lang sa naglalako kung saan saan. Na you should uh, uh, buy seeds from uh, um, dito sa mga centers niyo kung nag titinda na sila o nagbibigay i do not know if you're selling or ano so you should use these improved seeds okay thank you po ma'am monet and uh, ma'am batia for answering that question so i hope everyone po as ah uh, yun nag- nagkaroon po kayo na idea with that uh, topic so next question po ma'am Um, I would, uh, from Nina Camille Gonzalez ng DNR Mimaropa, I would like to know if we have studies or research articles which describes the mortality threshold of native species. Well, unfortunately, I do not have. <laughs> Sorry for that. I do not have uh, studies on that. Okay po, ma'am. Thank you po. Siguro we will also ask po here sa agency if uh, we have th- those kinds of articles and we will get back to you po, Ms. Uh, Gonzalez. Next, ma'am, is from uh, CZ Ferd, uh, from ARDB CZ Ferd, from Ma'am Cynthia Marquez. 
Ma'am, good afternoon. Meron po ba tayong field guide for visual tree assessment to determine the extent of decay and if the diseased trees can still uh, preserve through uh, tree surgery which minimize risk or if the tree is dying and needs to be removed? Thank no, we, we do not have yet that. <laughs> Wala. Uh, Cecil, maybe you can uh, start that. <laughs> Cecil. Uh, sorry, wala, wala pa tayo nung ganun. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So I hope na it will also be a challenge for uh, some of us. Na mag yung mga young. I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> Yan po. Sige, ma'am. Thank you for that. Next, ma'am, is from Penro Albay. Uh, from Ma'am Yolanda Saong. Good afternoon po. Hi, Yoli. Ayun. Kilala ni ma'am. So, uh, ang kanila pong seed production area po is Batino uh, and it is infected with black canker disease. So, you, uh, they sent a uh, sample daw po to ERDB for analysis of the causal agent. We learned that a portion of the seed production area was damaged by fire last 2019 and also damaged by uh, the typhoons in 2020. And most of the Batino trees daw po were infected. Ang tanong po nila is the fire and typhoons aggravated the disease oh, and yeah. could we could they still uh, be able to save the batino trees from the disease and what are they going to do? Now actually fire uh your occurrence ng fire okay can really weaken the trees so depending on the extent of damage due to fire it can weaken the tree. So, parang gan din tayo eh, di ba? Uh, if we are exposed to conditions that will that will lower our immune system, that is also true for for trees. So, if they have been exposed to fire, then for sure they will be more susceptible to attack by the uh, disease causing agents. But it will be also de be dependent on the extent of damage by fire. So, tingnan nyo na lang, just evaluate uh, kung alin yung pwedeng mag, magtuloy, mag survive. Otherwise, then you can uh, do pathological rotation. Sayang naman, ano, may nagka fire. Thank you, ma'am, for that. Siguro we will uh, have one more question po. So from um, uh, uh, PHL CFES MSU from uh, Norhana Disimban, is there any easy technique you consider na pwede apply sa Palawan cherry seed for pasture germination po? Oh, I'm sorry. I think you should ask the, the seed center for that. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Seed, seed germination. Meron po naman tayong mga ano, te technique to enhance seed germination. So, may mga references na po dyan. Kasi yung ano yan, Palawan Cherry, matigas siya tayong seed. Ah, so dormant. So, dormant oh, oh, so, pwede nyo yung isoak overnight para lumambot yung kanyang seed coat. Pwede nyo yung inik. Pwede nyo yung oh, so, meron na po yung mga references. Uh, you just have to, ano, yung ERDB po, nada-download na yung mga reference materials namin. Just check our, ano, yeah. ano FB page ba yun? Kung ano ba yun, faith? So, nandun yan, mada-download nyo naman po yun. Uh, so, you have ones for Palawan Cherry. Ang ganda ng Palawan Cherry in Coron. Di ba? Yung mga naturally growing uh, species. Oh, yes, ma'am. Pero ngayon kasi, ang daming lumalabas na ano, fake na Palawan Cherry. Sinasabi nilang Palawan Cherry. Pero hindi siya yung Palawan Cherry. Yung nasa Palawan, yun. Yun yung totoo. Nasa Coron. Nakita ko yun. Iba kasi yung parang pink kasi pink kasi lang eh. Yung exotic, yung ganun. Hmm. I think in the case of Palawan Cherry, if uh, you said, uh, Monet, that it has hard hard seed coat, I think yung mga animals actually can help in uh, in uh, breaking dormancy. So Kung minsan, kinakain nila, ma'am. No? Kinakain nila, tapos when at nag CCR sila doon, yes, and then uh, passing through the gut of the of the animals, then ma ma pwedeng mag-enhance uh, mag na ng germination. Uh, remember, I, I have been to Palawan. Meron doon parang plantation na ng, ng uh, Samaneya Saman. Na sabi nila, hindi naman yun tinanim. Oo, oh, mga baka. Diba yung nandun sa may uh, 
uh, ano ngayon? Papuntang ano ma'am, papuntang sa South yata yun, no? Oo, oh, papunta doon sa may Nara, na, papunta doon, sa Overland. Yes. Oo, oh, yeah. So the, the animals actually can help in in uh, scarification, uh, yung uh, pag ano ng mga hardship ko. So natural yes. ano natin yan, oh, okay. katulong. Okay. Thank you po ma'am and ma'am Monette for that. And uh, siguro po, From MSU, Mindanao State U, uh, we can also uh, link you sa amin pong our deck uh, doon po sa Miss League uh, to per deck para you can also consider them. Uh, kung meron po kayong Palawan Seed Cherry, uh, Palawan Cherry Seed, you can send it to them and they will ano po, um, have it tested para magkaroon po kayo ng analysis po doon po sa seed sample nyo. And siguro doon po sa question ni Ma'am Gloria uh, Suboan, kung uh, makasecure po kayo ng study nung sa Palkata, we will also ask po Ma'am Monette for that. Uh, also, uh, na-mention naman po kanina na it's uh, yet uh, uh, kaka-out pa lang po. So siguro Ma'am, we will get back to you once uh, ma-finalize po namin yung paper. Ma-share ko lang din nung Ma'am Mucha. Di ba panahon yeah. pa ni na Dr. Lapis? Diba mayroong yeah. off sila na so, on pest and disease yata parang ganun na Actually may uh, mga ito na yun no. Oo, oh, oh, ma'am, eh, talaga namang sa dami ng sakit ng falcata, ni-recommend nila yan na wag nang itanim. Pero yeah, sa so, mga tree farmers kasi, yun They ang gusto nila ng itanim. Yeah. Kaya ayan, eh, lang dumami si sakit. <laughs> 1977, I was so new in the college. Uh, yes, I started diba? 1976. <laughs> My first trip was in uh, Pico, with Dr. Enriquito de Guzman. Oh, And yeah. we visited yung kanker na ganito. Kaya sabi ko, dapat hindi na tinatanim. But yun nga, I have been uh, in discussion with my graduate students. Sabi ko, why do you keep on planting uh, palkata? When in fact, you know, it's so prone to diseases. Hindi lang talaga basta diseases. But oh. epiphytotic proportion. But they say, ma'am, hindi talaga pwede. Yung mga, mga farmers, they oh. insist on planting kasi nga daw, mabilis yung yung paggrow ang uh, mga 10 to 15 years makaharvest na sabi parang ano na lang daw sa palaran na lang kung <laughs> kasi sabi nila parang they use that uh, parang insurance that they can send their children to school so para oh. may namamakyaw ano niyo yun, yung yes, uh, bata pa, pa lang yung ano nila bata pa lang yung tinanim nila yes bibig na parang ganoon pinapapakyaw po talaga pinapapakyaw yeah. yeah. that's why It keeps on, they keep on yung mga barren area nila. Although, if we come to think of it, parang kumbaga, mga barren area, uh, they keep on reforesting. But the problem is yung pag, I think they should make use of the, what you are saying na improved seeds of Alcata. At least minimize ang uh, minimize ang occurrence of diseases. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh. Tsaka ngayon po, meron ng mga studies na anong native tree species ang pwedeng pamalit mga fast growing din yeah, sila yun nga na I ano yung, yung performance or yung pagiging fast growing nila is Almost comparable or better yeah. pa nga sa falcata gemelina and ano meron na ma'am mga yeah, talagang dapat yung ating mga native species uh, ay dapat <laughs> natin <laughs> talagang pagtuunan ng pansin kasi yun yes, yung less problem tayo with regards to pests and diseases yes ma'am Okay. Thank you po, Ma'am Monet and uh, Ma'am Butya. So that will be our last question po for this afternoon. We want to thank you, uh, Ma'am Butya, for answering the thank question you and then. also delivering po the lecture. So, yeah, I, uh, thank yes. you, thank you also. Before my retirement, I was able to participate in a webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Ma'am, and congratulations po sa inyong retirement. Uh, <laughs> we hope that you stay healthy, Ma'am. Yeah. And, I use my knowledge on diseases so that I stay healthy. <laughs> Ayun. Inaano Ayun. ko yun. Yun. So thank you, ma'am, with that. Uh, so thank you, then for, ev for everyone who participated in this uh, webinar. I hope uh, I have, uh, I have um, given um, enough information for you. Um, But I will be willing to help. Kung kailangan ako ng ERDB, wala nung problema. Kahit gratis, no problem. Thank you also, ma'am, for your ano, uh, enthusiasm in helping us. And yun nga po, we will stay uh, in touch with you para po uh, makakuha. Oo, oh, tuloy mo na yung MS mo. <laughs> 
Sorry po. <laughs> Sige, okay. ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for that. And uh, ngayon po siguro, uh, we will move on to our uh, presentation po ng atin pong synthesis. Um, so, our synthesis po will be presented uh, by the OIC chief ng uh, Forest Ecosystem Research Division. Uh, it will be presented by uh, Forester Florita E. Shapno. Ma'am Iyet? Okay, uh, magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Hi, Iyet. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, Napaka-informative and uh, we were refreshed <laughs> by the lectures that you have delivered. And thank you, thank you to you and to Doc Ike Valentino. Okay, so just to give a recap of uh, what we had uh, discussed, uh, discussed by our resource persons for the last four hours. <laughs> uh, we will recap it. We'll, we try to recap it. Uh, para naman po lang uh, mabigyan tayo ng in, um, parang, um, uh, parang a synthesis of what were presented uh, this uh, this uh, during this webinar. So <clears throat> in the two lectures, ano, nakita natin that uh, science-based approach to address forest health uh, issues is really necessary. Why? Because uh, uh, ito yung mas mag-challenge sa atin ano, to, be, uh, to conduct more researches, focusing of course on, the protect, uh, on protecting the vigorous uh, fast-growing trees from pests and diseases or diseases that uh, we have been um, uh, encountering or na, ito yung mga threats na yun sa ating mga plantations. Okay, so we would also like to uh, for uh, our researches, no, yung mga results nito, uh, we want to provide science-based and well-tested treatments for the pest and diseases problems in uh, forest plantations in different sites of the country. So, nabanggit nga kanina ng ating mga lecturers na hindi lang tayo basta magbibigay ng mga information, but we would like it uh, to be uh, yung results ng mga uh, research na kinundak natin to best, uh, to, to, uh, uh, have the best treatment that we can offer or we can give to our uh, mga counterparts natin na nag establish ng mga plantations. And uh, also, uh, we want, uh, ito yung ibinigyan ng emphasis kanina during the lecture, no? that uh, we have to consider all factors involved in the establishment and management of forest plantations. And uh, dapat may consider natin yung mga uh, species size, size, uh, site compatibility and uh, having optimum environment conditions are very important in establishing forest plantations. So, ibig sabihin, hindi lang tayo basta magtatanim ng mga kung ano ng species, but we have to uh, identify or determine ano ba ang condition ng site na yon. And nabanggit nga ni Ma'am kanina, di ba, during uh, his, her lecture na uh, kaya meron nagiging problema dahil hindi rin na-assess na maiki yung area where uh, different species will be planted, you know, Kaya yung pala meron ng problema dun sa, uh, sa mga stumps na naiwan or yung mga existing pang mga vegetation doon. So that would be uh, the sources of the uh, mga, mga diseases that uh, may be experienced by uh, new uh, uh, trees or seedlings that will be planted in those areas. Another one is that uh, all deceased seedlings should not, it's a no, 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 para ma-outplant pa natin so that we can avoid yung spreading itong pests and diseases to new, uh, to new sites. Ano? So parang uh, ang hirap naman na maganda naman sana yung pwede natin itanim doon pero uh, pwede naman natin gawa ng paraan yan na talaga iselect natin uh, yung mga, uh, mga walang problema, walang sakit ng seedlings na gagamitin natin. Also, we should be ready for uh, yung occurrence of uh, severe typhoons by carefully planning then, ano, para do sa mga mag-establish ng plantations and also how we are going to manage uh, these plantations. So, nabanggitin kanina na uh, alam naman natin na ang, ang, ang country natin, ang Philippines, ay uh, um, laging um, dinadala o dinadaanan ng iba't ibang typhoons. Uh, in a year, we have an average of 20 to 22 typhoons. So, kailangan mapag-aralan din natin yan. Ano? So, consider these factors para po maging successful ang ating um, established plantations. 
And of course, we have to use the appropriate silvicultural practices on controlling damages dito sa mga plantations nito. Number three is the proper assessment of for accurate treatment of the disease. So yon the mga, yung mga signs and symptoms of three diseases, three diseases should be properly assessed to apply accurate control measures. So ito yung binigyan ng emphasis ni Ma'am kanina, no? ni Ma'am Motia, na hindi lang tayo basta nag, um, nag-cure or uh, tinitreat natin yung mga may mga sakit, but we have to really look into the signs and symptoms para we can properly address the problem. Uh, yung mga three disease control measures uh, uh, also involve either preventive or curative. So, mas gusto natin siyempre no, prevent ano, uh, itong mga diseases na to. So, instead na uh, siya ay uh, ando na para kontrolin lang natin. So, so, sabi nga ni Ma'am kanina, diba, mas mabuti na ang gamitin natin talaga ay yung mga uh, tamang mga planting materials that uh, came from uh, mga good mother trees. No? So, ibig sabihin, yung mga sources nito ay talagang uh, certified na talagang ito ay maganda dahil maganda ang uh, pinanggaling yan. So, magiging maganda rin ang magiging anak nito. And then, okay, of course, uh, na-mention niya rin yung tree surgery, which is one way to cure yung uh, curative measure uh, being uh, conducted on high-value trees. So, uh, ito isang methodology na talagang pwede din natin i-apply. And uh, sabi nga, uh, kaya lang hindi ito uh, agad-agad lang nagagawa. But we have to really make a proper assessment of the tree kasi baka hindi naman kailangan uh, na ano to, i-tree surgery siya. So, titignan din yung extent ng, ng damage dun sa uh, mga sinasabi na may damage, mga damage trees. Okay, I think that would be all. So thank you for uh, your eye uh, for listening to this uh, short recap. Thank you, ma'am, yet for the synthesis po of uh, the lecture or the webinar. Uh, siguro this time po, we will take this opportunity to have another uh, photo uh, opportunity with ma'am Mutia. So can you please open your uh, camera po ulit so that we will have the opportunity to see you kahit uh, virtual lang so ayan so kung may kakilala po kayo say hello to them so yan so we will count po ulit uh, ng 1 to 10 and uh, let's see ayan so marami po akong nakikita na mga faces hi hello po kay Mom Tess de los Reyes yan we have from the inner uh region 5 Ayan po. From uh, DNR uh, 4A and our um, from our Ardex, our uh, ER, it's the ERDB main office. Ayan. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five. Another one. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so thank you very much, Paul, for opening your camera and uh, we... We hope that you have enjoyed our webinar. So right now, wag po muna kayong umalis because we will proceed to the awarding of our certificate of appreciation to our lecturers. I hope uh, Sir Ike is also here uh, with our uh, meeting. So can we now present our certificate of appreciation? Uh, can we now please present po? So, uh, before the, yan, habang uh, pinaprepare po natin yung atin pong uh, certificate, another reminder po is to finish nga po yung atin pong uh, post-test leak. May nagtanong po kanina kung meron pong passing rate. Fortunately, wala po itong passing rate. So, we are, we just wanted uh, to know kung ano po ba yung range ng natutunan nyo uh, compared, kasi di ba binigyan po namin kayo ng pre-test so that we can, uh, uh, we can know kung uh, nakatulong po ba yung uh, webinar na to for you to enhance your knowledge on this topic. Okay, uh, can we now please, ano po? Ayan, so we, uh, we will now read yung atin pong certificate of appreciation. 
uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Ecosystems Research and Development. Uh, Bureau presents this uh, Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Enrique L. Talentino Jr. and to uh, Forrester, uh, Forrester Matia Maria Q. Manalo for sharing their valuable knowledge and expertise as research speaker in the virtual seminar titled Silvicultural Practices on Tree Health Management held on June 11, 2021 by a Zoom. Signed, the Henry A. Adornar, uh, Adornado, PhD, our uh, ERBB director. So, pwede bang palakpakan naman natin kahit virtually lang yung ating mga lecturers? So, yun. Thank you ulit, Ma'am Mutia and uh, Dr. Ike for uh, giving us this opportunity para matuto po sa inyo. You're welcome. And thank you also for inviting me. Ayan. Sige, thank you. Ma'am, salamat po. Thank you, thank you then. Ayan po. So now we will now present naman po yung certificate of uh, participation. So everyone na nandito pa at uh, inilalaban na makinig sa webinar, we are very thankful na tinapos niyo po itong webinar na to. So we will present this. So certificate of participation to 1M De La Cruz for your name for successfully participating uh, in the virtual seminar titled Silvicultural Practices and Tree Health Management held on June 11, 2000. 21 by a Zoom, signed Henry A. Adorna, Adornada, PhD, uh, the ERGB director. So yun, congratulations to everyone sa mga nasa Facebook Live. Congratulations din po. Sa, Thank you very much. Ayun po. So with that, uh, we will now proceed uh, to our closing remarks. So tatawagin ko po ulit ang atin pong OIC chief ng Forest Technology uh, Research Division. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Faith. And uh, of course, we would like to thank, uh, first of all, our resource persons, uh, Dr. Ike uh, Enrique uh, Tolentino Jr. and uh, Mam Motia uh, Quintos Manalo. <laughs> Baka kung magkamali okay, eh. So. <laughs> Maria, na nakalimutan ko. Motia, Maria. So, thank you so much for the information, uh, the overwhelming information that you have shared to each and everyone, especially to our participants. And we really appreciate uh, giving your time uh, during this seminar, uh, this webinar. And um, I know our participants have also learned so much from the lectures. And uh, maybe uh, some are not new to them. So, alam namin na it's... Uh, but time for them to be refreshed what they have learned uh, during college days and even yung mga ginagawa rin nila uh, sa kanilang mga kanya-kanyang trabaho. It's, it's really important to be um, reminded and uh, be informed again of the things that the relevant information and the things that we have to uh, consider especially in um, uh, yung mga tao na kasamahan natin sa DNR na involved uh, and even the, the others no, who are involved in a reforestation or program or uh, yung the establishment ng mga plantations. So, uh, uh, Ma'am and Sir Ike, I, I hope this would not be the last. <laughs> so, nag-express naman si Ma'am kanina that uh, she is very much willing to help PRDB uh, anytime. So, thank you for that and we really appreciate that. And uh, thank you even for our participants for taking your time uh, to listen uh, to the lectures and uh, uh, we have our, our representatives or participants from the DNR, from uh, SUCs, from different agencies. Uh, from the regional offices ng DNR and also yung mga ibang kasamahan natin pa uh, that I was not able to mention. So thank you uh, because uh, this webinar could not be that successful uh, if not for your presence no? So and for your participation. So thank you so much. And uh, in behalf of our director, Dr. Henry Adornado, and of course our assistant uh, director, uh, Ma'am uh, Mayumi, baka magkamali kasi pare-pareho ang tunog ng mga pangalan niyo, Ma'am. Ma'am Mayumi, so si Ma'am Mayumi, si Bidad. So we would like to thank everyone uh, for uh, your uh, participation in this uh, webinar. So uh, kayo po ay mag-iingat din kasi tayo po ay 
mga ano din, uh, marami na rin uh, pwedeng <laughs> mga prone sa mga sakit no po. Uh, hindi na hindi na tayo nalalayo diyan but uh, ito na laging inuulit-ulit din ni Ma'am Mutia kanina na tayo dapat mag-ingat sa ating mga sarili just like the trees that uh, or yung mga itatanim natin gusto natin na tanim that tree from diseases. So thank you so much and may God bless us all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much po for that. Um, siguro po, before we end this uh, webinar, we would like to express our gratitude then po uh, to our heads. Thank you, ma'am Maria Lourdes D.C. Reyes for supervising us in the hanap po in this, uh, this webinar. We would also like to appreciate uh, si ma'am uh, Clarita E. Shop, no? Of course, our assistant director, ma'am Mayumi Quintas Natividad. And of course, our director, Director Henry A. Adornado. So a few reminders na lang po before we end uh, this webinar. So yung nanghihingi po ng copy of the recording uh, and or the presentation. So we will provide you po the presentation together with your certificate. So after nyo po matapos yung po, ma post test, uh, give us a little time for us to prepare your certificate. And together with the certificate, uh, ilalagay din po namin doon yung... Uh, copy po ng recording na ito so that you will have a reference para po uh, sa webinar na ito. So with that, thank you very much everyone. Um, is there any final words po from anyone po? Okay po. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you po sa ating mga lecturers and thank you everyone uh, na nag-join po sa amin through Zoom and through Facebook. Um, I uh, report ko lang po that we have reached around uh, 450 or more pa all together. So this is a, a successful webin uh, webinar and we thank you everyone for participating. And I hope this is not the last webinar that we will see each other. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and uh, let's hope na we will see each other next time. Goodbye and uh, God bless. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you all. Every forest that we see today plays a big Bye. role in our world. They are the world's lungs and give us everything we need to live. Kahit online. Kami nga ni Yumi, laging online din lang. Oh, manghaba na lang hair mo. Oh yes, this is, ano, until the, ano, sabi ko, eh, hindi ako magpagupit. Until the end of the pandemic. Tatawagan kita ka ngayong gabi. Sige. Bye. Thank you, Yumi. Thank you, Thank you, Sir Ike. Thank you, Brother Ike. Thank you, Thank you, Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye, Monet. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you, Salahat. Keep safe. Bye bye for now. surprise, but the job of the seed centers is not easy and usually involves different stages. The first one is seed collection. Field managers determine the purpose of their collection, identify the plant species for collection, and the quantity needed. The seed collectors identify the right time to collect the seeds. They also assess the plant's phenology or plant development including the weather and area that influence their growth. The collection of seeds and fruits are based on the species of the tree, its size, and the site condition. One, they time their visit just when the fruits are about to fall. Two, they climb to the top of the trees, use poles or climbing equipment to collect from the crown. And three, they gather the fruits from trees and carefully pack them for transportation. Botanical specimens are also gathered to certify the source and identify the seeds. Seed collectors follow a strict documentation process and give each seed a tracking number. Samples are carefully cleaned and placed in breathable cotton bags to be transported back to the seed center. Step 2. Seed Processing Once the samples arrive at the seed center, they undergo six stages. The seeds and fruits are pre-cleaned to remove debris and examine their quality. Some fruits are depulped by soaking them in water until they are soft enough to be mashed without injuring the seed. They are cleaned again to remove all impurities. The seeds are naturally dried in the field when the weather is hot or inside the center's drying room for one to two days. The dried seeds are cleaned again with the process called winnowing. Lastly, seeds are brought to the laboratory to be registered with their own unique code called the seed lot number. Step 3. Seed Testing 
Seed technologists do this to check and provide information on the seed's health. Seed testers do a purity analysis by checking the purity of the working sample to identify the purity of the seeds. After that, they do a seed count to determine the actual number per kilogram based on the sample. Once the number of pure seeds is identified and counted, they test the sample's moisture content. Seed testers check the seeds' health by placing them in petri dishes or trays and incubate them for more than five days to see if there is fungal and bacterial growth. They also check the seeds' viability through germination testing for at least 30 days. They look for sprouted seeds that have firm white embryos and take note of the number that did not germinate and have abnormal growth. The last step is seed storage. It's a way to preserve seeds longer so they can be effectively used at the ideal planting time. Seed technologists carefully store the seeds in a cool, well-ventilated, dry, and dark place to avoid decay, pests, and diseases. Every forest tree seed center has a cold storage with a temperature of negative 20 degrees Celsius for seed storage. Protocol developments on seed germination are also done in the forest tree seed centers to know the best way to germinate the seeds. With the continued efforts of forest tree seed centers, we are significantly closer to preserving and reforesting our forest ecosystems here in the Philippines. ERDB, innovating for sustainable ecosystems.